The biblical stories of creation, Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, the Deluge, and the Tower of Babel were based on writings made millennia earlier in Mesopotamia, particularly by the Anunnaki Sumerians, according to scholars and theologians. And they, in turn, made it evident that they had read the writings of the Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came. The ancient gods from which they had learned about historical events, many of which took place before civilization had even emerged. Many such early texts have been discovered due to archaeological discoveries made over the past 150 years in the ruins of ancient civilizations, particularly in the Near East. The discoveries have also revealed the extent of missing texts, or so-called lost books, which are either mentioned in the discovered texts or inferred from such texts or known to have existed because they were catalogued in royal or temple libraries. The Epic of Gilgamesh described the debate between the gods that resulted in the decision to let mankind perish in the deluge, and the text Atrahasis describes the revolt of the Anunnaki who had laboured in the gold mines that resulted in the creation of primitive workers, earthlings. Both contain portions of what is sometimes referred to as the secrets of the gods. The leaders of the astronauts occasionally wrote compositions themselves. Sometimes they dictated the text to a selected scribe, as in the Era Epoch, where one of the two gods who had brought about the nuclear catastrophe attempted to blame his rival. Other times, the god served as his scribe, as in the case of the Book of the Secrets of Thoth, the Egyptian god of knowledge, which the god had hidden in an underground chamber. The Bible claims that before giving the commandments to his chosen people, the Lord God Yahweh wrote them on two stone tablets he delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai. He recorded the words the Lord spoke to him while he was on the mount for forty days and forty nights. Moses had the new set of tablets written on them when he flung down and smashed the original set after the golden calf event. The Book of the Secrets of Thoth would not have been known if it weren't for a story about it preserved on papyrus from the reign of the Egyptian monarch Khufu, Cheops. We would never have known about the divine tablets and their contents. Everything would have been included in the mysterious body of lost writings, whose very existence would have never been discovered if it weren't for the biblical narratives in Exodus and Deuteronomy. At least two occasions suggested that the biblical narrator was aware of prior works. The fact that, in some instances, we are aware that some messages exist but are unaware of their contents is no less terrible. The Bible explicitly references the Book of Dasher, also known as the Book of Righteousness, and the Book of the Wars of Yahweh. This is the Book of the Generations of Adam, says the first line of Genesis chapter 5. Toliduth, typically translated as generations, means historic or genealogical record. The second time is in Genesis 6.1, where the phrase, these are the Toledot of Noah, is used to introduce the story of Noah and the deluge. In addition, the book of Enoch, one of the so-called apocryphal books that were not included in the canonized Bible, contains passages that scholars believe to be fragments from a much earlier book of Noah. In fact, partial versions of a book that became known as the Book of Adam and Eve have survived over the millennia in Armenian, Slavonic, Syriac, and Ethiopic languages. The famed Library of Alexandria in Egypt is a frequently cited illustration of the magnitude of lost books. In conflicts from 48 BC to the Arab conquest of AD 642, this beautiful library, where intellectuals met to examine the body of knowledge, was destroyed. After Alexander's demise in 323 BC, General Ptolemy built a library with more than 500,000 volumes of literature engraved on diverse materials, clay, stone, papyrus, and parchment. The first five volumes of the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek are all that is left of its richness. 
In addition, several of the library's resident scholars' papers still contain fragments. Only via this do we know that in 270 BC, the Greeks gave the Egyptian priest Manetho a commission to chronicle Egypt's history and prehistory. Then it was the demigods, and ultimately, around 3100 BC, the Pharaonic dynasty started. He said that the divine rains lasted for thousands of years after the flood, during which time there were wars and battles between the gods, and that they had started 10,000 years before the flood. Similar attempts were made to give the Greek savants a record of past events in Alexander's Asian territories, where their rule was transferred to General Seleucid and his successors. The history of gods and men was chronicled in three volumes by Berosus, a priest of the Babylonian god Marduk, who had access to clay tablet libraries, the most important of which was the Temple Library of Haran, now in southeast Turkey. This history began 432,000 years before the deluge, when the gods descended to earth from the heavens. Berosa stated that the first ruler came ashore from the sea disguised as a fish, listing the names and rain lengths of the first ten leaders. He was the one who endowed humanity with civilization, and his name was Kanis when translated into Greek. Both priests thus gave tales of gods of heaven who had come to earth, of a time when only gods ruled on earth, and of the devastating deluge, alluding to each other in numerous aspects. Berosa specifically reported the existence of writings from before the Great Flood, stone tablets that were hidden for safekeeping in an ancient city called Sipar, one of the original cities founded by the ancient gods in the fragmentary bits and pieces retained in other contemporary writings from the three volumes. Sipar, like other pre-diluvial towns of the gods, was overrun and destroyed by the deluge, 668 to 633 BC. A library containing the remnants of some 25,000 inscribed clay tablets was unearthed in the palace's ruins when archaeologists discovered Nineveh in the middle of the 19th century. This ancient Assyrian metropolis had previously only been known from the Old Testament. A mention of the pre-diluvial texts appeared in the chronicles of the Assyrian monarch Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal, who was a devoted collector of olden texts, boasts in his annals, The god of scribes has bestowed on me the gift of the knowledge of his art. I have been initiated into the secrets of writing. I can even read the intricate tablets in Anunnaki Sumerian. I understand the enigmatic words in the stone carvings from the days before the flood. The Anunnaki Sumerian civilization, which later gave way to the Indus Valley civilization in the Indian subcontinent, is known to have flourished in Iraq almost a millennium before the beginning of the Pharaonic Age in Egypt. It is now known that the Anunnaki Sumerians were the first to record the histories and legends of deities and humans. From them, all other peoples, including the Hebrews, got the stories of creation, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the Deluge, the Tower of Babel, and the wars and loves of the gods, which are depicted in the writings and memories of the Greeks, Hittites, Canaanites, Persians, and Indo-Europeans. These ancient manuscripts reveal that far older texts, some discovered, many lost, were their sources. The amount of these ancient texts is astounding. Amid the ruins of the ancient Near East, tens of thousands of clay tablets have been found, not thousands. Numerous transactions involve or document daily life elements, such as marriage contracts and workers' wages. Other canonized texts or secret literature were written down in the Anunnaki Sumerian language and then translated to Akkadian, the first Semitic language, and other ancient languages. These texts, primarily found in palace libraries, make up the royal annals. Still, other texts discovered in the ruins of temple libraries or scribal schools make up a group of canonized texts. Additionally, 
references to missing books can be found in those earliest writings dating back almost 6,000 years, texts inscribed on stone tablets. The same information concerning the ten pre-diluvial kings and their 432,000-year cumulative reign that Berossus had mentioned is etched on clay prisms which are among the incredible to say luckily does not communicate the miracle findings in the remains of ancient towns and their libraries. There is no question that the Anunnaki Sumerian compilers of the Anunnaki Sumerian king lists, which are on display in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, had access to some previous common or canonical textual material. They strongly imply that the original recorder of the arrival as well as of prior events and subsequent events, had to be one of those leaders, a key participant or an eyewitness when combined with other equally early manuscripts found in varying levels of preservation. The leader who had splashed down with the first batch of astronauts had been a participant in all those activities and an eyewitness to them. His nickname at the time was E.A., which stands for he whose home is water. He was disappointed when his half-brother and opponent, Enlil, Lord of the Command, was awarded control of the Earth mission, and his humiliation was only slightly lessened by being given the title Enki, Lord of Earth. A.R. Enki, a renowned scientist, discovered the hominids who lived there after being banished from the god cities and spaceport in the Edin, Eden to oversee the gold mining in the Abzu, Southeast Africa. As a result, when the Anunnaki labouring in the gold mines rebelled and said no more, he was the one who realised that the necessary human resources could be obtained by accelerating evolution through genetic engineering. As a result, the Adam, literally he of the earth, an earthling, was created. The events mirrored in the biblical story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden described the second genetic modification by Enki that added the extra chromosomal genes required for sexual conception. Because Adam was a hybrid, he was unable to have children. It was he, Enki, who disobeyed his brother Enlil's intention to let mankind perish in the deluge. The events whose hero has been referred to as Noah in the Bible and Ziusudra in the earlier original Anunnaki Sumerian text, when mankind, proliferating, did not turn out as it had been planned. Enki, Nibiru's ruler and the firstborn son of Anu, was well versed in the history of his planet and its inhabitants. He was a gifted scientist who left the most essential components of the sophisticated Anunnaki knowledge, particularly to his two sons Marduk and Ningish Zidda, who, as Egyptian gods, were known there as Ra and Thuth, respectively. But he also played a crucial role in transferring some of this cutting-edge knowledge to mankind by imparting the secrets of the gods to a few chosen individuals. Such initiates recorded those divine lessons as part of humankind's inheritance in at least two cases, as they were told to do. One of the earliest lost writings is believed to have been written by a DARPA, who is thought to be the son of Enki by a human woman. Writings regarding time is one of his known works. The other, known as Enmeduranki, was most likely the forerunner of the biblical Enoch, who was carried up to heaven after giving his sons the Book of Divine Secrets, a version that may have survived in the extra-biblical Book of Enoch. Despite being Anu's firstborn, he was not meant to succeed his father as ruler of Nibiru. Enlil, Enki's half-brother, received that honour thanks to complicated succession procedures representing the complicated history of the Nibiruans. Enki and Enlil were sent to Earth to stop the acrimonious dispute, because Earth's gold may be used to make a barrier to protect Nibiru's vanishing atmosphere. Enki decided to reject Enlil's plan for mankind to perish in the deluge against this backdrop, which was made even more complicated by the presence of their half-sister Ninhursag, the chief medical officer of the Anunnaki on Earth. 
the fight persisted between the two half-brothers' kids and even their grandchildren. The fact that everyone involved, especially those who were born on Earth, had to deal with Nibiru's longer orbital period's reduction in longevity contributed to their personal suffering and sharpened their goals. Everything reached a head in the last century of the 3rd millennium BC, when Ninurta, Enlil's firstborn son, and not Marduk, Enki's firstborn by his official bride, asserted that he should inherit the earth. The employment of nuclear weapons due to the brutal fight that included numerous conflicts unexpectedly destroyed the Anunnaki Sumerian civilization. The commencement of the priesthood, the lineages of the intermediaries between the gods and the people, the communicators of the divine words to the mortal earthlings, had been marked by the initiation of selected persons into the secrets of the gods. Oracle's interpretation of divine words coexisted with the practice of looking to the stars for signs, and prophecy started to come into play as mankind was drawn to join sides in religious disputes. Nabu, Marduk's firstborn son, strove to persuade mankind on behalf of his exiled father that the heavenly signals indicated the coming supremacy of Marduk, and the term to describe such speakers of the gods who proclaimed what was to come was Nabi. These advances made the realization that one must distinguish between fate and destiny more acute. Enki and Enlil started to reflect philosophically on what was truly fated and could not have been avoided, and what was fated as a result of good or bad choices and free will. Enki and Enlil sometimes reviewed and remembered the sequence of events and the apparent parallelism between what had happened on Nibiru and what had happened on Earth. The differences between Nam, a destiny like the planetary orbits whose course had been established and was immutable, and Anu, which were previously unquestioned, were now closely examined. Ta, which stood for fate, literally meant a destiny that could be bent, broken or altered. The former could be predicted, whereas the latter could not, especially if everything was cyclical like planetary orbits. If what was will again be, if the first things will also be the last. The culmination of the nuclear apocalypse forced the Anunnaki leaders to examine their motives, and it heightened the need to explain why it happened in this way to the engulfing human masses. Is someone responsible for this? Was it predetermined or just a byproduct of Anunnaki's will? Was anyone accountable? On the eve of the catastrophe, Enki was the lone opponent of using the illegal weapon in the councils of the Anunnaki. Enki felt it was imperative to inform the suffering survivors of the significance of the turning point in the story of aliens who had good intentions but ended up being destroyers. And who better than A.R. Enki, who arrived first and was an eyewitness, to tell the past so that the future could be predicted? Since a lengthy collection, covering at least twenty-two tablets in the Morhen collection, was found in the ancient library in Mosul, Enki documented his autobiography. Enki is quoted as saying by Nippur, There was a great deal of flooding when I got closer to earth. As I got closer to its lush meadows, at my direction heaps and mounds were built up. I constructed my home in a purity spot, giving it a suitable moniker. The lengthy passage tells how Enki gave his lieutenants tasks to complete, sending them on a trip to earth. Enki's story is completed by several additional books. Some are partly in the Moorhen collection in Liechtenstein and the other half in Switzerland, also in a private museum. They include a cosmogony and an epic of creation, both of which contain Enki's own writings, known to researchers as the Eridu Genesis, and which relate various aspects of his participation in later developments. They go into great depth on how Adam was created. They include texts of Enki's personal life and problems, such as the tale of his attempts to have a son by his half-sister Ninhursag, his promiscuity with both goddesses and the daughters of man, 
and the unintended consequences thereof. They describe how other Anunnaki, male and female, came to Enki in his city Eridu to obtain the Me, a data disk from him that encoded all aspects of civilization. The division of Earth's kingdoms between Enki and Enlil by Anu averted a flare-up of their feuds, as noted in the Atrahasis narrative. The discussions in the Council of the Gods about the fate of humanity and Enki's deception, which is known as the story of Noah and the Ark, are almost verbatim in texts documenting the events before the deluge. Until one of its original Mesopotamian versions was discovered in the tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh, this story was only known from the Bible. The main body of recorded memories of the events of gods and mortals can be found in Anunnaki Sumerian and Akkadian clay tablets, Babylonian and Assyrian temple libraries, Egyptian, Hittite and Canaanite myths, and biblical tales. For the first time, Ryan Moorhen has brought together and exploited this scattered and dispersed data to reconstruct Enki's eyewitness account. The autobiographical memoirs and incisive forecasts of an extraterrestrial god. Even though Ryan Moorhen's grandfather was an Assyriologist, who curated the collection of which it is named, and he has also studied Near Eastern history for almost 33 years, it took him seven years to gain access to the collection with special permission from the Rothschilds. It reminds me of Yahweh's instructions to the prophet Isaiah, 7th century BC, which are presented as a text delivered by Enki to a chosen scribe, a book of witnessing to be unsealed at a suitable time. Come now, write it as a book on a sealed tablet, carve it, let it be a testimony for all time, witnessing to the very end. Isaiah 38. Enki himself saw the future while he dealt with the past. That the Anunnaki, who possessed free will, were in control of their own fates, as well as the fate of humanity, gave way to the understanding that destiny ultimately determined how events would turn out, and as a result, as the Hebrew prophets had foretold, the first thing shall be the last. Thus, the Enki recorded timeline serves as the basis for prophecy, and the past becomes the future. These are the words of Endubsar, a brilliant scribe born in Eridu city who served the great god Enki. I was called by my master, the lord Enki, the great god, the merciful creator of people, who created them in the seventh year following the great calamity, on the seventeenth day of the second month. I was one of Eridu's surviving members, who fled to the dry steppe as the evil wind approached the city. I then set foot in the wilderness, searching for dead branches to use as firewood. I then turned to look above, and a whirlwind came from the south. It was silent, and had a reddish glow about it. Four straight feet extended out from its abdomen as it descended to the ground, and the brightness vanished. I immediately fell to the ground and bowed down, because I knew it was a divine vision. When I opened my eyes, I saw two divine emissaries standing close by. They too had human faces, and their clothes sparkled like burnished brass. They said, You are being called by the mighty deity Enki, as they addressed me by name. Do not be alarmed, you are blessed and we are coming to transfer you to his retreat in the land of Mogon, on the island in the middle of the river of Mogon where the sluices are, by lifting you into the air. The whirlwind rose as a fiery chariot and left as they finished speaking. They each grasped one of my hands while holding on to me by the other. They immediately transported me between the earth and the heavens like an eagle as they lifted me. The countryside, rivers, plains and mountains were all visible to me. They then dropped me off on the island near the entrance to the home of the giant god, and as soon as they released their grip, I was overcome with a brilliance I had never seen before, collapsing to the ground as though bereft of the spirit of life. I felt as though I had been roused from the deepest sleep by the sound of my name being called. I added, Here I am 
I was enclosed. Despite the darkness, an aura was present. Then the darkest of voices called my name once more. Even though I could hear it, I could not identify who was speaking or where the voice was coming from. The voice then addressed me, saying, Endubsa, descendant of Adapa, I have appointed you to be my scribe, that you record my words on the tablets. A light suddenly materialized in one area of the enclosure. A scribe's table, a scribe's stool, and beautifully formed stones were on the table, and the area was set up like a scribal workspace. However, I didn't see any clay tablets or pots with wet clay. Only one stylus was on the table, and it shone in the light like no other reed stylus ever had. Endubsa, son of Eridu City, my faithful servant, the voice said once more, I am your Lord Enki, and I have asked you to record my words because I am deeply saddened by what the great calamity has brought upon humanity. To prove to gods and mortals that my hands are pure, I want to document the events precisely as they happened. Such a catastrophe had not befallen the earth, the gods, and the inhabitants since the great deluge. But the great deluge, not the great calamity, would occur. This one would have been avoided seven years ago. It could have been avoided. Although I, Enki, did everything I could to stop it, I was unsuccessful. Furthermore, was it fate or destiny? It will be judged, since there will be a day of judgment at the end of time. It will be the day of the re-entering celestial god when the earth will tremble, the rivers will shift their courses, and there will be darkness at noon and a fire in the heavens at night. On that day it will be revealed who will survive and who will perish, who will be rewarded and who will be punished, gods and humans alike. For what will come to pass by what had passed shall be determined, and what was destined shall in a cycle be repeated. And what was destined and only by the hearts will occur for good or ill shall be for judgment come. The great Lord then resumed speaking, stating, I will reveal the correct narrative of the beginnings and of the prior times and of the olden times, for in the past the future lies hidden. The voice suddenly went silent. I will talk for forty days and forty nights, and you will write during that time. Forty will be the total of those days and nights, since forty is my sacred number among the gods. You must fast for forty days and forty nights, and consume bread and water once, which will be enough to keep you alive for the duration of your assignment. A glowing appeared in another area of the enclosure as the voice paused. I then noticed a table with a plate and a cup on it. I got up and saw the bread and the cup of water on the plate. Endubsa, eat the bread and drink the water, and you will be maintained for forty days and forty nights, the great Lord Enki's voice echoed. And I followed the instructions. The light at the scribal table became more intense as the voice told me to sit there. I couldn't see any doors or openings where I was, yet the glowing was as bright as the midday sun. The voice asked, What do Endubsa the scribe? I then stated, I see stone tablets, and their color is blue as pure as the sky. As I looked at the blazing beam on the table, the stones and the stylus, then I notice a stylus I had never seen before, with a reed-like stem and an eagle talon-like tip. Stay true to what I've said and spoken, the voice said. These are the tablets on which you should write my words. They were cut to my specifications from the best lapis lazuli, each having two smooth faces. Each stone tablet must have its front face inscribed, and its back must have two writing columns. The stylus you can see was also created by a god. It has a divine crystal tip and an electrum handle. It will snugly fit in your hand, and engraving with it will be as simple as marking wet clay. There was a pause, and I touched one stone. The surface felt soft and smooth, like smooth skin. 
I then took the holy stylus, which was as light as a feather. The great deity Enki then spoke, and I recorded his words verbatim in my writing. His voice was booming, occasionally approaching a whisper. His voice conveyed grief or agony as much as pride or joy. I took another tablet to continue after one had been written on all of its faces. The giant god paused when the ultimate words were pronounced, and I heard a loud sigh, and he said, Endubsa, my servant, you have faithfully recorded my words for forty days and forty nights. This is where your job is done. Now take hold of a second tablet and write your attestation. As a witness, seal the tablet at the end. Take the tablet and place it with the other tablets in the divine chest. The chosen ones will arrive at a predetermined time and discover the chest and the tablets. They will then learn everything I have dictated to you and an accurate account of the beginnings, the prior times, the olden times and the ages and it will be both a witness to the past and a foreteller of the future. For the first thing is also the last, and the future lives in the past. After a brief pause, I placed the tablets inside the chest correctly. The chest's outside was covered in gold inlay and constructed from acacia wood. My lord then spoke, telling me to fasten the chest's latch and close the cover, and I followed the instructions. After another silence, my lord Enki said, And as for you, Endubsa, you have spoken with a great deity, and even though you haven't seen me, you have been in my presence. You are, therefore, my chosen spokesperson for the people you will become, and I bless you. You must exhort them to do what is right, since a good and long life is found in doing so and it would be best if you consoled them, because in seventy years the towns will be restored and the crops will re-sprout. Warfare will coexist with times of calm. Kingdoms will rise and fall, and new nations will grow powerful. The ancient gods will retire, and the future will be decided by new gods. However, destiny will win out in the end, and my remarks about the past foretell that future. Endubsa, you must inform the populace of all of it. After that, there was stillness, and as I, Endubsa, knelt in prayer, I questioned how I would know what to say. The words to speak will come to you in dreams and visions, the Lord Enki said. The signs will be in the heavens. There will be more prophets who have been chosen after you, and in the end, there will be no need for prophets, because there will be a new earth and a new heaven. After the auras disappeared and there was silence, the ghost left me, and I was on the plains outside of Eridu when I came to my senses. Summary of the Morhen Collection Akkadian Tablet MC2894A Bewailing the Emptiness of Sumer What happened when the radioactive cloud expanded and the gods left their cities? The discussions held at the gods' council. The terrible choice to use weapons of terror. The beginnings of the gods and Nibiru's incredible armaments, north-south wars, union and dynastic rule on Nibiru, the location of Nibiru in the solar system. Climate change is brought on by a declining atmosphere. The attempt to get gold to protect the atmosphere fails. Alalu, a usurper, ignites volcanic gases with nuclear bombs. A dynastic sessor named Anu overthrows Alalu. Alalu escapes Nibiru by stealing a spacecraft. Morhen Collection Akkadian Tablet MC2894A the first-born son of Anu, Lord Enki, who rules over Nibiru, spoke these words. I cry laments with a heavy heart, and bitterly laments flood my heart. How devastated is the country! How has the evil wind taken its people? How have the stables and sheepfolds been emptied? How severely has the evil wind affected the cities, causing their inhabitants to pile up like dead bodies? 
how much has the evil wind affected the fields, leaving their greenery withered? How much are the rivers in love? The once pure beautiful waters have been poisoned, and no one swims any more. Sumer is empty of its black-headed inhabitants. All life has vanished. It is also empty of its cattle and lambs. The hum of milk churning has gone silent. Only the wind howls in its gorgeous cities. The only odor is death. The temples whose gods raised their heads to heaven have been forgotten. The scepter and tiara are no longer present. No lordship or kingship command exists. The two big rivers previously lush and life-giving banks now only support weeds. Highways and roads are untraveled. Thriving Sumer is like an abandoned wasteland. How devastated is the country, the abode of men and gods. Unknown to man, a catastrophe struck the region. A catastrophe that humankind had never experienced before and was unstoppable. A disrupting hand of horror was laid upon all the regions from west to east. The gods were as helpless as men in their cities. An evil wind inflicted a great calamity in its path, a storm formed in a remote plain. A wind that brings death and travels from west to east has been fated to follow that path. A storm is as devastating as a deluge, destroying not with water but with wind, overwhelming not with tidal waves but with poisoned air. It was created by fate rather than destiny. The great gods had brought about the great calamity in their meeting. It was approved by Enlil and Ninhursag. I was the only one pleading for a halt. I fought day and night to accept the sky's will, but in vain. The warrior son of Enlil, Ninurta, and my son Nergal poisoned weapons and let them loose across the vast plain. We were unaware that an evil wind would follow the brilliance. Now they sob in pain. Who could predict that the storm that brings death, born in the west, would make its way to the east? Now the gods lament. The gods in their sacred cities watched in disbelief as the evil wind travelled towards Sumer. The gods left their temples to the wind and, one by one, left their city. I was powerless to stop the poisonous cloud as it moved toward my city, Eridu. Get away to the vast steppe, I gave orders to the people. I left the city with Ninki, my wife. Enlil was powerless to halt it at his city of Nippur, where the bond heaven-earth was created. The evil wind was blowing against Nippur. Enlil hastily launched his celestial boat with his wife. Nana begged his father Enlil for help at Ur, the capital city of Sumer. Nana was the hand of fate, and disregarded his father's pleas in the temple's location, which rises to heaven in seven steps. Turn the evil wind away, O great god who gave birth to me, and gave the kingship to Ur. In a plea, Nana. Continue to honor the great deity who controls fortunes by sparing Ur and her inhabitants. Nana filed a protest. Noble son, your excellent city lordship was granted. Eternal rain was not, replied Enlil in response to his son Nana. Ningal, grab your wife and run from the city. Even I who set the fates am powerless to change destiny, my brother Enlil said. But unfortunately, it was not destiny. A tragedy that hasn't been this serious since the flood gods and humans were hit. Sadly, it wasn't fate. The great deluge and the great calamity of the death-dealing storm were both predestined to occur. It was brought about by the breaking of a vow, by a council vote, and the deployment of weapons of terror. The poisoned weapons were released by choice rather than fate, and the lot was decided upon by thought. My firstborn caused the immediate destruction of my two sons. Revenge was in their hearts for Marduk. Marduk is not entitled to ascendancy. I will confront him with weapons, Ninurta said. Firstborn Enlil yelled. He gathered an army of people, using Babylai to declare the center of the earth. So yelled Nergal, 
Marduk's brother. In the big gods' meeting, poisonous phrases were said. I spoke up against haste day and night. Peace, I offered advice. Why does opposition persist when the populace has erected his divine image a second time? I begged the question. The age of Marduk in the sky has yet to come. Has each instrument been examined? I repeated my question. Ningish Zida, my own son, and other heavenly indications are mentioned. I knew that his heart could not forgive Marduk for what he had done to him. Enlil on Earthborn encountered Nana, who was also unyielding. Marduk established his own home during my time in the northern city. Then he said, The youngest son of Enlil, Ishgur, was sentenced to punishment and told to whore after the people he had created in his domains. Utu, son of Nana, aimed his anger at Marduk's son, Nabu, and attempted to take control of the location of the celestial chariots. The identical twin of Utu, Inanna, was enraged and continued to demand that Marduk be punished for killing her beloved Damuzi. Mother of the gods and humans, Ninhursag, looked elsewhere. Why is Marduk not present? All she said was, Gibil, my own son, said somberly, Marduk has disregarded all pleadings and asserts his sovereignty based on signs from heaven. The only way to stop Marduk is with guns, Enlil's firstborn Ninurta yelled. It was essential to Utu to keep Marduk's hands off the place of the celestial chariots so it wouldn't crumble. Then he said, Let the old weapons of terror for eradication be utilized, angrily commanded Nergal, lord of the lower domain. I looked at my own son in astonishment. Using fear weapons in brother-against-brother battles has been forbidden. There was silence rather than agreement. Enlil spoke quietly, saying, Punishment must be meted out. The evildoers shall be as birds without wings. Marduk and Nabu, us of legacy are depriving. Let them of the place of the celestial chariots be deprived. Let the area be burned to a crisp. The one who scorches let me be, yelled Ninurta. Excitedly, Nergal jumped up and yelled, Let the towns of the evildoers likewise be demolished. Let me obliterate the cities of wickedness. Let the Annihilator be my name after that. I firmly asserted that since earthlings were our creation, neither the pious nor the sinful should perish. My co-creator Ninhursag approved, saying, the issue is between the gods alone to settle. The people must not be hurt. Anu was paying close attention to the conversations and the celestial home. Anu, who controls destiny, spoke from his heavenly home. Let the weapons of terror be used this once. Let the place of the rocket ships be destroyed. Let the people be spared. Let Nergal be the annihilator and Ninurta the scorcher be. Enlil concurred as well, and the choice was made public. I'll let them in on a god's secret and the location of the terror weapons. Enlil called his two sons, mine and the other his, to his inner chamber. Nergal passed me without looking at me. Alas, brother has turned against brother, I shouted aloud without using words. Do the prior times have to happen again? Enlil disclosed a myth from ancient times, trusting the weapons of terror to their hands. They are set loose, clad in dread and splendor, turning everything in their path into dust. They had vowed to fight each other as brothers on earth, regardless of the place. The oath was now rendered meaningless, like a broken jar. The two sons came from Enlil's chamber with hastened steps, jumping with joy as the weapons left. None of his disasters had a foreshadowing, so the other gods turned around and went back to their cities. This is a description of earlier times and terrorist weapons. The beginning came before the prior times, and the olden times followed the prior times. The gods visited earth in ancient times and made the first humans there. No gods existed in the prior times, and humans had not yet been created. 
the gods' home during the prior times was on their own planet Nibiru. Nibiru is a giant planet with a reddish brilliance that orbits the sun in an extended orbit. Nibiru spends some time in the cold. The sun strongly heats it for a portion of its orbit. Dense atmosphere Nibiru is continuously nourished by volcanic outbursts. This atmosphere supports many lives. Without it, there would be just perishing. The core heat of Nibiru surrounds the globe throughout the cold season like an ever-renewing warm cloak. It protects Nibiru from the sun's harsh rays in the hot season. While it is raining, it holds and releases water to create lakes and streams. All kinds of life have sprung out in the waterways and on the land because of the lush vegetation that blankets our atmosphere, feeding and protecting it. After a long time, our species grew a seed that could keep going forever. As the number of us grew, our ancestors moved to many parts of Nibiru. Some worked for land, and some with four legs took care of the animals. Some of them lived in the mountains, and some of them lived in the valleys. Rivalries and encroachments led to fights, and sticks were used as weapons. Clans formed tribes, and two big nations stood face to face. The country of the north took up arms against the country of the south. What was held by hand was turned into missiles that shot forward. Thunderous and bright weapons made things even scarier. The entire world was at war for a long time, and brothers fought against brothers. Both north and south were affected by death and destruction. For a long time the land was empty, and there wasn't much life. Then a truce was called, and efforts to make peace were made. The messengers told each other, Let the nations come together. Let there be one throne on Nibiru, and one king who rules over everyone. Let a leader from the north or south be chosen by chance, and let there be only one king. If he is from the north, the south should choose a woman to be his wife and rule with him. If a south man is chosen by lot, he should marry a north woman. Let them be husband and wife and become one flesh. Let their firstborn son take over. Let this create a unified dynasty and bring peace to Nibiru for good. Peace began amid the wreckage. North and south were brought together by marriage. The royal throne became one body, and a line of kings went on without a break. After peace, the first king was an influential leader from the north. He was chosen by drawing lots. He was honest and fair, and his decisions were respected. He built a beautiful city to live in. It was called Akkad, which means unity. For his rule, he was given the title Celestial One, which meant he was a king. He brought law and order back to the land by force and made the rules and laws. He put governors in charge of each land. Their primary jobs were to restore and reclaim the land. In the royal records, it was written that he united the lands and brought peace back to Nibiru. He built a new city, fixed the canals, and fed the people, so there was plenty of food on the land. He chose a young woman from the south to be his wife. She was known for both love and war. Antu was her royal title, and her given name cleverly meant the leader who is Anu's spouse. She had three boys and no girls with Anu. She gave her first son the name Anki, which means a solid foundation in the language of Anu. He sat on the throne by himself, and the choice of a wife was put off twice. The palace was filled with concubines during his rule, but he never had a son. So the dynasty began with Anki's death, since he had no children. Even though he wasn't the firstborn, the middle son was named the legal heir. One of three brothers was called Lutu Nergal by his mother since he was a child. His name meant the one in the middle. From the royal records, Anki is called. In divine kingship, the name of the one who is Anu's son is shown through the generations. 
he was the third person to rule Nibiru. His father, An, was the second. He married the daughter of Enki's half-brother, Nin, called Lil, the Lady of Lil. Anib and Ninib had a son. He was the fourth king to take over the throne, based on the number of kings. Anshar Gal wanted to be known by his royal name, which meant Anu's prince, who is the greatest of princes. His wife, Kishargal, was his half-sister. They both had the same name. His primary goal was to learn and understand. He worked hard to learn how the heavens worked. He looked into Nibiru's big circle, whose length had to be set at a shah. One year on Nibiru was used to track how long each king or queen ruled. He split the shah into ten parts and then announced two festivals. When the earth was closest to the sun, a festival of warmth was held. When Nibiru went to its far away home, the festival of coolness was set up. The two were set up to replace all the old festivals of tribes and nations and bring people together. He set up laws for husbands and wives and sons and daughters by decree. He also made the customs of the first tribes the law for the entire land. During the wars, there were many more women than men. He made rules that said one male could have over one female. By law, only one wife can be the official spouse. This wife is called the first wife to be called. By law, the firstborn son took over for his father. By following these rules, people soon needed clarification. If the firstborn son wasn't from the first wife, then a son was born by the first wife, who became the legal heir by law? Who will be the next leader? The one with the most firstborn children? The one who was born by the first wife? The youngest son? The heir by law? Who will get the money? Who will do well? While Anshargal was king, Kishargal was named his first wife. She was the king's half-sister. During Anshargal's rule, the palace was once again filled with concubines. The king's sons and daughters were born to his concubines. The first child to be born was the son of a concubine. The child was called the firstborn. Then Kishargal gave birth to a son. By law he was the heir, but he was not the firstborn. In the palace, Kishargal got angry and yelled, Let the double seed not be forgotten if the rules say my son, who was born to a first wife, can't be king. Even though we have different moms, the king and I have the same father. I am the king's half-sister, and he is my half-brother. By that, my son, our father Anib's double seed, has it. Let the law of the seed and the law of marriage rule from now on. From now on, a son by a half-sister should take the throne before all other sons. Anshagal liked the law of the seed when he thought about it. It would keep his wife and concubine's marriage and divorce from getting mixed up. In their meeting, the king's advisers agreed on the law of the seed for succession. The scribes wrote the decree because the king told them to. So, based on the law of the seed, the name of the next king was made public. He was given the name Anshar, which means king. He was fifth in line for the throne. This is the story of Anshar's rule and the kings who came after him. When the law was changed, there was fighting among the other princes. There were words, but there was no rebellion. As his half-sister and wife, Anshar chose. He made her his first wife and gave her the name Kishar. So, because of this law, the dynasty kept going. During Anshar's rule, the crops in the fields got smaller, with fewer fruits and grains. From one circuit to the next, their heat got more muscular as they got closer to the sun, while the coolness in the faraway home got more biting. In Arkad, the city of the throne, the king and many wise people got together. People with a lot of knowledge and intelligence were told to ask questions. They looked at the land and soil and tried out the lakes and streams. It's happened before, 
and some people said Nibiru had grown in the past when it was colder or warmer. It has a fate since it is part of the circuit of Nibiru. Others who knew the edge and watched the circuit did not think about Nibiru's destiny being to blame. They found that there had been a breaching in the atmosphere. Spitting up were volcanoes, the atmosphere, forebears, and people who burped less. The air on Nibiru has become less dense, and the protective shield has shrunk. Pestilences spread during the rule of Anshar and Kishar, and no amount of work could stop them. The throne was then taken over by their son, Enshar, who was the sixth member of that family. Lord of the Shah was what the name meant. He was born with a lot of knowledge and learned a lot throughout his life. He looked for ways to fix the problems, like Nibiru's path through the heavens, and he did a lot of research. It wrapped around five beautiful planets in its loop of the sun's family. He had their atmospheres looked at, seeing if there were any ways to heal them. He gave each one a name. He honoured their ancestors and thought of them as heavenly couples. The first two planets he saw were On and Antu, like twins. Anshar and Kishar, the biggest ones, were outside Nibiru's circle. Gaga, among others, travelled as a messenger, sometimes meeting Nibiru first. As the sun went around, five heavenly beings greeted Nibiru. Beyond the hammered bracelet, the sun made a circle like a boundary. The hammered bracelet was like a guardian of heaven's forbidding area, protecting it from chaos. The bracelet kept the four other children of the sun from getting hurt. Enshar set out to study how the five greeters made people feel. In Nibiru's loop, five things were carefully looked at. What atmospheres they had were closely looked at by watching them and using celestial chariots. The findings were surprising and the discoveries were hard to understand. Nibiru's atmosphere breaching got worse from circuit to circuit. In the councils of the wise, people talked about cures and ways to bandage wounds with great interest. A new shield was tried to cover the planet, but it all fell back to the ground. The volcanoes that spewed ash were looked at in councils of the wise. The atmosphere was created by volcanoes spewing ash into the air, and it hurt when they stopped. Let people devise new ways to burp, and let volcanoes spew again, what one savant's group said. All the kings could only tell how the feat could be done, or what tools could be used. During Anshar's rule, the hole in the sky got bigger. There were no rains, the winds were more potent and no springs were coming from the ground. There was a charge in the land that mother's breasts were dry. There was trouble in the palace, and a charge spread. As his first wife, he married his half-sister Enshar, which was against the law of the seed. Bear of the Shahs, the lady, was what people called Ninshar. Enshar had a son as a concubine, the firstborn son a son she didn't give birth to. Ninshar's first wife and half-sister didn't have a son. By the law of succession, the throne went to the concubine's son. He was the seventh person to rule. His royal name was Du-Uru, which means in the dwelling place made. He was born in the house of concubines, not in the palace. Du-Uru chose a young woman from his youth to be his wife. He chose the first wife because he loved her, not because she was his daughter. Duuru was her royal name, which meant, she who is by my side. There was a lot of confusion in the royal court. Sons didn't get to inherit, and wives weren't half-sisters. There was more and more suffering on the land. People became less fertile, and the fields forgot how full they used to be. There was no birth in the palace. Neither a son nor a daughter was born. Seven of An's children were kings, and then none of his children were on the throne. A child named Dauru was found at the palace gate, and the queen took him in as her son. 
In the end, Tu'uru adopted him as a son and made him his legal heir. His name, Lamu, means dryness. The princes were complaining in the palace, and there were also complaints in the council of councillors. In the end, Lamu took his place on the throne. Even though he wasn't An's son, he was the eighth king. In the councils of the wise, there were two ideas for how to heal the brace. One had to use a metal called gold. It was rare in Nibiru, but there was a lot in the hammered bracelet. It was the only thing that could be ground into the finest powder and stay in the air high above heaven. So, with more supplies, the hole would close up and protection would improve. Let there be celestial boats and a star fleet to bring gold to Nibiru. The other idea was to make weapons of terror that would make the ground shake and the mountains break apart. With missiles, the volcanoes can be attacked, their slumber is broken, their belching made worse, the atmosphere filled up, and the hole made to go away. Lamu was too weak to choose, but he knew what to do. One time around, Nibiru went around two shahs. Nibiru was added to the list. In the fields, things didn't get better. The atmosphere was not fixed by volcanic farts. A third shah went by, and a fourth was added to the total. No gold was gained. There was a lot of fighting on the land, but there wasn't enough food or water. There was no longer unity in the land, and accusations were everywhere. Intelligent people came from the royal court, and councillors rushed in and out. The king didn't care what they said. He only wanted advice from his wife, named Lahama. If it's fate, she said, let's ask the great creator of all to help the king. The only hope is to beg on the internet. The princes at the royal court were upset and the king was accused of being stupid and irrational for making things worse instead of better. Weapons were taken out of the old storage places, and there was a lot of talk about starting a rebellion. The first person to take up arms was a prince in the royal palace. By making promises, he stirred up the other princes. His name was Alalu. Lamu shouldn't be king anymore, he yelled. Let decision supplant hesitation. Let's scare the king where he lives. Let's leave his throne empty. The princes listened to what he said and ran to the palace gate. They went like rushing water to the throne room which had a small entrance. Alalu was after the king who ran to the palace's tower. There was a fight in the tower and Lamu fell to death. No more Lamu, Alalu called out. Alalu ran to the throne room and sat on the throne as quickly as he could. He told everyone with joy that the king was dead. He made a king with no rights or counsel. Some people were content that Lamu had died, while others were saddened by what Alalu had done. This is the story of Alalu becoming king and going to earth. There was no longer unity in the land, and many people were upset with the king. Princes were upset in the palace, and councillors were upset in the council. Anu's place on the throne was passed on from father to son. Even Lamu the Eighth was called a son because he was adopted. Who was Alalu? Was he a firstborn or a legal heir? How could he take over? Wasn't he the one who killed the king? Alalu was brought before the seven who judge so that they could decide his fate. Alalu made his pleas to the seven who judge. Even though he was neither a legal heir nor a firstborn son, he was of royal blood. Before the judges he said, I am from Anshagal. My ancestor was born to him by a concubine. His name was Alam. By Shah's count, Alam was the firstborn. The throne belonged to him, but the queen used her cunning to take away his rights. She made a law of the seed out of nothing, and her son became king. She took the kingship away from Alalu and gave it to her son. I followed Alalu's lineage. The seed of Onshargal is in me. 
the Sefenhu judge paid attention to what Alalu said. They took the matter to the Council of Councillors to find out if it was true. The royal records were carefully read from the House of Records. Anu and Antu were the first king and queens. They had three sons but no daughters. Anki was the firstborn. He died on the throne and had no children. In his place the middle son took the throne. His name was Anib. Anshagal was his first child and his throne. After him, the firstborn did not stay on the throne. The law of succession by the law of a seed was replaced by a new law. The firstborn was the son of a concubine, but the law said he didn't have the right to be king. Instead, Kishagal's son became king. This was because she was a half-sister of the king. The firstborn, the son of the concubine, was not written down in the history books. Of him I am descended, Alalu cried out to the councillors. By the law of succession, he was the rightful king. By the law of succession, I am now the rightful king. The councillors of Alalu hesitated before taking the truth oath that was asked of them. Alalu took the oath of life and death, and as king, he thought about what the council had to say. They called the elders and the princes together, and the decision was made before them. A young prince stood up from the group of princes. He had something to say about being king. He told the assembly that succession needs to be looked at again. Even though I wasn't the firstborn or the queen's son, I came from pure seed. The essence of An is still in me, and no concubine has changed that. The word shocked the councillors, and they told the young prince to come closer. They asked what he was called. It's Anu. I was named after my grandfather An. When they asked about his family tree, he told them about An's three sons. Anki was An's firstborn, but he died without a son or daughter. Anib was the middle son. He took the throne instead of Anki. He married Anib, who was the daughter of his younger brother. From that point on, the succession is written down in the history books. Who was that younger brother? One of the purest seed and the son of An and Antu? The councillors just looked at each other in shock. His name was Enugu, Anu told them. He was my great-great-grandfather. His wife, Ninuru, was his half-sister, and her firstborn son was named Inama. Seed and succession laws said that his wife was his half-sister, and she gave him a son. By law and seed, the generations kept coming from the same family. My parents named me Anu after our grandfather An. We have been kicked off the throne, but were not kicked off. An's pure seed, let Alalu be removed, let Anu be king, a lot of councillors yelled. Others gave advice. Let there be no fighting, and let unity win. They called Alalu to tell him what they had found. Alalu put his arm around Prince Anu and spoke to him in this way. Even though we have different parents, we both come from the same ancestor. Let's live in peace and help Nibiru return to plenty together. Let me keep the throne and you take care of the next king. He said to the council, Let Anu be crowned prince. Let his son marry my daughter and let the heirs unite. Let him be my successor. Anu bent down in front of the council. He said the following to the group. I will be Alalu's cupbearer and his heir apparent. As his bride, he will choose a son of mine or a daughter of his. That was the council's decision, written down in the royal records. In this way, Alalu stayed seated on the throne. He called on the wise people, geniuses and commanders. He consulted and learned a lot that helped him decide. He permitted boats from the heavens to be built to find the gold in the hammered bracelet. The boats were crushed by the hammered bracelets, and none returned. Let the weapons of terror be used to cut open Nibiru and let the volcanoes erupt again. He then gave an order. With weapons of terror, 
Chariots in the sky were loaded with terror missiles and fired from the sky at volcanoes. The mountains moved as bright light and thunder exploded, and the valley shook. There was a lot of happiness in the land, and there were hopes for plenty. Anu was in the palace for Alalu, who was in charge of the cups. He would bow at Alalu's feet and give Alalu the cup to drink from. Alalu was the king, and Anu worked for him as a servant. There was less joy in the land. The rain stopped, and the winds got more robust. The amount of gas that volcanoes blew out didn't get worse, and the hole in the atmosphere didn't get fixed. Nibiru's circuits kept going around in the sky. It got harder to handle the heat and cold from circuit to circuit. The people of Nibiru stopped respecting their king because he made things worse for them instead of better. Alalu stayed in his seat on the throne. The most powerful and wise prince, Anu, was standing before him. He would bow to Alalu's feet and give Alalu the cup to drink from. Alalu was the king of Nibiru for nine times that were measured. In the ninth Shah, Alalu and Anu fought. Alalu challenged him to fight hand to hand with no clothes on. Anu said, Let the winner be king. They fought in the public square. Doorposts and walls shook as they did so. Alalu bent his knee and fell on his chest to the ground. Alalu was defeated in battle, and Anu was hailed as king and taken to the palace. However, Alalu did not return to the palace. He sneaked away from the crowds because he feared doing what Lamu did. He quickly went to where the celestial chariots were, but no one knew. Alalu got into a chariot that could shoot missiles and shut the door behind him. He went into the front chamber and sat in the commander's chair. That which shows the way filled the chamber with a bluish glow. He woke up the firestones, and their humming sound was mesmerizing. He brought to life the chariot's great cracker, which was shining with a reddish light. Alalu from Nibiru got away in the celestial boat without anyone else knowing. Alalu set his course for a snowy earth. He chose his destination from the start by keeping it a secret. What the second part of this Akkadian tablet, MC2894A, says. Alalu's flight in a spacecraft that had nuclear weapons. He heads for the seventh planet, Ki, Earth, why he thinks gold will be on Earth. The history of the solar system, the water, and the gold of Tiamat. The first time Nibiru was seen from space. The battle of the gods and the breakup of Tiamat. Earth, half of Tiamat, gets her water and gold. Kingu, Tiamat's giant satellite, becomes Earth's moon. Nibiru will continuously circle the sun. When Alalu came to Earth and touched down. When Alalu finds gold, Nibiru's fate is in his hands. The reverse side of Morhen Collection Akkadian Tablet, MC2894A. Alalu set his course for snowy earth, but kept his destination a secret. Alalu went to off-limits places. No one had been there before, and no one at the hammered bracelet had tried to cross there. A secret from the start, Alalu's path has shown. It put the fate of Nibiru in his hands, and he devised a plan to make his kingship universal. He had to go into exile on Nibiru, but he risked death. In his plan, the risk was in the journey, and the reward was the eternal glory of success. Alalu looked at the heavens while flying like an eagle. Down below, Nibiru was a ball hanging in space. Its shape was beautiful, and its light lit up the sky. It was a considerable size, and when it burped, fire shot out. Its red, life-giving envelope was like a churning sea. The break was clear, like a dark wound in the middle of it. When he looked down again, the large hole had become a small tub. When he looked again, Nibiru's bright ball had become a small fruit. The next time he looked, 
Nibiru was gone from the vast dark sea. Alalu's heart was filled with regret, and fear held him by the hands. He made a choice to wait. Alalu thought about stopping in his tracks. Then he went back from being brave to make a decision. The chariot went a hundred leagues, then a thousand leagues, and then ten thousand leagues. Darkness was the darkest in the vast heavens, and the eyes of the stars far away were blinking. Alalu travelled more leagues, and then he saw something that made him very happy. In the vastness of the heavens, he was greeted by the messenger of the gods. Little Gaga, the one who shows the way, was welcomed by Alalu as he went around the circle. Before and after the celestial Antu, it would move with an uneven gait. It could face forward or backward because it had two faces. Alalu once thought that its first appearance was a good sign. He is welcomed by the gods of the sky. So was what he thought. Alalu rode his chariot along Gaga's path which led to the second god of the heavens. Soon after, King Enshar gave it the name Celestial Antu. It was getting dark in the deep. She was as blue as clean water, and the beginning of the upper waters. Alalu was amazed by how beautiful the scene was, so he kept a safe distance from the course. In the far distance, Antu's wife shimmered. She was the same size as Antu. His wife's double, An, was known for being a greenish blue. On its side, a dazzling host surrounded it, and they were given solid grounds. Alalu said goodbye to the two gods with love, but Gaga's path was still unclear. It was showing its old master, for whom it used to be a counsellor, how the course was changing for Anshar, the highest priest of the heavens. By the speeding chariot, Alalu could see how Anshar was pulling him in. The chariot was beautiful, with bright rings of colours. He quickly turned his eyes away from Alalu and toward that which shows the way. He saw the family's bright star in the faraway heavens, which was very unusual. After a terrifying sight, the truth came out. A giant monster, following its destiny, cast a darkening shadow on the sun. Its creator, Kisha, ate it up. The event was scary, and Alalu thought it was a bad sign. It was too big for the giant Kisha, who was the leader of the firm planets. Storms swirled around it, hiding its face, and coloured spots moved around on it. The god in the sky was surrounded by so many people that it was impossible to count them all. Their ways were hard to deal with, and they kept going back and forth. A spell was cast on Kisha, sending out divine lightning bolts. As Alalu watched, his path got off track. His direction was unclear, and his actions needed to be clarified. Then the deep darkness disappeared, and Kisha continued on his destiny to the circuit. As it slowly moved, the sun's light lifted its veil, revealing the one from the beginning. Joy in Alalu's heart was not long-lasting. He knew that beyond the fifth planet was the most dangerous place. The hammered bracelet was in charge. It was waiting to be broken. It was made by hammering together rocks and boulders. The rocks worked together like orphans without a mother. They went back and forth following an old plan. Their actions were disgusting, and their ways were hard to understand. Nibiru's probing chariots ate them up like hungry lions. The valuable gold that was needed to stay alive. They didn't want to move. Alalu's chariot was going full speed toward the hammered bracelet. The fierce boulders had to be bravely faced in close combat. Alalu stirred up the firestones in his chariot even more, and he drove that which shows the way with steady hands. The scary boulders next to the chariot moved forward like an enemy coming to attack. Alalu fired a death-dealing missile at them from the chariot. Then 
he fired another terror weapon at the enemy. As scared warriors, the boulders turned around, making way for Alalu. The hammered bracelet is like a spell that opens the door to the king. Even though Alalu was very deep and dark, the heavens were easy to see. He was not defeated by the bracelet's power. His mission did not end. In the distance, the sun's fiery ball, which was also its brilliance, was sending out rays of light toward Alalu. Before it was a reddish-brown planet making its way around, it was the sixth of the gods of the sky. Alalu could only catch a glimpse of it as it moved quickly away from his path. The seventh object in the sky was the snow-coloured earth. Alalu set his course toward the planet, and it was a very inviting place. Its catchy ball was more petite than Nibiru, and its catchy net was weaker than Nibiru. It had a thinner atmosphere than Nibiru, and clouds were swirling. Below, the earth is broken up into three regions. Snow white on top and bottom, with blue and brown in the middle. Alalu skillfully put the chariot's wings around the earth's ball to make a circle. In the middle, you could see both dry land and watery oceans. I have reached my goal. He told the insides of earth to pick up on the beam that went straight down. He shouted with excitement. Gold, a lot of gold, was shown by the beam. It was under a dark area and in the water as well. With his heart racing, Alalu decided to think about Will he crash and die if he lets his chariot fall on the dry land? Should he go straight into the water, where he might sink into oblivion? How will he stay alive? Will he discover valuable gold? Alalu was not moving in the eagle's seat, and he gave the chariot to fate. The chariot moved faster because it was fully caught in the earth's net. Its spread wings lit up, the air around earth was like an oven. Then the chariot started to shake, making a terrible thunder sound. The chariot crashed suddenly, and all of a sudden it stopped. Alalu couldn't move because the shaking and crash had made him lose his mind. Then he opened his eyes and saw that he was still alive. He had won and made it to the planet of gold. Now. Here's what we know about the earth and its gold. It tells about the beginning of time and how the gods in the sky made the world. When it all started, in the above, there were no gods in the heavens, and in the below, Ki, there was no name for the firm ground. Apsu, their first leader, was all alone in the void. In the heights of the above, there were no celestial gods yet and in the depths of the below there were no celestial gods either. Above and below were no gods yet, and no one knew what would happen. No reeds had grown yet, and there was no marshland. Apsu ruled the void all by himself. Then his winds mixed the waters of the beginning, and Apsu cast a divine and clever spell over the waters. He slept soundly in the deep of the void. Tiamat, the mother of everything, became his wife. She, indeed, was a mother from heaven and a watery beauty. Apsu's little Mumu then gave birth next to him, and he gave Tiamat a gift to bring to him as his messenger. Only she can have a gleaming metal, gold, that lasts forever. Apsu gave this beautiful gift to his wife. Then their waters mixed, and they had divine children to bring into the world. The celestials were created in both male and female forms. Lamu and Lahamu were their given names. Apsu and Tiamat constructed a house below. Anshar and Kishar were created in the waters of the above when they were older and taller. They were taller than their older brothers. The two were created to be a celestial couple, and they had a son named On in the faraway heavens. He was their scion. Then Antu was brought out, who was On's equal and would be his wife. 
Their house was built on the outskirts of the upper waters. This is how, below and above, three heavenly couples were created in the depths. They were known as Apsu's family because Mumu and Tiamat were among them. Nibiru had yet to be seen. The earth had to be created first. The holy waters had become entangled, and even a hammered bracelet couldn't separate them. Not all of the circuits had been completed. The fates of the gods had yet to be determined. The celestials got together, but they did strange things. Tiamat was upset and angry because she couldn't sleep on their journey to Apsu. She gathered a large crowd to march alongside her. She gave birth to a people who roared and fought against Apsu's sons. She had eleven of these babies. She made Kingu the group's firstborn and leader. When the gods of the sky learned about it, they convened a council meeting. She promoted Kingu to the rank of an An and gave him the order. They exchanged words. She placed a tablet of destiny on his chest, completing his circuit. She told her son Kingu to fight the gods, but who would stand up to Tiamat? Each god inquired of the other. No one from their group stepped forward, and no one was going into battle with a weapon. In the midst of the deep, a god was born. He was born in a location known as the Chamber of Fates. He was created by an artist and was the sun's son. The god quickly abandoned his family in the deep where he was born. He brought the seed of life, a gift from his creator. He set his sights on the void. He was looking for a new direction in his life. Antu was always on the lookout and was the first to spot the wandering celestial. His body was appealing and he shone. His walk was regal and the way he moved was magnificent. He was the most powerful of all the gods and his circle was more extensive than theirs. Antu was the first to notice him, even though her child had never sucked at her breast. Come join my family. Allow me to become your mother. She mentioned his name. She cast her net and made him feel at ease. His path was appropriate for the job. Her words made the newcomer proud, and her caring about him made him arrogant. His head doubled in size, and four things sprouted from his sides. He moved his lips in agreement, and a holy fire began to burn from them. He turned to face Antu, about to show An his face. When An saw him, he exclaimed, My son, my son! You will be responsible for something, and a host will be your servant. Let your name be Nibiru, because crossing will be remembered forever. When Nibiru passed by, he bowed to him and turned his back. He cast his net for Nibiru's four servants and caught them. His hosts are the south wind, north wind, fast wind and west wind. With a joyful heart, Anu told his ancestor Anshar about Nibiru. When Anshar's messenger Gaga heard this, he sent words of wisdom to An to assign a task to Nibiru's people. He told Gaga to say what was on his mind. That Tiamat the woman who gave birth to us now despises us. She has organized a group of people who want to fight, and she is furious. Her eleven warriors and children fight alongside her against the gods. She piled Kingu on top of them and scribbled a fate on his chest for no apparent reason. No god can withstand her poison. She has made us all fear her. Allow Nibiru to become our assailant. Let him defeat Tiamat and save our lives. Decide what will happen to him, and then let him face our formidable foe. He went to Gaga. He bowed before him and repeated Anshar's words. He told Nibiru what his ancestor said and what Gaga said to him. Nibiru was taken aback by the words. Based on what he had heard, he imagined the mother whose children would eat her alive. He addressed Arnand Gaga. Without saying anything, 
his heart told him to go fight Tiamat. He stated, If I am to defeat Tiamat and save your lives, I must gather the gods and declare that my destiny is supreme. Let all the gods agree in council that I should be in charge and that they should obey my commands. When Lamu and Lahamu heard this, they cried out in agony. The request was strange, and no one knew what it meant. The fate-deciding gods communicated with one another, so they informed me. They were all in agreement that Nibiru would be their revenger, and that he would have a wonderful life. Nobody will be able to argue with your rules from now on. None of us gods will go beyond your boundaries, they told him. Nibiru, go be our avenger. They carved out a princely path for him to take to Tiamat. They blessed Nibiru and bestowed upon him powerful weapons. Anshar also brought the evil wind, the whirlwind, and the matchless wind from Nibiru. Kishar's body was engulfed in flames, and he held a net around Tiamat. As a result, Nibiru set a direct course for Tiamat and prepared for battle. Now, let's look at what happened during the celestial battle. How the earth got its lead, and what will happen to Nibiru. The Lord went out and did his assigned task. He turned to face the raging Tiamat and cast a spell. He put on the pulsar and the emitter to protect himself. His crowned head glowed with a terrifying light. The smiter was on his right and the repeller was on his left. Like a storm, he sent out his seven helpers, the winds. He dashed toward Tiamat, who was enraged and yelling for a fight. The gods surrounded him, but they did not follow him. He was going forward to get a better look at Tiamat and her entourage, the plan devised by Kingu, the leader of her host. He lost his sense of direction, got off track, and didn't know what to do when he saw brave Kingu. Tiamat's group was completely surrounded, and they trembled in terror. Tiamat shook down to her roots and let out a mighty roar. She cast a spell and surrounded him with her charms on Nibiru. They both agreed on something, and the fight began. Tiamat and Nibiru came face to face and moved in opposite directions. As the battle approached, they decided to fight on their own. The Lord spread his net and threw it in an attempt to catch her. Tiamat screamed like she was insane in rage. She had gone insane. Nibiru pushed the evil wind from behind him in front of her and let it go. She attempted to swallow the evil wind but could not close her mouth. The evil wind struck her in the stomach and entered her body. Her stomach was rumbling, her body was swollen, and her mouth was open wide. Nibiru pierced the hole with a sharp arrow of divine lightning. It entered her body through her stomach, it shattered, it tore into her womb and broke her heart. He took her last breath now that he had her under control. Nibiru examined Tiamat's lifeless body, which resembled a dead animal. The eleven employees of their deceased employer trembled in horror. They were caught in Nibiru's net and were unable to escape. Tiamat made Kingu the gang's leader, so he was one of them. He was chained and tethered to his dead mistress by the Lord. He took the tablets of destiny from Kingu, which he found repulsive. He signed the destine and tied it to his chest. The rest of Tiamat's troop became prisoners in his web. He trod on them, breaking them up into small bits. He connected them to his circuit and led them back to the course to turn around. Nibiru then fled the area where the combat had taken place, to the gods who sent him to inform them of their victory. Nibiru passed on and on to on his way to the abode in the deep. He circled Apsu, visiting Kishar and Anshar along the way. He proceeded to tell the others after Gaga came out to greet him. He next considered what would happen to Tiamat 
who was no longer alive, and Kingu. Lord Nibiru returned to Tiamat, whom he had tamed. He found her, glanced at her dead body, and then walked away. A deception was devised to divide the monster in his heart. Then, like a muscle, he split her chest and lower torso into two halves. When the Lord trod on her backside, he severed her top half. He cut open her inner channels and marveled at her golden veins. He summoned the north wind, his ally, from his side. He instructed them to place the severed head of the wind in the empty area. The Nibiru wind then passed over Tiamat, sweeping over her raging waves. Nibiru fired a lightning bolt at north wind. He transmitted a message, and Tiamat's head was taken away in a blaze of light to an unknown location. Kingu was also sent away with her, and the portion that had been severed was to be his friend. Nibiru then considered what would happen to the back part. He wanted it to be a combat trophy that would survive eternally. The battleground to be enshrined serves as a permanent reminder. He used his mace to sever the horse's back. They then strung them all together to form a hammered bracelet. He secured them as watchmen by locking them together, a firmament to keep the waters separate from the waters. Nibiru has created beautiful works of art by separating the upper waters above the firmament from the lower waters. The Lord then crossed the heavens to examine the area, taking measurements from Apsu's quarters to Gaga's dwelling. He then stared at the deep, Nibiru's rim and his birthplace. He paused for a moment to reflect before returning to the battleground, the firmament. He resented travelling through Apsu's country and remembering the son's departed spouse. He focused his attention on Tiamat's wounded side and her upper body. Her treasure from the wounds, the life fluids, continued to flow. The rays of the sun were reflected in her golden veins. Then Nibiru realized his creator's birthright, the seed of life. He gave Tiamat the seed when he crushed and tore her apart. With your warm beams you can heal the injured, he told Apsu. Give the broken part new life in your family as your future daughter. Gather the rivers in one place, and let the stable ground arise. Firm land. Please call her Ki from now on. Apsu listened carefully when Nibiru stated, Let the earth join my family, Ki, firm land of the below. Let earth be her name from now on. Apsu said, Allow her to remain there by turning. I will provide her with healing rays throughout the day. Allow Kingu to be a creature of the night, and I will make him the moon for all time, Earth's friend. Nibiru, Apsu's words, were heard with delight. He studied the areas as he flew through the heavens. He bestowed permanent positions on the gods who raised him. None of their circuits were designed to be broken nor to fall short of each other. He strengthened the heavenly locks and gates on both his established sides. He chose an outermost residence that was sized beyond Gaga. He pleaded with Apsu to declare that the Grand Circuit would be his destiny. Every deity called out from their thrones, Let Nibiru's power be surpassed. Let the sun's sun indeed be the brightest of the gods. Before leaving his apartments, Apsu gave his approval. Nibiru, whose name means crossing, will preside over the union of heaven and earth. The gods will not pass through anything above or below him. He will occupy the centre and serve as the god's shepherd. His circuit will always be one shah. That is his destiny. This is the narrative of how the olden times began, as well as the period known as the Golden Era in the Annals and how expeditions from Nibiru were dispatched to Earth to acquire gold. It all started with Alalu's flight from Nibiru. Alalu infused much of what he had learned with extraordinary insight. 
His forefather, Anshar Gal, gathered excellent knowledge about the heavens and circuits. Anshar significantly improved their knowledge. Alalu received considerable knowledge from it. He talked with intelligent men and sought guidance from savants and commanders. Alalu had this knowledge because he had studied about the beginning. The gold on the hammered bracelet served as confirmation. The gold in Tiamat's hammered bracelet was the indicator. With thundering claps, Alalu triumphantly landed on the planet of gold in a chariot. He used a beam to scan the surroundings for his whereabouts. Hello! A chariot came down to earth and landed on the edge of a vast marsh. He changed into a fish suit and an eagle helmet. He then unlocked chariot's hatch, pausing to consider. The heavens were blue-white, and the earth was dark. There was silence, and no one to greet him. He stood alone in a strange world, perhaps from Nibiru, exiled forever. He lowered himself to the ground and trod on the dark-coloured earth. Hills in the distance could be seen, and many forests nearby. He stepped into one of the wetlands in front of him. He trembled as he felt the chill of the marsh's waters. He returned to solid ground and found himself alone in an unfamiliar world. He was seized with thoughts, aching for his bride and children. Had he been exiled from Nibiru forever? He couldn't stop wondering about it. He quickly returned to the chariot with food and drink to keep himself alive. Then, thanks to profound sleep, he awoke from a deep nap. He couldn't remember how long he'd slept or what had woken him up. Outside there was a dazzling light and an unseen glow on Nibiru. He took a tester-equipped pole from the chariot. It consumed the planet's air, proving its compatibility. After opening the chariot's hatch, he inhaled deeply. He inhaled again, then another, then another. The air in Ki was suitable. Alalu clasped his hands and sang a happy tune. He perished without a fish suit or an eagle helmet. The sun's rays were blinding, and the brightness outside was overwhelming. He returned to the chariot with an eye mask. He took up the sword he was carrying and the expensive sampler. He was on the dark-coloured earth where he had stepped. He made his way toward the marshes, whose water was a dark greenish. Alalu took a pebble from the swamp's edge and tossed it into the area. As he moved across the marsh, he noticed the fish-filled streams below. He lowered the sampler into the swamp and considered the filthy waters. Alalu was devastated to find that the water was unsafe to drink. He pulled a U-turn and went for the hills away from the marshes. As he proceeded through the foliage, he passed through shrubs and trees. Because of the number of fruit-bearing plants, the area resembled an orchard. As the pleasant perfume of the fruit enticed Alalu, he placed it on his lips. The sweeter the flavour, the more delicious the fragrance. Alalu was delighted with joy. Alalu was walking away from the sun's rays toward the hills he had chosen. He felt moisture under his feet among the branches, indicating the presence of water nearby. He planned his route toward the dampness. There was a still pool of water and a pond in the woods. He lowered the sampler into the pond, since it was safe to drink. Alalu couldn't stop himself from laughing. There was fruit and fish, and the water was drinkable. Alalu knelt, cupped his hands together, and drew water to his mouth. The water became cold, and the water from Nibiru had a distinct flavour. He drank again, then split in two, terrified. He heard a hissing sound and saw a writhing body alongside the pool. He grabbed his weapon and fired a flash of light toward the hissing. Both the moving and hissing stopped. Alalu approached the threat to examine it. Nibiru's sight has never been seen, 
but the bizarre sight of the lifeless creature with its slithered body lying immobile and lacking any hands or feet was that of a rope. It was a creature from another world. Its little head was ornamented with fierce eyes, and a lengthy tongue protruded from its mouth. Alalu reflected on himself. Was it the orchard's keeper? Was it the water's master? He doubted himself. He was carrying water in his flask and moving while keeping a lookout for the chariot. He also gathered some excellent fruits before setting off for the chariot. When he arrived at the chariot, the sun's brightness had faded, and darkness had taken its place. Alalu was taken aback by how short the day had been. An astonishing lightness was developing on the horizon from the direction of the marshes. A bright white ball was rapidly rising in the sky. He had now seen Kingu, Earth's mate. The planets and their circuits, the hammered bracelet, Ki, the Earth, and Kingu, its moon, were constructed and named. Alalu felt that beholding demanded one more truth. The secret to salvation rested in the gold to be discovered. If the stories from the beginning are true, and Tiamat's golden veins were indeed swept away by the waves, the cut-off half of gold must be discovered in Ki. With shaking hands, Alalu the tester disassembled the chariot's pole. As they eagerly anticipated the approaching daybreak, the fish's outfit was put on with trembling hands. He walked out of the chariot and onto the marshes at first light. He waded the tester deeper into the waters he had introduced. As his heart thumped in his chest, he attentively examined its illuminated visage. The testers showed its findings in the water's composition, represented by symbols and numbers. There is gold in the seas, the tester said, and Alalu's heart stopped. He lowered the tester back into the water, and the gold tester announced once more. Alalu took a step forward, wobbly on his legs, before continuing into the marshes. Nibiru's destiny is now in my hands, declared Alalu proudly. He returned to the chariot, removed the fish disguise, and took his seat as commander. The Tablets of Destinies are aware of all the circuits. He connected to Nibiru's circuit to decide the direction. He summoned the Speaker of Words to deliver the words to Nibiru. Then he spoke the words of Nibiru. He was described as follows. In his words, the great Alalu addresses Anu on Nibiru. In another world, I discovered the gold of salvation. Nibiru's future is in my control. You must heed my requests. A synopsis of Mohen Collection Babylonian Tablet, MC 17494b. Enlil, Anu's first son, suggests on site verification. Alalu sends the message to Nibiru and reclaims the throne. Anu, taken aback, puts the subject to the royal council. Ea, Anu's firstborn and Alalu's son-in-law, is instead chosen. Ea skillfully equips the heavenly boat for the journey. The spacecraft's pilot, Anzu, is carrying fifty heroes. Despite the perils, the Nibirians exult at the sight of Earth. They splash down and wade ashore, guided by Alalu. Eridu, home away from home, is established in seven days. The extraction of gold from the canals begins. Despite the small amount, Nibiru needs the delivery of Opgol, a pilot who chooses Alalu's spaceship for the mission. Inside the spaceship, there are illicit nuclear weapons. Ea and Opgol remove and hide the terror weapons. There are three tablets. Nibiru's future is in my control. You must heed my requests. Alalu spoke the words, projecting them from Nibiru to the dark-tinted earth. When the monarch Anu got the messages from Alalu, he was shocked, as were the wise men and counsellors. They asked each other questions. 
Is Alalu still alive and well? Could he be from another planet? They were speaking in a sceptical tone. Wasn't he fleeing in the chariot to a safe haven on Nibiru? The chariot commanders were summoned, and the beamed words were considered. The words were spoken from outside the hammered bracelet, not from Nibiru. They discovered this and told King Anu about it. Anu was taken aback and had no idea what had transpired. Let words of acknowledgement to Alalu be delivered to the gathered, he said. At the place of the celestial chariots, Alalu was given the following orders. Anu the king wishes his congratulations and expresses his joy upon knowing about your health. There was no reason for you to leave Nibiru because Anu has no ill will against you. Allow Nibiru to be saved if you have discovered the gold of salvation. When Anu Alalu's chariot spoke, Alalu reacted immediately. If I am to be your saviour, I will save your lives. Gather the princes. My ancestry reveals itself to be supreme. Allow the commanders to choose me as their commander and submit to my power. Allow the council to appoint me as ruler, assuming Anu's throne. When people heard Alalu's claims regarding Nibiru, they were outraged. Councillors interrogated one another. Anu was deposed in what way? What is the condition of his asylum? Did he really find gold? What if Alalu's mischief conveys the story rather than the truth? They sought the wisdom and counsel of the wise and knowledgeable. I was Alalu's master, said the oldest first. He was speaking. He had listened to the beginning's instructions and the celestial battle lessons he was learning. If he had gone beyond the hammered bracelet, he would have known of the aquatic monster Tiamat and her golden veins. His safe sanctuary is the seventh planet from Earth. Before the assembly, a prince addressed the subject claiming to be Anu's son and the son of Anu's wife, Antu. Enlil's name means Lord of the Command. He was issuing warnings. Alalu is deafeningly silent when discussing circumstances. He wreaked havoc, losing the throne in a single wrestling match. If Tiamat's gold had been discovered, the proof was necessary. Would it be sufficient to protect our environment? How is it transported to Nibiru via the hammered bracelet? Enlil Anu's son spoke in this manner, and many other questions were asked. Even though many responses and proof were required, everyone agreed. Alalu had received the assembly's message, and he needed to respond. Alalu weighed the importance of his statements and chose to divulge his secrets. He recounted his voyage and its perils. He extracted the tester's crystal internal organs and the sampler's crystal heart. The crystals and other discoveries were then placed in the speaker for broadcast. Declare me king and obey my orders now that the proof has been revealed. He made a strong demand. The sages were stunned. He demolished the bracelet with weapons of terror and unleashed even more havoc on Nibiru with Alalu. As Nibiru circles that region, tragedies accumulate in Alalu. The kingship to be changed was a serious matter, and there was much concern in the council. Anu was king not only because of his ancestors, but also because of fair warfare. Anu's son spoke in front of the assembled princes. He was one of the sages recognized for his all-encompassing wisdom. He was known as Enki, he whose home is water, and he was a master of the secrets of the waterways. He was Anu's firstborn and married Domkina, Alalu's daughter. Anu the king is my biological father, but Ea claims Alalu is my stepfather. My fiancé's purpose was to bring the two clans together. Let me be the one to bring peace to this battle. Allow me to represent Anu to Alalu and defend Alalu's discoveries. Let me arrive on earth in a chariot. I will dig a water-only path through the bracelet. According to the sage's assessment, 
Alalu should reign as Earth's monarch. Let there be a second wrestling bout, and if Nibiru can save, who will rule? Allow it to make a decision. Let me retrieve the valuable gold from Earth's rivers and return it to Nibiru. The prince's advisers, sages and commanders were ready for the struggle they had discovered as they listened in amazement to Ea's words. Allow it to happen. Allow Ea to travel and the gold to be examined, Anu stated. I'll fight Alalu once more. May the victor reign as Nibiru's monarch. Alalu received the ruling's words. After thinking, he welcomed Ea, his son by marriage to earth. Collecting gold from the seas, put it to the test for Nibiru's salvation and decide whether Anu or I shall rule the second wrestling throne. Okay then, Anu presided over the gathering. Enlil protested, but the king's word was final. When he arrived at the chariot location, he sought the council of commanders and wise men. He considered the risks of the venture and the difficulties of mining and transporting the gold. He carefully analyzed Alalu's transmission and requested additional testing to obtain the necessary answers. He was making a tablet of destinies for himself. If water is the source of the force, whence can it be replenished? How will it be stored on the chariot, and how will it be converted into force? In meditations, a full circle of Nibiru and a shah of Nibiru were finished. The mission's most massive heavenly chariot has been outfitted. A tablet of destiny has been firmly fixed, and the destiny of its circuit has been computed. Fifty heroes are required for the journey to earth to collect the riches. His approval was given for Anu's journey, and the stargazers were picked when the expedition was ready to begin. Many people flocked to the place of the chariots to bid farewell to the heroes and their leader. Did the soldiers enter the chariot one at a time, each wearing an eagle's helmet and carrying a fish suit? Ea was the last to depart the ship and say goodbye to the others. He bowed before his father Anu to win the king's blessing. My firstborn, my son, you've come a long way, putting us all in danger. Please let Nibiru's catastrophe pass you by so you can safely return. Before saying his parting farewell, Anu blessed his son. Ninul, Ea's mother, embraced him from the bottom of her heart. Why did you give him a restless heart after Anu gave me you as a son? Return safely across the perilous path, she spoke to him. Ar kissed Dumkina his wife without saying anything. Enlil and his half-brother were holding hands. He wished him prosperity and good fortune. Now that the journey to the seventh planet has been narrated, the narrative of the fish god who rose from the sea may begin. Ea, the chariot, arrived with a heavy heart to carry out his orders. Anzu drove the chariot, not Ea, and Anzu sat in the commander's seat. His name meant he who knows the heavens, and he was picked specifically for the position. He was a prince among princes, claiming royal ancestry. He skillfully steered the celestial chariot as it rose forcefully toward the distant sun, guided by Nibiru. Chariot travelled ten leagues, one hundred leagues, and one thousand leagues. They were welcomed by little Gaga, who was also greeting the heroes. It gave blue-tinted guidance to the charming enchantress Antu. Anzu was drawn in by her appearance. Let's explore her oceans, Anzu is speaking. It's a world with no turning back, Ea said emphatically, continuing to talk without hesitating. The chariot continued its journey toward the solar system's third planet. His moon's entourage was twirling around him while Anu lay next to him. Water was evident in the tester's beams, indicating where Ea should stop if necessary. Ea proclaimed he would lead the way to Anshar, the highest prince of heaven, to continue the journey. 
they quickly became conscious of Anshar's magnetic pull, appreciating his ring of terror's various colors. Anzu, the chariot guide, deftly avoided the lethal threats. The massive Kishar was the second definite planet discovered. Her net had a strong pull, but Anzu the chariot reversed direction with incredible skill. Kishar thrusts in wrath at the flashes of the holy lightning chariot, her host thrusting at the unwanted. Kishar steadily retreated in preparation for the chariot, which was waiting beyond the fifth planet for the hammered bracelet. The water thruster was instructed to prepare so that his labor of love might begin to spin. The chariot was hurtling toward a swarm of whirling boulders, each one hurling itself at the chariot like a slingshot stone. When Ar gave the word, a water stream with the force of a thousand heroes was launched. As they formed a path for the chariot, the boulders faced each other one by one. However, as one boulder fled, another attacked in its place. They were a veritable army, a host for Tiamat's vindictive splitting. Ea repeatedly told the water thruster to keep spinning, repeatedly directed streams of water at the swarm of stones, repeatedly made the boulders' faces alter, allowing the chariot to pass. The chariot could proceed without incident once the path was clear. The heroes let out a joyous yell, which was heightened by the emergence of the sun. Amid Anzu's excitement, the alert went off. For the way to having fashioned, excessive waters were eaten. Waters were insufficient to keep the chariot's flaming stones hydrated for the rest of the journey. They could see the sun's rays reflected in the sixth planet's profound darkness. He was asking for Anzu. Enki is assisting Lamu who has water. Do you want to ride the clown chariot over there? Anzu, the chariot, maneuvered it deftly toward Lamu, reaching the celestial god and forming a circle around it. Anzu believes that the planet's attraction is too easy to handle, and that its network could be more robust. Lamu was a sight to behold. It was multicolored with pure white stones and headgear. It had a reddish center surrounded by dazzling streams and lakes. The chariot, piloted by Anzu, paused traffic and plummeted alongside a lake. While wearing their eagle's helmets, Ea and Anzu strayed to the solid ground. At the command, the heroes that which water sucks expanded the chariot, filling its interior with lake water. While the chariot drank its fill of water, Ea and Anzu inspected the place. Tester and Sampler uncovered everything that mattered. The waters were okay to drink, but the air was insufficient. All of this was recorded in the chronicles of the chariot, and the cause for the diversion was explained. After regaining vigor, the chariot ascended to compassionate Lamu's farewell salutation. Beyond, the seventh planet was circling. Earth and its companion, the chariot, were calling. In the commander's chair, Anzu and Ea remained mute. They were on their way to discovering whether Nibiru would offer them salvation or damnation. A chariot must be slowed, or it will perish in Earth's dense atmosphere, Anzu informed Ea. Make leisurely circles around the moon, Earth's friend, he was proposed to by Ea. They circled the moon, prostrate and scarred by the celestial battles destroyed Nibiru. As a result, the chariot slowed as it reached Anzu, the seventh planet. He drew the chariot in a circle twice the size of the earth, and then gradually drew it closer to the firm land. The planet was two-thirds snow-colored with a black center. They could see the firm lands and oceans while looking for the signal beacon from Alalu. Alalu's signal was sent whenever an ocean met the dry ground and the wetlands absorbed four rivers. Because it was so vast and heavy, the chariot belongs in the marshes, Anzu made a remark. Because the earth's tugging net is too strong, the dry ground cannot descend, Anzu informed Ea. 
splash down, splash into the waves of the ocean, Ea to Anzu screamed. Anzu drove his chariot around the earth one more time before carefully lowering it to the water's edge. The chariot's lungs expanded as air entered them. It splashed into the water below, but did not sink. A voice from the speaker said, Welcome to Earth. Alalu took the floor, his beaming statements pointed in the direction of his whereabouts. The chariot was moving through the river in the direction Anzu the chariot indicated. Soon the vast sea began to close in, and dry ground appeared on both sides as a protector. On the suitable highlands, brown-hued hills rose to the left, their heads pointed to heaven. The chariot, floating like a ship on the waters, made its way to Alalu's place. The marshes ahead were replaced by the oceans as the dry land was swamped. In response to the hero's orders, Anzu ordered their fish suits. The heroes entered the marshes via the chariot's hatch. Strong ropes were connected to the chariot and used to pull it. Alalu's beaming statements became more powerful. Hurry, hurry, this is what he stated. At the marsh's edge there was a sight to behold. Alalu's sacred vessel, Nibiru, was riding in a chariot that gleamed in the sunlight. The hero accelerated his movement toward Alalu's chariot. They accelerated. Ar put on his fish suit out of impatience. His chest felt like it was pounding like a drum. He jumped into the swamp and dashed toward the edge. The bottom was more profound than he expected, and the marshes flooded to vast heights. He changed his pace to that of a swimmer, propelling himself ahead with powerful strokes. He could see verdant pastures as he approached dry land. He rose up and began walking once his feet touched solid ground. Alalu stood in front of him, throwing his hands wildly. Ea emerged from the sea and stood on the dark surface of the earth. Alalu dashed in his direction and embraced his son through marriage tightly. Welcome to a new world, Alalu spoke to Ea. This describes how Eridu came to be on earth and how the seven-day count began. Alalu, Ea, held hands in silence, his eyes welling up with ecstasy tears. Ea bowed in front of him in respect for his father, whom he had married. The heroes were making their way through the marshes, while others were running toward the dry ground while clothed in fish suits. Don't let the chariot go down. Avoid the dirt ahead by anchoring it in the water. Anzu was in command. The heroes landed in front of Alalu. They were working on bows. Anzu, the last chariot to leave, arrived. He bowed before Alalu, and the two exchanged greetings. All visitors were greeted warmly by Alalu. Everyone in the room heard Ea's instruction. I am Earth's commander, this is what he stated. We have arrived on a life-or-death mission. Nibiru's future is in our hands. He looked about for a probable spot for his planned encampment. There are mounds in the soil. Ea issued the order to set up a camp. He was pointing to a nearby reed hut home erected by Alalu. To the king, my father, Anu, herald your triumphant arrival, he said to Nibiru before saying to Anzu. As it turned, the hue of the heavens changed from dazzling to scarlet. They were watching something unprecedented. The sun was disappearing like a red ball on the horizon. Fear incapacitated the heroes of the great calamity. They were terrified. A lowering of the sun. It is indicating the end of one day on earth, Alalu says as he laughs. Lay down for a quick snooze. A night on earth is short. The sun will appear before you know it, and it will be morning on earth. The heavens and the earth separated as darkness descended abruptly. Lightning strikes pierced the darkness, and it rained and thundered. 
winds like storms from an otherworldly god blew across the ocean. Within the chariot the heroes assembled. They were upset since they had not gotten any sleep. With bated breath we awaited the return of the sun. When its rays appeared, they giggled and slapped each other on the back. Their first day on earth included both an evening and a morning. By daylight, Ea had already considered the occurrences. He was considering how to divide the oceans. Engur fashioned the master from the beautiful waters to provide drinking water. He walked to the snake pond with Alalu, thinking about its warm waters. Nasty snakes were spreading in the pond. Engur informed Ea of this. Ea then reflected on a large amount of rainfall he had collected in the marshlands. He named the reed thicket he was directing and delegated wetland maintenance to Enbilulu. Enkidu, who was in charge of the ditch and dike, constructed a boundary so that the marshes could create a collection area for the rainwater. As a result, marsh waters and pleasant waters were separated from the waters above and below. The second day on earth occurred between the hours of dusk and dawn. As soon as sun-dawn was declared, the hero accomplished the chores assigned to him. Alalu Ea's steps were aimed toward the grass and trees area. Herbs and fruits of various kinds grow on everything in the orchard. Ea posed the following inquiries to his vizier Isimud. What exactly is this plant? What exactly is that plant? He was curious. Isimud, a learned man, could tell what food grew well. He ripped a fruit from a honey plant for Ea. In his remarks to Ea, he ate one fruit and Ea ate one fruit. The hero, the guru, is given power over the food that grows due to his excellent reputation. As a result, the hero was given drink and nourishment, but he was unsatisfied. The third day on earth occurred between the hours of dusk and dawn. The winds died down on the fourth day, and the waves had no effect on the chariot, allowing the chariot's tools to be brought and the encampment's dwellings to be built. This was given by Ea. In charge of mould and brick-making, Kula assigned Ea to make clay bricks and give Mushdamu the order to build foundations and dwellings. The sun shone all day brightly, generating the day's brightness. By sunset, Kingu, one of the heavenly gods, was supposed to represent the earth's moon, which casts a pale light on earth and a lesser light to rule the night when it is complete. It was the fourth day on earth, late at night and early in the morning. On the sixth day, Ea Ningisi gave the order to build a reed boat. It is critical to assess the extent of the swamplands and the distance between the marshes. Ulmash, the one who knows what swarms in the oceans and who amid the birds that soar. Enki relied on Ulmash to help him distinguish between good and evil. The Ulmash were unaware of many creatures that swam in the oceans and take flight in the air. Their sheer numbers were astounding. The carp were large and swimming among the undesirables. Ea summoned Enbilulu, master of the marshlands, and Kimdu, commander of the ditch and dike. He spoke to them in the marshlands to build a barrier. Catching fish with the help of cane breaks and green reeds, a trap for carp that could not escape from a net was set up there. No bird suitable for consumption could escape from its net. For the heroes given, fish and poultry were separated into gorgeous varieties. It was now the morning after the sixth day on earth had ended. On the sixth day, each of the orchard's creatures began keeping score. Enursag to his task of distinguishing between what creeps and what walks on foot. Their personalities left Enursag stunned, and he told Ea about the ferocity of their wildness. Mushdamu was summoned by Ea Kula, who issued the following urgent orders. The houses will be completed by the evening, and a fence will surround them for security. The warriors who took up the assignments quickly laid bricks on the foundations. The roofing was made of reeds, 
while the fencing was made of felled trees. A beam that kills from the chariot carried over a speaker that words beams to the house he made for Ea, Anzu. Everything Ea, Alalo, and Anzu did was positive in light of their acts. The camp was completed by the evening. The heroes gathered for the evening. The sixth day has nighttime and morning hours. On the seventh day, the heroes of the encampment gathered. They overheard Ea declare to them, We have taken a risky, dangerous road from Nibiru to the seventh planet. We landed on earth, did much good, and established an encampment. Today should be a day of relaxation, and the seventh day should always be a day of rest. The phrase Eridu should now be replaced with home in the far away, which means the same thing. To fulfill a vow, declare Alalu of Eridu as commander. The assembled heroes roared their approval in unison. Before paying respect to Ea, Alalu said the following words of agreement. Give Ea a new nickname, Nudimud, the artful fashioner. The hero all nodded in agreement. The seventh day has nighttime and morning hours. This is the narrative of how the gold search began and how Nibiru's plans to save itself fell miserably. After Eridu's tent had been erected and the heroes had eaten enough to satisfy them, Ea gold was gathered from the canals. The chariot's firestones were stirred, as was its great cracker. With that which water sucks from the chariot expanded, it was immersed in marsh waters. Water was directed into a crystal jar. The water draws out all the metal in the jar, including the crystals. The water was then spat out of the vessel and into the fish pond, where the metals in the water were collected. Ea was a talented tailor, and his creations were fantastic. Marsh waters were pulled in and spewed for six days on earth as metals accumulated inside the vessel. Ea and Alalu studied the metals on the seventh day. The metals in the jar varied. There was plenty of copper and iron, but gold was scarce. In the chariot was another vessel, another work of art by Nudimud. After being split into numerous categories, the metals were delivered ashore one by one. As a result, the heroes must work for six days straight before taking a day off. Over six days, the crystal bowls were filled and emptied. On the seventh day, metals were counted. There were also copper, iron and other metals, and the gold was collected in the most miniature mound. During the night, the moon waxed and waned. The month made its circuit call. It declared the seventh day, a day of rest, by its half-crown when the month began, as its six days of sparkling horns signified. The moon was seen halfway through its fullness. After that, it shrank. The moon's orbit aligned with the sun's path, revealing the earth's face. The moon's motions captivated Ea, Key's attachment to Kingu. He pondered, what was the purpose of the attachment, and what divine sign did it convey? Month referred to Ea as the moon's circuit, and Month named its circuit. The rivers separated in the chariot for a month and two months. The sun gave earth a new season every six months. Ea named winter and summer. Winter and summer existed. By the year of earth, Ea had completed the circuit. By the end of the year, the accumulated gold account had been taken. There should have been more to send to Nibiru. The swampland's waters were insufficient. Transport the chariot to the more bottomless, unfathomable sea. Ea had already stated this. The chariot was unmoored and returned to its original place. The salt water was circulated through the stirred-up crystal jars with care. Metals were classified into numerous categories, and gold shone brightly among them. Ea received word of the events from the chariot and sent it to Nibiru, where Anu was overjoyed. Nibiru was on its way to the sun's dwelling, and was getting closer to Earth on its Shah circuit. 
Anu inquired eagerly about the gold. Was he asking, have enough arrived to send to Nibiru? Unfortunately, more of the gold from the waters was needed. Let another shah go by and double the amount, Ea gave advice to Anu. Obtaining gold from the ocean's waters continued. Enki felt apprehension filling his heart. Parts were hauled from the chariot and a sky chamber was assembled. Abgal, he who knows the pilot of the sky chamber to take charge, he appointed. Daily in the sky chamber with Abgal did Ea upward soar, the earth and its secrets to learn. For the sky chamber an enclosure was constructed, by Alalu's chariot was it placed. Daily the crystals in Alalu's chariot did Ea study, what by their beams was discovered to understand. Whence does the gold come? he asked Alalu. Where on earth are Tiamat's golden veins? In the sky chamber with Abgal did Ea upward soar, the earth and its secrets to learn. Over majestic mountains they roamed, in the valley's great rivers they saw steppes and forests below were stretched, and thousands of leagues were within reach. Vast lands separated by oceans they recorded, with the beam that scans the soils they penetrated. On Nibiru impatience was growing. Was the outcry increasing? Can gold protection provide? Assemble the gold. On Nibiru's bearing gold you must deliver. So did Anu Ea's command. Repair Alalu's chariot for returning to Nibiru, make it fit, and prepare it for the Shah's completion. So was Anu saying. Ea, his father's, the king's words were heeding. He contemplated repairing Alalu's chariot. As the sky chamber one eve by the side of the chariot they landed. With Abgal the chariot they entered a secret deed in the darkness to perform. The weapons of terror, the seven of them, from the chariot they removed. To the sky chamber they took them inside the sky chamber to give them hiding. By sunrise, Ea with Abgal in the sky chamber soared to another land was their direction. There in a secret place did Ea the weapons hide. In a cave, a place unknown, he stored them. Then to Anzu Ea words of command gave, to repair Alalu's chariot he directed, for returning to Nibiru to make it fit, by the Shah's completion to make it ready. Anzu in the ways of chariot is exceptionally skilled in the task his labours set. He made its thrusters hum again, its tablets he contemplated. The absence of the weapons of terror he soon discovered. With anger, Anzu cried out. Ea of their hiding away explained. Forsworn is the weapon's use, Ea was saying. Neither in the heavens nor on firm lands shall they ever be harnessed. Without them, no passage through the hammered bracelet is safe. Without them, without water thrusters, the danger is endurance surpassing. Anzu is speaking. Alalu of Eridu, the commander, the words of Ea considered. To the words of Anzu heed he gave. The words of Ea by the council of Nibiru are attested, Alalu was saying. But without the chariot's return, Nibiru shall be doomed. Abgal, who knows the pilot boldly toward the leaders, stepped forward. I shall be the pilot. The dangers I shall valiantly face, he was speaking. Thus was the decision made. Abgal shall be the pilot, and Anzu on earth shall stay. On Nibiru, the stargazers, the destinies of the celestial gods contemplated, an opportune day they were selecting. Into Alalu's chariot basketfuls of gold were carried. The fore part of the chariot Abgal entered, the commander's seat he occupied. From the chariot of Enki to him Enki's tablet of destiny gave. Shall be that which shows the way for you. By the opened pathway you shall find. The chariot's firestones Abgal stirred up. Their hum-like music was enthralling. He enlivened the chariot's great cracker, a reddish brilliance it was casting. 
Enki and Alalu, the multitude of heroes, were standing around saying farewell to him. They were bidding. Then the chariot with a roar heavenward rose, to the heavens it ascended. To Nibiru words of the ascent were beamed. There was much expected of Nibiru. Synopsis of the Fourth Tablet The Nibirians hail even the small gold delivery tests of gold's use as an atmospheric shield succeed. Additional heroes and new equipment are sent to Earth. Gold extraction from the water continue to disappoint. Ar discovers gold sources that need deep mining in the Abzu. Enlil then Anu comes to Earth for crucial decisions. As the half-quarrel, brothers lots decide the tasks. Ar renamed Enki, Earth's master, goes to the Abzu. Enlil stays to develop permanent facilities in the Edid. As Anu prepares to lease, he is attacked by Lalu. The seven who judge sentence Alalu to exile on Lamu. Anu's daughter Ninma, a medical officer, is sent to Earth. Stopping off at Lamu, Mars, she finds Alalu dead. A rock carved to resemble Alalu's face serves as his tomb. Anzu is given command of a way station on Lamu. Reverse side, partly damaged, Morhen Collection Assyrian Tablet, Mosul MC1265M. To Nibiru, words of the ascent were beamed. There was much expected of Nibiru. With confidence, Abgal, the chariot guiding, around Kingu, the moon, he made a circuit by its net power's speed to gain. A thousand leagues, ten thousand leagues toward Lamu he journeyed. Through its net power, a direction toward Nibiru to obtain. Beyond Lamu, the hammered bracelet was whirling. Deftly did Abgal Ea's crystals make a glow, the opened paths to locate. The eve of fate upon him with favour looked. Beyond the bracelet, the chariot beamed signals from Nibiru, receiving, homeward, homeward was the direction. Ahead, in the darkness, a reddish hue glowed Nibiru, a sight to behold. By the beamed signals, the chariot was now directed. Thrice around Nibiru it made circuits, by its net force to be slowed. Nearing the planet, the breach in its atmosphere Abgal could see. He felt a squeezing in his heart of the gold he was bringing. What was he thinking? Passing through the atmosphere's thickness, a glow was the chariot, its heat overbearing. Deftly did Abgal spread the chariot's wings, its descent arresting. Beyond lay the place of the chariots, a sight most inviting. Gently did Abgal the chariot bring down to a place by the beams selected. He opened the hatch. A multitude of the populace was there assembled. Anu toward him stepped forward, locked arms, warm greetings uttered. Heroes into the chariot rushed, the gold-bearing baskets they brought out. High above their heads the baskets held. To the assembled words of victory Anu shouted. Salvation is here, to them he was saying. To the palace was Abgal accompanied to rest and tell all he was escorted. The gold, a sight most dazzling by the savants, was quickly taken. To make of it the finest dust, to skyward launch, it was hauled away. A shah did the fashioning last, and a shah did the testing continue. With rockets was the dust heavenward carried. By crystal's beams was it dispersed. Where there was a breach, now there was a healing. Joy the palace filled, and abundance in the land was expected. To earth, Anu's good words were beaming. Gold gives salvation. The obtaining of gold continues. When Nibiru near the sun came, the golden dust was by its rays disturbed. The healing in the atmosphere dwindled, and the breach to bigness returned. Anu, the return of Abgal to earth, then commanded. In the chariot more heroes travelled. In its bowels more that which the water sucks in and thrusts out were provided. 
With them, Nungal to travel was commanded, a pilot helper to Abgal to become. Great joy there was when Abgal to Eridu returned. Many greetings and the locking of arms there. The new waterworkings Ea with care contemplated. There was smiling on his face. In his heart there was a squeezing. By Shah's time, Nungal in the chariot was to depart ready. The chariot had only a few baskets of gold in its bowels. The disappointment in Nibiru Ea's heart to him was predicted. Enki with Alalu words exchanged. That which was known they reconsidered. If Earth, the head of Tiamat, was in the celestial battle cut off, where was the neck? Where were the golden veins cut asunder? Where were the golden veins from Earth's innards protruding? In the sky chamber, Enki over mountains and valleys travelled. The lands by oceans separated, him with the scanner examined. Again and again there was the same sign. Where dry land from dry land apart was torn, earth's innards were revealed. Where the landmass with the shape of a heart was given, in the lower part thereof, golden veins from earth's innards were abundant. Abzu, of gold the birthplace, Ea to the region the name gave. Ea then to Anu words of wisdom beamed. With gold earth is filled. The gold must be gotten from the veins, not the waters. From earth's bowels, not from its waters, must the gold be obtained. From a region beyond the ocean, Abzu, it shall be called, can an abundance of gold be gotten. In the palace there was great astonishment. Savants and counsellors to Ea's words gave consideration. That gold must be obtained. On that unanimity there was. How to obtain it from the bowels of the earth, of that there was much discussed. In the assembly a prince spoke up. Enlil was the half-brother of Ea. First Alalu, then his son by marriage, Ea, upon waters placed all hope. Of salvation by water's gold they were reassuring. Shah after Shah, all of us salvation were expecting. Now different words we are hearing, a task beyond imagining to undertake. Proof of the golden veins is needed, and a plan for success must be ensured. So was Enlil to the assembly saying. To his words many in agreement listened. Let Enlil go to earth, Anu was saying. Let him proof obtain, a plan put forward. His words shall be heeded, his words a command shall be. In unanimity the assembly consented, and Enlil's mission was approved. With Alalgar, his chief lieutenant, Enlil for earth departed. Alalgar, his pilot, was. With each, a sky chamber the two of them provided. To earth, Anu, the king, and words of decisions were beamed. Enlil of the mission in command shall be, his words shall be the command. When Enlil on earth arrives, Ea and his half-brother warmly lock arms. As brother meets brother, Ea Enlil is welcomed. To Alalu, Enlil made a bowing. Alalu, with weak words, bade welcome. The heroes, to Enlil's words of warm welcome, were shouting at the commander, much as they were expecting. Deftly, Enlil, the sky chambers to be assembled, did command. In a sky chamber he went soaring. Alalgar, his chief lieutenant, was the pilot with him. Enki, in a sky chamber, by Abgal, piloted to them to the Abzu, showed the way. They surveyed the dry lands of the oceans, they took careful notice. From the upper sea to the lower sea, the lands they scanned. All above and below, they took account. In the Abzu, the soil they tested. Gold there was true, with much soil and rocks it was commixed. Refined as in the waters, it was not. In an admixture it was hiding. They went back to Endu. What they had found they contemplated. Eridu new tasks must be given. Alone on earth it cannot continue. Thus was Enlil saying. 
a grand plan he described, a comprehensive mission he was proposing, more heroes to bring over, more settlements to establish, the gold from Earth's innards to obtain, and the gold from the admixture to separate, by skyships and chariots to be carried from landing places for tasks to perform. Who of the settlements in charge will be, and who of the Abzu shall take command? Thus was Ea of Enlil asking. Who of enlarged Eridu shall take command, and who the settlements shall oversee? Thus was Alalu saying. Who of the skyships and the landing place shall take command? So did Anzu inquire. Let Anu come to earth, let him decisions provide. Thus did Enlil say in answer. Now this is the account of how Anu went to earth came. How lots with Enki and Enlil were drawn, how Enki, the title name Enki, was given, how Alalu for the second time with Anu wrestled. To earth in a celestial chariot made Anu's journey, the route by the planets it followed. Around Lamu, Nungal the pilot a circuit made, by Anu was studied. They circled and admired the moon, who Kingu once had been. Perchance gold thereon can also be found, in his heart Anu wondered. In the waters beside the marshlands his chariot splashed down. Enki, for the arrival, read boats prepared for Anu to arrive by sailing. Above the sky, chambers were hovering, a royal welcome they were offering. In the lead boat, Enki was afloat, the king, his father, the first to be greeting. Before Anu he bowed, then Anu embraced him. My son, my firstborn, Anu to him shouted. In the square of Eridu, in rows the heroes, their king to earth royally to welcome. In front of them stood Enlil their commander. Before Anu the king he bowed. Anu him to his chest embraced. Alalu too was there standing. Of what to do, he was uncertain. Anu to him a greeting extended. Let us lock arms as comrades, to Alalu he said. With hesitation, Alalu stepped forward with Anu. He locked arms. A meal for Anu was prepared. By eve time, a reed hut for him by Enki was built. Anu retired. The next day, the seventh, by the count begun by Enki, was a day of resting. A day of backslapping and celebrating it was, as befits a king's coming. On the day that followed, Enki and Enlil before Anu the findings presented. What was done and what was needed with him they discussed. Let me see the lands by myself, Anu to them was saying. Aloft they all in the sky chambers went, lands from sea to sea they observed. To the Abzu they flew, and on its gold hiding soil they landed. Complex will the gold's extraction be, Anu was saying. To obtain the gold it is necessary, no matter how deep the gold is below the surface, it must be gotten. Let Enki and Enlil tools for the purpose devise. Let them heroes for the task assigned. Let them find how gold from soil and rock separates, how Nibiru is pure gold to deliver. Let a landing place be built, and let more heroes to the tasks on earth be assigned. So was Anu to the two sons, saying, in his heart, of waystations in the heavens he was thinking. Those were the command words of Anu. Enki and Enlil, in agreement, their heads were bowing. There were evenings and mornings. To Eridu they all returned. In Eridu they held council, tasks and duties to assign. Enki, who Eridu established, was the first to speak up. Eridu have I established. Let other settlements in this region be set up. Let the Edin be, abode of the upright ones, by this name be known. The commander of the Edin let me be. Let Enlil the gold extraction perform. By these words Enlil was angered. The plan is wrongful, to Anu he said. Of commanding and tasks to perform, I am the better. Of skyships I have the knowledge. 
Of the earth and its secrets, my half-brother Enki is the knower. The Abzu he discovered, let him of the Abzu be the master. Anu listened to the angry words with a careful ear. The brothers were again half-brothers. The firstborn with the legal heir, with words as weapons, were contending. Enki was the firstborn son of a concubine to Anu. He was born. Enlil, after that born by Antu, Anu's spouse, was conceived. A half-sister of Anu, she was Enlil, the legal heir making the next-born son for the succession the first-born overcoming. A conflict that the obtainment of gold would endanger, Anu was fearing. One brother to Nibiru must return. The succession from considering must now be removed. So was Anu to himself thinking. Aloud to the two a startling suggestion he made. Who to Nibiru for the throne seat shall return? Who the Edin shall command? Who in the Abzu shall be the master? Let us three, I wish you by lots determined. Silent were the brothers. The audacious words by surprise them overtook. Let us draw lots, Anu said. By the hand of fate, let there be a decision. The three, father and two sons, clasped their hands together. They cast lots, and by the lots, the tasks they divided. Anu to Nibiru to return, its ruler on the throne to remain. The Edin to Enlil was allotted to be the lord of the command, as his name showed. More settlements to establish, of the skyships and their heroes charged to take. Of all the lands until the bar of the seas encounter, the leader is to be. To Enki, the seas and the oceans as his command were granted. Lands beyond the bar of the waters by him to be governed. In the Abzu, to be the master, with ingenuity, the gold to procure. Enlil with the lots was agreeable. The hand of fate he, with a bow, accepted. Enki's eyes filled with tears of Eridu and Edin. He wished not to be parted. Let Enki forever Eridu as his home keep, Anu to Enlil was saying. Let his being the first to splash down forever be remembered. Let Ea as Enkith's master be known. Enki, Enkith's master, let his title be. His father's words Enlil with a bow accepted. To his brother he thus said, Enki, Earth's master, your title name shall henceforth be. I, Lord of the Command, shall be known. The decisions were announced to the heroes in the assembly, Anu, Enki, and Enlil. The tasks are assigned, and success is in the offing, Anu to them was saying. Now I can bid you farewell, to Nibiru with a quiet heart I can return. Forward toward Anu, Alalu stepped. A grave matter has been forgotten, he shouted. The mastery of earth to me was allotted. That was the promise when the gold finds to Nibiru I announced. Nor have I the claim to Nibiru's throne forsaken. By Anu to share all with his sons, it is a grave abomination. Thus did Alalu Anu and the decision challenge. Without words was Anu in the beginning. Then with anger he spoke up. By second wrestling let our dispute be decided. Let us do the wrestling here. Let us do it now. With disdain Alalu took off his clothing. Likewise did Anu unrobe. In nakedness did the two royals grapple, a mighty struggle. Alalu bent his knee, and to the ground Alalu fell. Anu on the chest of Alalu, with his foot pressed down, victory in the wrestling declaring. By wrestling the decision was made. I am the king. To Nibiru Alalu shall not return. So was Anu saying as he removed his foot from the fallen Alalu. Up as lightning Alalu from the ground arose. By the legs Anu pulled down. His mouth was wide open, and swiftly he, the malehood of Anu, bit off. The malehood of Anu did Alalu swallow. In pained agony did Anu cry to the heavens, shout. To the ground, wounded, he fell. Enki to the fallen Anu rushed. Enlil the laughing, Alalu captive held. 
Heroes, Anu to his but carried, words of accusation against Alalu he uttered. Let justice be done. With your beam weapon, let Alalu be killed, Enlil to his lieutenant shouted. No, no, Enki fiercely shouted. Justice is within him. In his innards, poison has entered. They took Alalu to a reed hut, his hands and feet as a prisoner bound. Now this is the account of the judging of Alalu, and of the happenings after that on earth and on Lamu. In his reed hut, Anu was hurting. In the reed hut, to him, Enki applied the healing. In his reed hut, Alalu was sitting. Spittle he spat from his mouth. In his innards the malehood of Anu was like a burden. With Anu's semen were his innards impregnated. Like a female in travail, his belly grew swollen. On the third day Anu's pain subsided. His pride significantly hurt. To Nibiru I wish to return, to his two sons did Anu say. Beforehand, upon Alalu there must be a judgment. A sentence the crime befitting must be imposed. By the laws of Nibiru seven judges were required, the highest rank of them to preside. In the Eridu Square the heroes assembled the trial of Alalu to observe. Seven seats were provided for the seven who judge. For Anu presiding the tallest seat was prepared. To his right Enki was seated. Enlil was seated on Anu's left. On Enki's right, Anzu and Nungal were seated. Abgal and Alalgar to the left of Enlil sat. Before these seven who judge Alalu was brought, his hands and feet were untied. Enlil was first to speak. In fairness, a wrestling match was held, and Alalu, the kingship to Anu, forfeited. What say you, Alalu? Enki him this question asked. In fairness, the wrestling match was held, and I lost the kingship, Alalu said. Having been vanquished, Alalu, an abominable crime performed, the malehood of Anu he bit and swallowed. Thus did Enlil the accusation of the crime make. Death is the punishment, Enlil was saying. What say you, Alalu? Enki, his father by marriage, asked. There was silence. Alalu, the question did not answer. We all the crime did witness, Alalgar was saying. Judgment must be in accordance. If words you wish to utter, speak before the judging, Enki to Alalu said. In the silence, Alalu slowly spoke. On Nibiru I was king, by right of succession I was reigning. Anu was my cupbearer. The princes he aroused, to a wrestling he me challenged. For nine counted circuits I was king on Nibiru. To my seed kingship was belonging. On my throne seat Anu himself sat. To escape death to distant earth I made a dangerous journey. Salvation for Nibiru I, Alalu, on the alien planet discovered. Return to Nibiru I was promised. In fairness the throne to regain. Then to earth came Enki. The one by compromise the next to reign Nibiru he was designated. Then came Enlil, the succession from Anu to himself claiming. Then Anu came, and by lots he tricked Enki. Enki, the lord of earth, was proclaimed, of earth, not of Nibiru, to be the master. Then to Enlil the command was granted, and Enki to the distant Abzu was delegated. My heart of all that was aching, my chest from shame and anger was bursting. Then Anu, his foot upon my chest placed, upon my aching heart he was treading. In the silence Anu spoke up. By royal seed and law, by fair wrestling did I gain the throne. My malehood you bit off and swallowed, my offspring line to discontinue. Enlil spoke up. To the crime the accused admitted, let the judgment come. Let death the punishment be. Death, said Alalgar. Death, said Abgal. Death, said Nungal. Death to Alalu by itself will come. What he had swallowed in his innards death will bring, Enki was saying. 
Let Alalu be in prison for the rest of his days on earth. Anzu is speaking. Their words Anu was contemplating. Anger and pity both he engulfed. To die in exile, let this be the judgment, Anu was saying. In amazement, the judges at each other glanced. What Anu was saying, they wondered. Neither on earth nor on Nibiru shall the exiling be, Anu was saying. On the way there is the Lamu planet, with waters and an atmosphere it is endowed. Enki, as Enki thereon made a pause. Of it as a way station have I been thinking. Its net force is less than Earth's forceful, an advantage in wisdom to be considered. In the celestial chariot, Alalu shall be taken. On my departing from Earth, he with me shall make the journey. Around the planet Lamu we shall make circuits. To Alalu a sky chamber we shall provide. To the planet Lamu in it he will be descended. Alone on a strange planet an exile he shall be. His days to his last day by himself to count. Thus did Anu's words of judgment utter in solemnity were the words intended. By unanimity was this judgment upon Alalu imposed. In the presence of the heroes it was announced. Let Nungal be my pilot to Nibiru. From that place, chariots bearing heroes again to earth to pilot. Take charge, so did Anu's commandments utter. Let Anzu join us for the journey of the descent to Lamu. On the morrow departing was readied. All who depart by boats to the chariot were ferried. A place for landings on firm soil you must prepare, Anu to Enlil was saving. How Lamu is a waystation to use, plans you should make. Farewells there were, both joy and sorrow. Limping did Anu on the chariot embark, and with his hands tied did Alalu the chariot entered. Then the chariot soared to the heavens, and the royal visit ended. They around the moon made a circuit. Anu was enchanted by sight. Toward red-hued Lamu they journeyed. Twice about it they circled. Lower toward the strange planet they came, mountains sky high and tears on the surface they noticed. They observed where Enki's chariot had once landed. By a lakeside it was located. Slowed by Lamu net power, they readied in the chariot the sky chamber. Anzu, its pilot, then unexpected words to Anu. With Alalu to the firm soil of Lamu I shall descend. With the sky chamber to the chariot to return I wish not. I shall stay with Alalu on this strange planet. Until he dies I shall protect him. When he dies of his innards poison, as befits a king, him I shall bury. I shall have made my name. Anzu, they will say, against all odds, to a king in exile a companion was. He saw things by others unseen, on a strange planet he faced strange things. Anzu, they will to the end of time shall say, as a hero has fallen. There were tears in the eyes of Alalu, and amazement in the heart of Anu. Your wish shall be honoured, Anzu, Anu said. At this moment, let a promise by me to you be made. By my raised hand to you, I this swear. On the next journey, a chariot by Lamu shall circuit. Its skyship to you shall descend. If alive it shall find you, the master of Lamu, you shall be proclaimed. Anzu bowed his head. When a way station on Lamu shall be established, its commander you shall be. Okay then. To Anu he said. Into the sky chamber Alalu and Anzu were ushered. Eagles' helmets and fish suits provided them with food and tools. From the circling chariot the skyship departed. Its descent was observed from the chariot. Then from view it disappeared, and the chariot to Nibiru continued. For nine shahs was Alalu king on Nibiru. For eight shahs Eridu he commanded. In the ninth Shah, to die in exile on Lamu was his fate. Now, this is the account of the return of Anu to Nibiru, 
and how Alalu on Lamu was buried, how Enlil on earth the landing place built. On Nibiru there was for Anu a joyous welcome. Of what had happened to the council and the princes Anu gave account. Neither pity nor vengeance from them all he sought. To discuss the tasks ahead they all instructed. The Moorhen collection of Sumerian and Akkadian tablets in Liechtenstein preserves some of the most intriguing Enki and Enlil passages. George Moorhen, the original curator of a private museum, passed on most of his knowledge to his grandson Ryan, who is still deciphering information pieces. The MC2546A tablet in the Moorhen collection begins with clear allusions to Nibiru. The first four lines need to be included, and the following interpretation is Ryan's. Line 4 Way stations from Nibiru to Earth will unite the solar family into one kingdom. To figure out how to build stations on other worlds or the planets that orbit them, the first building will be on the moon to test the ideas. A string, an uninterrupted caravan of chariots to replenish and defend. The ongoing migration of gold from Earth to Nibiru may lead to the finding of gold elsewhere. The advisors, princes and geniuses thought about Anu's plan and saw that the designs they had agreed to study were Nibiru's only hope. The divine knowledge gained by geniuses and conquerors was perfected. Rocket ships joined the chariots and the airships. The heroes for the challenges were selected, and a great deal was learned about the assignments. Plans for Enki and Enlil were sent to Earth, and preparations were expedited. There was much debate on Earth about what had transpired and what needed to be done. Eridu, the overseer, assigned Enki Alalgar, and he went to the Abzu on his own initiative. Then he discovered where to find gold inside the planet's bowels. He assessed which heroes were essential for the operation and what equipment was needed. Enki requested the construction of a sophisticated earth splitter on Nibiru that he had devised. Also, the earth splits open and its insides travel through tubes he built to Nibiru where they are crushed and ground up to make the Abzu. He thought about what else the brilliant minds of Nibiru should examine. He described the health and wellness needs of heroes. The heroes found the rapid circuits on Earth to be unsettling. The planet's short day and night cycles created dizziness. Although the atmosphere was lovely, it needed improvement in some areas and was abundant in others, and the heroes grumbled about the monotony of the meals. The commander, Enlil, was suffering from the heat of the sun on Earth and craved refuge and cooling. In the Abzu Enki, arrangements were made. From his aircraft, Enlil was watching the vastness of Edin. He accounted for mountains and rivers and described the methods he used to account for valleys. He was looking for a place to land to figure out where the rocket ships were. Enlil, suffering from the sun's heat, searched for an excellent sheltered spot. The snow-covered mountains to the north of Edin captivated him. There, amid a cedar forest, he saw the tallest trees he had ever seen. Above a mountain valley, he leveled the land with energy beams. The heroes dug up the hillside and removed enormous stones. The skyships were carried and positioned such that they could support the platform. Enlil's efforts were adequate. It was a masterpiece, an edifice that would last forever. He intended to build a home on the pinnacle of the mountain. The tall trees in the cedar forest were transformed into long beams. For one of these projects, the building of his own home, he gave the following order. He designated it as the residence of the North Crest. A new flying heavenly chariot was created on Nibiru. Enki's design aimed to carry modern rocket ships and airships. It was carrying fifty fresh sets from Nibiru, including a chosen number of ladies. They learned how to help and heal while Ninma, the exalted lady, was in charge. 
Ninma was the daughter of Anu and the half-sister of Enki and Enlil. She was knowledgeable about comfort and healing and excelled at treating illnesses. She paid great attention to Earth's problems and prepared to heal. The Tablets of Destiny record the routes of preceding chariots which Nungal followed. It safely reached the deity of the sky, Lamu. It circled the globe and fell softly to the surface. Ninma escorted a group of heroes with strained smiles. They located Anzu on a beach. His helmet was sending signals. Anzu himself was still on the ground. He had died. Ninma stroked his face, and she focused on his heart. She extracted the pulse from her bag and targeted Anzu's pulse. She took the emitter out of her purse and put it on his body so that the crystal's energy would keep him alive. Every sixty times, Ninma directed the pulsar and emitter. When Anzu's eyelids opened for the sixty-second time, he moved his lips. Ninma poured the water of life with care over his lips, moisturizing them. She poured nutrition into his mouth with care. Then a miracle occurred. Anzu was raised from the dead. Anzu then told them about Alalu's passing when they inquired about it. He led them to a large rock on the plain that protruded into the sky. Alalu immediately screamed upon landing because of the tremendous agony. In agony, he vomited from his mouth and intestines and stared over the wall. He was, as Anzu claimed, recounting what had occurred. He led them to a gigantic mountainous rock rising from the plains to the sky. I found Alalu's corpse in an odd rock cavern. A stone wall covered the entrance to the building. Anzu's conduct was like theirs. They accompanied him to the rock, the removed stones, and the entrance to the cave. They found the skeletal remains of Alalu inside. The previous ruler of Nibiru was reduced to a pile of bones in a cave. For the first time in recorded history, a monarch died outside of Nibiru and was buried there. So did Ninma say. She shouted, May he rest eternally in peace, reopening the entrance to the cave by covering it with stones. Alalu's face was not obscured by the eagle's headdress on the enormous beam-carved granite mountain. Let Alalu's portrait always face Nibiru, the planet he ruled. He was on his way to earth when he discovered gold. Thus Ninma, the eminent lady, introduced herself by her father's name, Anu. Anu, the king, will honor his word to you, Anzu. Twenty heroes will stay with you to pave the path for the station's building, while rocket ships will carry gold ores from Earth. The gold will be transferred from this location to Nibiru by heavenly chariots. Thousands of heroes will call Labu home. Anzu, you must be their captain. This is how the great lady addressed Anu, Anzu's father. I owe you my life, wonderful woman. My appreciation for Anu is limitless. What exactly was Anzu's statement? The chariot left the planet Lamu and began its journey toward the planet Earth. An overview of Morhen Collection Tablet MC2546A Ninma arrives on Earth with a group of nurses. She provides seeds for elixir-producing plants. She notifies Enlil about Ninurta, their illegitimate son. Enki builds a home and mine areas in the Abzu. Enlil builds spaceships and other facilities in the Edin, and there are 600 Nibi ruins, also known as Anunnaki, on Earth. 300 Igigi run the facilities in Lamu, Mars. Enlil finds the secret weapons after being deported for abusing Sud. Sud marries Enlil. Ninlil has a son, Nana. Ninma joins Enki in the Abzu and bears his daughters. Ninki, Enki's wife, comes to earth with their son, Marduk, and when Enki and Enlil have other sons, the Marduk clans appear on earth. 
When bad things happen to the Igigi, they plan a coup against Enlil Ninurta and beat their commander, Ansu, in an air battle. Anunnaki rebelled at manufacturing gold more rapidly. Enlil and Ninurta condemned the rebels. Enki suggests artificially developing primitive workers. The Akkadian version of the MC2546A tablet. The chariot left the planet Lamu and began its journey toward the planet Earth. As way stations for exploration, they erected circuits around the moon. They performed circuits around the Earth to prepare for a soft landing. At Eridu, Nungal's chariot crashed into the sea. They disembarked on a pier that Enlil had constructed. Boats were no longer necessary. The current heroes applauded the arrival of the male and female heroes. They held hands. Enlil and Enki, their sisters, extend a hug to Nungal. Everything delivered by the chariot was unloaded promptly. Enki invented rocket ships, spaceships, and several types of food. Her brothers told her of all the events on Nibiru, including Alalu's death and burial. She described the root station under the control of Lamu and Anzu. Enki displayed approval, whereas Enlil displayed confusion. This is Anu's choice, and his word is final. Ninma was speaking to Enlil. Ninma complimented her brothers for treating their illnesses. She withdrew a package of seeds from her pocket and planted them in the ground, from which several fruit-bearing plants would emerge. Juice and elixir will develop, and intake by the heroes will be modest. It will heal their illnesses and enhance their mood. The seeds must be planted in a soothing, warm environment, and the water must be nurtured. Similarly, Ninma, as per her siblings. I will have you show me the location, since it is ideal for this, Enlil addressed her. It is where the landing spot was built, and where I built my cedarwood house. Enlil and Ninma took flight on Enlil's airship. In the snow-covered, cedar-forested hills, brother and sister journeyed to the landing place. They walked to Enlil's home after landing on the upper stone platform. Enlil welcomed Ninma and passionately kissed her once she was inside. I will deliver you our son, Ninurta's letter, Ninma spoke softly to him. A young prince eagerly expects a trip. He is eager to join you on earth. He is orderly. Permit us to bring our kid, Ninurta, if you want to remain, Enlil addressed her. The heroes arrived at the landing site in rocket ships via platform carrying skyships. The seeds were removed from Ninmar's bag and placed in the valley's soil. Nibiru fruit cultivation on Earth. Enlil and Ninmar returned by airship to Eridu. On way to her, the landscape revealed Edin's closeness to her, and when Enlil neared her from above, he revealed his intentions. I have devised a strategy with no limits. He addressed her with these words. I have defined the defining characteristics of a structure for all time. My home will be located outside Eridu, where the dry land starts. It will be called Lhasa and serve as a vantage point for directing it. It will be on the banks of the Buranu, the river of deep waters, and its final counterpart will be Lagash. The border between the two plans has been determined. After sixty leagues, a city of healing will be established. It will be your city, and I will call it Shurubak, the city of refuge. It will lead to the fourth city along the center line. I shall call it Nibruki, the crossroads of the earth, and establish a link between heaven and earth. The tablets of destiny will include every assignment. Five cities will always be close to Eridu. The overall plan was portrayed on a crystal tablet that Enlil presented to Ninma. Beyond the five cities, I will create a chariot place that will transport me straight from Nibiru to Earth. She questioned the tablet's extra Enlil marks. Enlil was replying to her.
Ninma initially misunderstood Anu's ideas for Lamu Enlil, which she ultimately came to comprehend. Your proposal for the five cities is unique, sister, Ninma was saying. The building of the city of healing, Shurubak, is my home. I am grateful for this scenario. Do not breach your father's or brother's limits and avoid causing offence. You are both intelligent and attractive, Enlil addressed her. In his drawings, Abzu Enki also established the location of his future residence, where heroes will build their homes and where the earth's interior will penetrate. Its districts, which he meticulously sketched out in his airship, defined the Abzu's size. Beyond the waters of the Edin lay a remote area known as the Abzu. It was remote. It was a thriving country brimming with money. Enki established his home next to the quickly moving water as great rivers rushed over the land and lovely streams flowed. Enki journeyed to the middle of Abzu where clean rivers were. Enki, the Lord of Depth, commanded the heroes to descend into the planet's interior. The earth's sputter also produced a fissure through which tunnels might be excavated to reach the planet's interior and locate its veins of gold. The gold-bearing ore must be crushed and processed using airships. To be transported to the landing site in the Cedar Mountains, he placed that which crushes and that which crushes next to one another. Then rocket ships will transport you to the way station in Lamu. Some heroes were sent to the Edin when they got to Earth, while others were sent to the Abzu. Enlil built Lhasa and Lagash for Ninma and formed Shurubak. A swarm of young female healers who provided aid was all around her. A heaven-earth bond was gathering missions for leadership in Nibru Ki, Enlil. Enki went between Eridu and Abzu for supervision. On Lamu, the construction progressed as the waystation heroes arrived. Anu talked after preparing a shah and two shahs. At the beginning of time, Enki designated the seventh day on earth as a day of rest. At each place where the heroes got together, they heard a message from Anu on Nibiru. They had assembled at Edin with Enlil in command. He was joined by Ninma, who was surrounded by a swarm of young people. Alalgar, master of Eridu, and Abgal, a landing site controller, were present. The heroes, Enki's vizier Isimud and the ship's pilot Nungal, met in the Abzu under Enki's watch. The heroes gathered on Lamu, led by their valiant leader Anzu. There were six hundred individuals on Earth and three hundred on Lamu. They heard the words of Anu, the king, who said, You are the heroes of Nibiru. Everything depends on you. Your achievements will be memorialized, and your name will be renowned. The inhabitants of earth will be known as Anunnaki, the offspring of the heavens. On Lamu, Igigi will be given a name, as will everyone who witnesses. Let the gold begin to flow and save Nibiru. This is the narrative of Enki, Enlil, and Ninma, their affection and support, along with their son's rivalry. The three leaders descended from Anu and had separate mothers. Enki was the eldest son. His mother was Anu's concubine. Enlil, the husband of Anu, was born and became the legitimate successor. Ninma is the half-sibling of her two half-brothers because a second concubine reared her. According to her name title, Ninma, she was the eldest daughter of Anu. She was beautiful, intelligent, and a far student. This was established. Enki was then named, and Anu selected Ea as Ninma's spouse. So their son, who would grow up as the brave commander Ninma of Enlil, fell in love. She gave birth to Ninurta from Enlil, whom she and Enlil named. The act enraged Anu, so he forbade Ninma from ever marrying again. The edict of Anu forbade his marriage to Ea. Instead, he married Princess Damkina. 
They had a son called Marduk, meaning one born in a pure pace. Enlil had neither a biological son nor a spouse. Enlil began promoting Earth over Nibiru. Earth was experiencing summer, and Enlil withdrew to his cedar woodland abode. Enlil was wandering through the tranquil cedar woodland throughout the day. Some of Ninmar's youngsters were cooling down in a mountain stream. Under her elegance and beauty, her name was Sud, and Enlil was captivated. Enlil has extended an invitation to his cedarwood home. Come, enjoy with me the elixir of Nibiru's fruit growing here. Sud entered Enlil's home and presented her with a cup of elixir. Consequently, he concluded. Sud drank. Enlil drank as well. Enlil talked to her. The immoral behavior was reported to Ninmar, the commander of Sud. Enlil, you are unethical. You shall bear responsibility for your acts. Thus Ninmar growled at Enlil. In the presence of fifty Anunnaki, the seven who judged assembled. Seven judges have determined the penalty for Enlil. Enlil should be banished from every city to the land of no return. He needs to be expelled. Enlil was sent to the land of no return, from whence he could never return. They forced Enlil, whose pilot was Obgal, into a chamber in the sky to abandon its landing place. They flew to a foreign land through the sky chamber. Abgal's sky chamber landed in a deserted area among intimidating mountains. This shall constitute your banishment. Abgal was chatting with Enlil. I was not chosen by chance. He addressed Enlil, saying, Enki's seven weapons of terror have been secreted in a nearby cave, concealing a hidden secret. He had them removed from Alalu's celestial chariot. Take possession of the guns. Your emancipation is yours with the weapons. Enki confessed his secret to Enlil. Abgal then departed from the concealed spot, leaving Enlil behind. Ninmar, her commander, was speaking on the Edin Sud. Ninmar Sud made the following remarks to Enki. He was the Lord of Earth. He ruled supreme on Earth. When Sud stood before the Judge Seven, he was asked whether he would accept Enlil as his husband. She discussed permission and communicated Abgal's comments to Enlil in exile. Enki and Ninmar let Enlil go free when he returned from exile to argue for Sud. The title Ninlil, Lady of the Command, was bestowed to Sud. The ceremonial spouse of Enlil was authorized. Ninlil and Enlil gave birth to the first Anunnaki on earth. Ninlil called him Nana, the Bright One. One of Nibiru's royal seeds will be born in a faraway universe. Enki contacted Ninmar requesting, Come along with me to the Abzu. A home has been constructed near the Abzu with pristine springs. It is decorated with silver and deep blue gemstone lapis lazuli. Ninmar then travelled to the Abzu, Enki's palace, where Enki was, and heard her declarations of love. He whispered to say something kind to her, and then commanded, Caress her. Enki pleaded, Give me a son, please give me a son. He shrieked, for her, one day on Nibiru was equal to one month on earth. On Nibiru, two, three, and four days equated to months on earth, while five, six, seven, and eight months had passed. The ninth count of motherhood was complete. Ninmar gave birth to a girl child while in labor. On the banks of the Abzu, the daughter of Enki and Ninmar was born. Enki, a daughter, was dissatisfied, and Ninmar informed her of this. Enki asked his vizier Isimud for a son, saying, This time she was pregnant with Enki's daughter. After Enki yelled, Ninmar cursed Enki. Whatever he ate or drank poisoned his organs, hurting his jaw, teeth, and ribs. Isimud called Ninmar to gain the relief they were seeking. 
Enki's illnesses were cured one by one, and in the end he was freed from the curse. After Enki, Domkina, and their mother Ninma returned to Edin unmarried, Enki, Domkina, and their son Marduk were called to Earth. Ninki has been conferred the title of Lady of Earth. Through her and his concubines, Enki had five more sons. Their names were Nergal and Gibil, Ninogal and Ningishida, and Damuzi the youngest. Enlil and Ninma sent their son Ninurta to earth. Enlil and Ninlil had one more son, Ishkur, who was Nana's full brother. There were two tribes on earth due to Enlil having three sons, none of whom were the product of concubines. This led to conflicts between the two tribes. This is a description of the Ikiki uprising. Anzu was executed for the theft of the Tablets of Destiny. Lamu arrived at the precious metal Nibiru via the planet's heavenly chariots. On Nibiru, the finest dust made to preserve the ecosystem was gold. It was exploited. As the rift in the sky gradually closed, Nibiru was saved, and the five cities of Edina were built. Enki built a shining home in Eridu, raising it to the heavens, elevating it like a mountain, and placing it in a good location. Domkina, where his wife lived, was where they taught their knowledge to his son, Marduk Enki. Nibru Ki, Enlil, constructed the bridge between heaven and earth. A tall, skyward facing pillar was put in the middle of the platform to keep it from falling over. Each and every hamlet on Lamu and Nibiru also heard Enlil's words. From there, beams were sent to the center of all the explorable regions. The creature's eyes could scan them, making its netted approach impossible. A room like a crown stood in the center of the imposing mansion, gazing toward the far skies. It was fixated on the horizon, on the cosmic summit it had attained. The Sun family dwelt in a dark, hallowed room marked with twelve emblems. The Sun and Moon's, Nibiru's, and Earth's secret formulae were inscribed on the M.E.s. There were eight gods of the skies recorded. Enlil used the Tablets of Fate, which gave off colours inside the room and kept track of who came and went. On Earth, the Anunnaki worked for jobs and sustenance while complaining. Due to the rapid cycles of the Earth, the elixir displeased them, and only small amounts were delivered. Anunnaki teams were sent back to Nibiru, and new ones came. In the Edin, the Anunnaki worked, but in the Abzu, the job was more difficult. On Lamu, the Agigi were the most outspoken in their criticisms. They descended from Lamu to a designated resting site on Earth. Enlil and Enki spoke with Anu. Anu ordered the leader to meet with Anzu on Earth for discussions. Anzu sent Enlil protesting words from above, and Enki delivered them. Permit Anzu to understand how things function. Enlil approved Enki's statements. Enki to Anzu The Abzu exhibited and demonstrated to him the mining work. Nibru Ki greeted Enlil Anzu and granted him access to the hallowed black chamber. In the most profound sanctuary, he delivered to Anzu the Tablets of Destinies, and disclosed what the Anunnaki had done to him in the five cities. Before returning to the landing site, he proceeded to Nibru Ki to address Ikigi's issues. Anzu was a prince among princes with royal blood. When he returned to the link between heaven and earth, he was overcome by bad ideas. He thought about snatching the Tablets of Destiny. He wanted the divine and natural commands to rule his heart. His goal was to destroy the Enlil Empire, which he envisioned ruling over the Igigi and the Anunnaki. Anzu stationed herself outside the entrance to the sanctuary, unaware of Enlil's departure for a swim. Anzu stole the Tablets of Destiny intentionally. He went up in a sky chamber and soon reached the mountain of sky chambers 
where a defiant Igiki was waiting for him. They intended to crown Anzu as ruler of both Earth and Lamu. At the Nibru Ki shrine, the light went out, the buzzing stopped, and silence took over. The holy formulas stopped. The treachery left Enlil speechless at Nibru Ki. Enki questioned him with poisonous comments about Anzu's heritage. The chiefs gathered in Nibru Ki while the Anunnaki who decided fates with Anu conferred. Anu proclaimed that Anzu must be apprehended, and the temple's tablets must be restored. Who will the rebels confront, and to whom must the tablets be returned? They said, Anzu is invincible with the tablets of destiny in his grasp. Ninurta advanced after receiving encouragement from his mother. I will be the warrior of Enlil and the slayer of Anzu. So then, this is what Ninurta said. Ninurta climbed a mountain to find Anzu, who had gotten away from him and for whom he was responsible. The medicines act as my protection. I am immune. Anzu insulted him while he was hiding. Ninurta fired arrows of lightning at Anzu, but the arrows could not close the distance, and he fled. The fight was called off since one of Ninurta's weapons, Anzu, was still alive. Enki then counseled Ninurta, Create a storm with your whirlwind. Let dust cover Anzu's face and his bird of the sky flap its wings. He built the powerful Tilu missile for his son, Enlil. Enlil commanded his son Ninurta to attach the missile to his stormer weapon and fire it at Anzu when their wings were nearby. When the wingtips of the rocket collide, they will take off like lightning. Ninurta once again piloted his whirlwind while Anzu mounted his skybird to fight him. Anzu roared in wrath, Wing to wing, this conflict is going to be your undoing. Ninurta took Enki's advice and used his whirlwind to make a dust storm. Anzu's face was covered in dust, and his skybird could be seen. Ninurta fired the missile into their midst, enclosing Anzu's wings in a brilliant blaze of light. Anzu fell to the ground as his wings started to flap like butterfly wings. The earth shook, and the sky turned black. As the Igigi watched from the top of the mountain, the falling Anzu Ninurta grabbed the tablets he had found and gave them to him. They trembled and worshipped his feet at Ninurta's landing site appearance. Ninurta took Abgal and the Anunnaki captive and gave them to Anu and Enlil, letting them know they had won. Then he returned to Nibru Ki, where the tablets were deposited in the lowest room, and the MEs had regained their brightness and hum. An evaluation of Anzu was done in front of the seven. His wives were Enlil, Ninlil, Enki and Ninki, known initially as Damkina. Also present were the sons Nana and Marduk, with Ninmar functioning as a judge. Ninurta declared on harmful acts, There was no justification. Let the penalty be death. As Marduk said, the Igigi has every reason to complain about the absence of an appropriate burial place on earth. Enlil claimed that all Anunnaki and Igigi Anzu were in peril due to this horrible act. Enki and Ninmar concurred with Enlil, declaring that evil must be destroyed. Seven judges passed the death sentence on Anzu. Let vultures eat his corpse, Ninurta said. Allow the vultures to devour his corpse, Ninurta remarked. A deadly ray destroyed Anzu's life. Lamu should be buried in a cave close to Alalu, Enki was saying. Both were descended from the same ancestor. Let Marduk give the corpse to Lamu for transfer and allow Marduk to retain his position as commander. Enki replied similarly to the judge's suggestion. Let it so be, Enlil stated. This is the history of Bad Tibira, the metal city, 
and the 42nd Shah rebellion of the Anunnaki in the Abzu. Shah was found guilty and killed by Anzu on the 25th. The Igigi revolt was put down, but it kept getting worse. The souls of the Igigi were given to Lamu Marduk to raise, pay great attention to their well-being. Enlil and Enki contemplated various alterations to avert unrest on the planet. They bemoaned that their stays on earth were too long. They sought Ninma's advice, but her sudden change in appearance alarmed them. Accelerate the delivery of gold to Nibiru and the supply of salvation, everyone agreed. Ninurta discovered this in the guts of worlds. He was responding to the sage advice of his elder. Let a city of metal be built where gold ores may be smelted and purified. From there, lighter earthly objects will be hoisted. Each rocket ship delivering more wealth will facilitate the return of the Anunnaki to Nibiru. Allow the elderly to migrate to Nibiru and be replaced on earth by the young. Dinurta's Enlil, Enki, and Ninma endorsed the concept. Anu was contacted and approved. Enlil pushed for the development of Edin's metal city. Utilization of Nibiru resources and Nibiru made tools in building constructions. The duration of the Bad Tibira construction was three shahs. The idea's originator, Ninurta, acted as the unit's initial commander. Therefore, the transport of gold to Nibiru was easier and faster. At the beginning of the last times before Nibiru, Alalgar, Abgal and Nungal were among those who returned to Earth and Lamu. Their successors were younger and more zealous. They needed to get acquainted with Earth's and Lamu's cycles and other requirements. On Nibiru, their planet of origin, the atmospheric rupture was repaired. Younger generations were oblivious to catastrophic planetary and cosmic events. Their special mission was highly treasured for its excitement. In conjunction with Ninurta's pregnancy, the Abzu ore was delivered. Heavenly chariots brought pure gold from Lamu to Nibiru. As Ninurta conceived, Abzu's riches began to flow to Nibiru. The Anunnaki, the immigrants who worked in the Abzu experienced unexpected upheaval. Enki was oblivious to the coming peril. In the Abzu, he was preoccupied with other matters. Abzu's curiosity develops as he grows and lives. The differences between Earth and Nibiru intrigued him. He wanted to identify the sources of the issues with the Earth's atmosphere and cycles. In the Abzu, Beside the rushing streams, he constructed an excellent study site. He supplied them with a variety of tools and supplies. He named the location House of Life and asked his son Ningish Zida to live there. They attempted to interpret sacred codes, tiny MEs, the secrets of life and death, and the mysteries of Earth's living and dying species. Some forms of life especially captivated Enki. They lived in deep forests and used their forelegs as hands. In the tall grasses of the steppe, odd, erect-appearing creatures were sighted. Enki was so absorbed in his studies that he was unconscious of Anunnaki's activities. Ninurta was the first to identify a problem. He saw a reduction in gold ore output at Bad Tibira. Enlil commanded Ninurta to study the unknown in the Abzu. Enugi, the chief officer, followed him to the excavations, where he personally heard Anunnaki's complaints. In the excavations, there was backbiting, lamenting, and moaning. The work is unbearable, they declared to Ninurta. I informed Ninurta's uncle Eric about this. Let us go, Enlil. Let's unsettle Enlil at home, Enki said. Enlil in the Abzu arrived at a home near the excavation site where he was stationed. Heroes working in mines yelled, Let him relieve us of the laborious task. Others yelled, Let us declare war. 
let us find respite via warfare, which the Anunnaki heard during the excavations. They set fire to the tools in addition to the axes. They befuddled Enugi, chief engineer of the mining, and imprisoned him in the tunnels they captured until they arrived at Enlil's door. It was the middle of the nighttime watch. They held their tools as torches as they encircled Enlil's house. Nusku awakened as Kalkal, the guardian of the doorway, secured the entrance and locked it. Nusku, Enlil's vizier, roused his master with the command, Get up, and pulled him from bed. The house is surrounded, and the Anunnaki are battling their way to the front door. Enlil called Enki, who afterwards summoned Enlil Ninurta. Enlil questioned them, Who is the originator of hostilities? Is this my fault? What can my eyes detect? The Anunnaki stood unified and said, We have all declared war. The job is arduous, the burden is heavy, and the agony is intense. Thus they sought clarification from Enlil. Enlil sent Anu information about what had transpired. What is Enlil accused of? Anu inquired. Not Eli, but his work could be better. Enki was rescuing Anu. The sobbing is severe, and everyday complaints can be heard. It is necessary to collect gold, Anu was saying. The job must continue. Enable consultation with Enugi. Enlil addressed these words to the angry Anunnaki. Enugi was freed, and his statement to the leaders was as follows. Since the planet's temperature has risen, work has become insufferable and dreadful. Let the Nibiru rebels return, and let new ones replace them, Ninurta said. Enlil talked to Enki. Which tunnels should the Anunnaki warriors avoid? Could they develop new tools? Let us invite my son, Ningish Zida, whose counsel I want to get. So Enki responded. The summoning of Ningish Zida from the House of Life. Enki cuddled with him as they exchanged pleasantries after his arrival. Solutions are possible, Enki was saying. Create a Lulu, a primitive labourer, to do the problematic chores. Let them experience the Anunnaki's toil. The leaders captured were astonished and mute. Whoever heard of a freshly made creature capable of doing the Anunnaki's labour? They sought Ninma, who was famed for her healing and assisting abilities. The challenge is unprecedented, she Enki said. Over the eons all living things evolved from seeds, but none from nothing. How precise you are, sis, Enki said, smiling. Permit me to reveal a secret about Abzu. The required entity already exists. All that is necessary is to impart our soul to it. Enki told them to make a choice right now. Favorable to my aims are construct a primitive worker from our very essence. Consequently, Lulu, an indispensable worker, will be born. The Account of the Enki Leadership Tablet Enki reveals a secret to the leadership's lack of conviction. A species comparable to the Anunnaki roams free in the Abzu. Through the combination of its energy with that of the Anunnaki, it may be upgraded to an intelligent rudimentary worker. Enlil exclaimed, Creation belongs to the father of all beginnings. Ninma said, We will only offer our resemblance to a live being. Desperate for cash, the chiefs vote yes. Enki, Ninma and Ningish Zida, Enki's son, undertake experiments. After several failures, Adam achieves perfection. Ninma exclaims jubilantly, my hands have triumphed. As hybrids, humans are unable to reproduce. Ningish Zida adds two important branches to their life tree. Ninki, the spouse of Enki, helps in the creation of Ti Amat, a female earthling. She is referred to as Ninti, Lady of Life, because of her achievements. Enlil expels humans after discovering their participation in illegal activities. 
The Enki Leadership Tablet To construct a primitive worker from our very essence, Enki then reacted to the words of the leaders. The required entity already exists. This is how Enki shared the secrets of Abzu. When the other leaders heard Enki's remarks, they were awestruck and captivated. Enki said that there are bipedal beings in the Abzu. Their forelegs act as arms, and they have hands. They dwell among the fauna of the steppe. They are conscious that they should not wear clothes. They ingest plants via their lips, drink lake water, and dig ditches. The whole of their body is covered in hair, and their head resembles a lion's. With gazelles they tussle, and with a profusion of aquatic life they find enjoyment. The chiefs listen to Enki's remarks with astonishment. Edinburgh has never before witnessed something like that, Enlil disbelieving said. On Nibiru, our forefathers may have resembled this millennia ago, Ninmar was saying. It is a being, not a thing. Ninmar was saying, Indeed, that must be thrilling. Enki led them to the house of life where some creatures were held in solid cages. The cage-beating monsters jumped up and put their fists on the cage bars upon seeing Enki and the others. No words were said, just grunts and snorts were audible. Men and women indeed. Enki explained that they are procreating due to the male genitalia and lies they have gotten from Nibiru, just as we have. My son, Ningish Zida's fashioning essence has been evaluated. It is comparable to ours. Our serpents are entwined. When they are with us, their life essences will be merged with ours, and they will wear the inscription, A primitive worker will be created. He will comprehend our directions. He will be in charge of our tools and the work in the digs, which will be a relief for the Anunnaki in Abzu. Enki talked too much with enthusiasm. His remarks were filled with zeal. Enlil stopped speaking at the phrase, This is a somber topic. In our civilization, slavery has been eradicated for a very long time. The enslaved people are the tools. You seek to create a new monster that did not previously exist. Only the father of all beginnings has creative power. Enlil was as determined in his opposition to me. Enki told his brother, My goal is not to enslave people, but to assist them. Ninmar was saying, This creature already exists. The purpose is to enhance competence. Not a completely novel species, but one created in our image, Enki said convincingly. It can be done with minimum effort. A drop of our essence is necessary. It is a serious topic that I despise, Enlil was saying. Contravening planet-to-planet -planet travel laws is against the rules for accessing the planet. Our purpose was to get riches, not to replace the father of all beginnings. Ninmar was the one who responded after Enlil's statement. Indeed, my sibling, Ninmar was conversing with Enlil. The father of all beginnings has given us knowledge and understanding. Why were we made, and what would be the best use of this? The creator of all of our life essence has exceptional insight and understanding. It's not true that we were supposed to do everything possible with it. Similar remarks were made by Ninmar to her brother Enlil. What was granted to our essence, tools and chariots has been mastered. We destroyed mountains with terror weapons, but we're now reconstructing the sky with wealth. Ninurta agreed to his birth mother's statement. Let us produce new tools with intelligence, not more beings. Let new technology make work easier, not more enslaved people. We are committed to going wherever our understanding takes us. Consequently, Ningish Zida agreed with Enki and Ninma. The use of the information we acquire is inevitable, Ningish Zida was saying. Destiny is fixed. It was predestined from start to finish. This is what Enlil told them, as stated. It is either fate or destiny.
the contribution of oceanic gold to our world. What should a primitive worker consider while assigning Anunnaki warriors to dig? This, my dear family, is the issue. At the moment, Enlil was delivering a solemn speech. Is it destiny or fate? This must be determined precisely. Is it predetermined from the start, or do we have a choice? They decided to bring the matter to Anu's attention in front of the council. There were consultations with the elders, savants, and commanders. The discussions of life and death, fate and destiny, were lengthy and heated. Can the gold be acquired by other means? Existence is in peril. The council made a decision. If gold must be gained, then build the beast. Allow Anu to disregard the laws of interstellar travel. Rescue Nibiru. Anu's palace transmitted the decision to create Earth. Enki was thrilled. Let Ninma, my helper, be as intelligent as she is. So then, this is what Enki said. He was observing Ninma closely. Let it so be. Ninma was conserved. Let it be, Enlil did say. Enugi announced the option to the Anunnaki in the Abzu. You must labor with joy until the being is reached. However, there was no rebellion. The Anunnaki returned to their task. The Abzu, or House of Life, described Enki's transformation into Ninma. Ninma indicated a place surrounded by trees and enclosed by a fence. Ninma Enki was formed by combining the essence of two separate entities. In the cages were strange, never-before-seen wild creatures. They had the forelimbs of one sort of creature and the hind limbs of another. They accompanied her back to the clean and bright house of life. In Ningish Zida, Ninma learned the secrets of preserving life. He demonstrated how merging two distinct kinds may alter their essence. The caged animals in the woods are too strange. They are horrifying, Ninma was saying. Quite so, Enki responded. You must strive for perfection. How do the essences interact, and how should they be blended? Where does conception take place, and where should the infant be born? This requires your comfort and therapeutic understanding. It is crucial to acknowledge that a mother is a woman who has given birth. Ninma was happy, and her two children with Enki are fondly remembered. Together with Ningish Zida, she investigated the secret holy formulae for M.E.s, questioning how different things were carried out for him. She examined the animals in the tree cages and contemplated the bipedal creatures. The essence is transmitted when a male sperm fertilizes a female egg. Two knotted threads detangle and combine to form a garment. Let a male Anunnaki and a two-legged female conceive. Let a hybrid child be born. This was brought up by Ninth. Our efforts have been fruitless, Enki responded. Neither conception nor delivery occurred. This is the history of the genesis of the first workers. Enki and Ninma created the creature with the aid of Ningish Zida. Ninma remarked that another approach for blending essences must be tried. The two essence threads must be joined differently. The element originating from the earth must not be harmed. For our essence to mature, it must be shaped. Formulations of Nibiru's essence were only possible in minute amounts. Ninma created a combination in a crystal vase and carefully placed a feminine oval with two legs. She inserted an Anunnaki seed in the oval. She inserted the oval object into the uterus of the female with two legs. This time, fertilization occurred. There would be a baby. Throughout the specified duration for birthing, the leaders eagerly awaited the outcomes. At the appointed hour, there was no birth. Ninma invented a cutting technique with tongs that she sketched out of despair. It was a living thing. 
Enki shouted with delight. We did well, Ningish Zida exclaimed, filled with delight. Ninma excitedly clutched the newborn in her hands. The baby was dressed in hair and had front legs like those of animals that live on the ground and back legs like those of the Anunnaki. They enabled the newborn's nurse, a female with two legs, to breastfeed him. What was the day like on Nibiru, and what was the Apsu month? The newborns proliferated. In depictions of the Anunnaki, the earth kid was shown as being shorter than he eventually developed. His hands were not suited for using tools, and he could only groan. We must try again, Ninma was saying. The combination has to be adjusted. Let me do the ME's test with this or that ME exerting effort. They repeated the operations with the aid of Enki and Ningish Zida. The essences of the ME's Ninma were carefully analyzed. She took a portion from one individual and another. Then she inseminated in the crystal bowl inside the feminine Earth's oval. There was the conception, then the birth at the proper time. This being, who more closely resembled the Anunnaki, was. They let his biological mother nurse him, and he grew. His hands were meant to grasp tools, and he looked attractive. His senses were examined and found to be deficient. The Earth Kid has hearing and visual impairments. Ninma altered the components of the ME formulas many times. She ate in moderation. One individual had trembling hands, while the other had a malfunctioning liver. One's hands were too short for reaching the mouth, while the other's lungs were insufficient for breathing. Enki was disappointed with the outcome. It is difficult to become a Stone Age laborer. Through adversity, I discovered what is excellent and lacking in this life. He was conversing with Ninma. Ninma responded to Enki's inquiry, My soul urges me to chase success. Again, an addition made the infant insufficient. The insufficiency might be external to the combination. Enki was speaking to her. The barrier may not be the female's oval, but rather its essence. This is what the present status of the globe needs to improve. Nibiru's crystals are not created in the Earth's clay receptacle. Ninma felt that Enki had a great deal of knowledge. A mixture of local gold and copper may be necessary. Therefore, Enki, who was knowledgeable, advised her to use Abzu clay. Ninma created a container out of Abzu's clay in the House of Life. She formed the vessel inside the liquid to make a cleansing bath. She delicately poured the blood of the Anunnaki into the clay jar, which was shaped like a woman with two legs. She was captured and positioned on the vessel. The essence was gradually guided by the ME formulae. You added it to the vessel, correct? The oval that had fertilized the earth's female womb was implanted. There is an expectant mother, Ninma joyfully disclosed the expected date of delivery. At the allotted time, the female earth started labor. A child was on the way. Ninma painstakingly recovered the male newborn. She had the perfect picture of the youngster whose image she was examining. She was holding the child. Enki and Ningish Zida were present. Three commanders were captured while laughing jubilantly. While Ninma and Enki hugged and kissed, Enki and Ningish Zida exchanged backslaps. Your efforts have been rewarded, Enki spoke with a twinkle in his eye. They let the newborn nurse, and he grew faster than a Nibiruan child. With each passing month, the newborn developed into a toddler. His limbs were sufficient for the task but he could not communicate. His only vocalizations were grunts and snorts. Enki considered what was accomplished in each step and pondered mixing. Despite our attempts and alterations, one component was never updated. He was chatting with Ninma, saying, This may be the last remaining obstacle. 
So then, this is what Enki said. Ninma was confused at the arrival of Enki. What exactly are you saying? She demands clarification from him. I am referring to the placenta, Enki was answering her, who is nurtured and produced by the fertilized oval. In our image and likeness, an Anunnaki womb would be required. Enki heard words he had never heard before as the house of life became quiet. They exchanged glances, each unsure of the other's thoughts. Ninma eventually said, Where is the female Anunnaki with her womb to provide if the correct admixture was put into the incorrect womb? She may be the ideal primitive worker for carrying a monster in her stomach. So was Ninma, who spoke with a trembling voice. Let me tell my wife, Ninki, about your inquiry, Enki was saying. Let's summon the matter to the house of life before she lays it out. Ninma placed her hand on his shoulder as he prepared to go. No, no, Enki, she cried out. Since I combined the components, the reward and the risk should be mine. I shall be the progenitor of the good or evil destiny of the Anunnaki. Thus then, Enki dropped his head and gently hugged her. He informed her. The mixture they generated was confined to the clay cup. The essence of masculine Anunnaki fills the oval of a female earth. How long will the pregnancy last if there is admixture present? They engaged in mutual inquiry. Are there nine Nibiru months or nine earth months? Ninma's labor on earth lasted longer than on Nibiru, and she delivered a son. Enki grasped it in his hands. It was a carbon copy of himself. He slapped the newborn in the rear end, and the infant began to make cheerful sounds. The newborn was handed to Ninma, who held him in her arms. My hands have been successful, she roared in triumph. This is the tale of how I got my name, Adamu. The formation of his female counterpart, Ti Amat. The leaders carefully inspected the infant's face and limbs, noting that his ears and eyes were healthy. His limbs were well formed, with hind parts resembling legs and front parts resembling hands. His hair on his head was jet black and tamed. His skin was as smooth as that of the Anunnaki. The soil of the Abzu was similar in hue to dark crimson blood. In contrast to the Anunnaki, his male organ had a skin hanging from its forepart. Anunnaki, let this foreskin divide us from earthlings. That was Enki's statement. Ninma pulled the newborn to her chest and gave him her breast, at which point the infant started to eat. We've arrived at perfection, Ningish Zida exclaimed this with joy. Enki saw his sister's gaze. He did not see Ninma as an entity, but as a mother and son. What should his name be? Enki questioned. He is a being, not a beast. Ninma put her hand on the baby's body and stroked her fingers over his dark red skin. I will name him Adamu. That shall be his name. Clay lover, Ninma was saying. Adamu's bed was created and put in the corner of the house of life. In fact, we have designed a template for unsophisticated staff, Enki was saying. Now a large number of employees like him are needed. The Ningish Zida elders reminded him, he'll be a model, but like a newborn, he'll be protected from labor, his essence acting as a mold. Enki reports that Ninma was delighted with his edict. Which wombs will now be carried by the fertilized ovals? Ningish Zida inquired. The leaders considered the predicament, and Ninma proposed a solution. The municipality of Shurubak, Ninma summoned female physicians. She outlined the required responsibilities as follows. She led them to Adamu's crib so that they might see the newborn earthling, but the assignment was optional. Ninma told them, Your will determines the outcome. Seven of the gathered Anunnaki females volunteered for the mission. 
Let their names live eternally in infamy. Ninma was addressing Enki. Their noble objective is to establish a race of primitive workers. Ningish Zida took notes as each of the seven ladies proclaimed her name and approached the front. Ninima, Shuziana, Ninmada, Ninbara, Ninmug, Musadu, and Ninguna. These were the names of the seven women to be their birth mothers. Earthlings in their wombs to conceive and give birth to offspring and primeval beings to create. In seven clay vessels built by the Abzu, two-legged Ninma ovals were placed. In the implanted vessels, she withdrew Adamu's lifeblood gradually. Then she cut Adamu's genitalia and extracted a drop of blood. Let this be a symbol of life. Let it eternally proclaim the union of body and spirit. She extracted blood from the male organ and put one drop into each artery. In this clay, humanity and the Anunnaki will be united. Ninma was repeating the incantation. The two essences, one of heaven and one of earth, will join to form a single creature, and the essences of earth and Nibiru will be blood relatives. Ninma also talked. Her Ningishzida words were documented. In the wombs of the mothers, fertilized ovals were placed. There was the conception, and the allotted time was counted in anticipation. At the appointed hour, births were occurring. Seven male terrestrials were born at the specified time. The heroes breastfed the babies with accurate facial characteristics and charming voices. Seven primitive workers have been created, Ningish Zida was saying. Let the procedure be repeated. Seven other laborious jobs await. My kid, Enki was his guardian guardian. Even seven by seven will suffice. Heroin healers want much more. This will be their life's work. Indeed, the job needs to be simplified. It is insurmountable. According to what they assert, Ninma is. We must fashion the ladies. Enki wished for their male counterparts to be. Allow them to become acquainted, because they will eventually become one flesh. Permit them to procreate autonomously and give birth on their own. The Anunnaki women will assist the primitive worker mums. Male ME formulas must be made feminine. So Enki told Ningishzida. To make Adamu's counterpart, an Anunnaki female must conceive. How did Ningishzida react to his father, Enki? Ninki, allow me to summon my husband this time. Before Ninma could respond, Enki focused on her and raised his hand. He demanded that she serve as the model for female earthlings if she was willing. They led Ninki to the Abzu, the house of life, and explained to her that Adamu was the only thing that counted. They described to her the needed work, its success, and its potential risk. Ninki was curious about the task. Let it be done, she yelled. After the ME formulas were used to make changes to Ningishzida, the admixture was used to fertilize an oval. The work was accomplished with great care. Ninki went into labor at the scheduled time, but no child was born. The number of months has been counted. Ninki, the number of months has been counted. Ninma. In the eleventh month of bad omens, they began to contact us. A surgical incision was performed on Ninma, the lady whose hand wombs had been opened. Her head was covered and her hands were also covered. Her countenance was instantly animated by the skill with which she made the incision. What came from the uterus was what had been within. A female. There was a girl born. She expressed her happiness to Ninki. The face and limbs of the infant were extensively examined. Her eyes were healthy, and her ears were as well. Her arms and legs were well formed, with parts that looked like legs and parts that looked like hands. She didn't shake, and her hair was sandy. Ninma held the young woman in her hands. She whacked her buttocks, and the baby made lovely sounds. 
Her skin was as immaculate and colourless as that of the Anunnaki. She handed the infant's breastfeeding and upbringing over to Ninki, Enki's wife. What will she be called, Enki? his spouse inquired. She is a being, not a monster. Since she is well dressed and patterned after your look, you have become a role model to female workers. Ninki put her hand on the infant's body and stroked its skin with her fingers. Ninki said, Her name will be Tiamat, the mother of life. Let her be recognized as the planet from whence the earth and moon were formed. From her womb's life essences, more birth givers will be born. Consequently, she gives life to an abundance of primitive workers. Ninki remarked on this, and everyone else agreed. In the Edin, this is the story of Adamu and Tiamat. How Abzu was expelled after a lesson on reproduction. After making Tiamat in Ninki's womb, the Abzu created the Ninmar ovals of the two legged women and put them in seven clay pots. She extracted Tiamat's vital essence gradually into the containers she implanted. Ninma mixed the mixture in the Abzu crafted clay jars while, as is traditional, she recited spells. Fertilized ovals were put into the wombs of the birth giving heroines. This led to conception, and babies were born as planned. At the appointed time, seven female earthlings were born. Their characteristics were the harmonious sounds they were emitting. Thus, seven female equivalents for the primitive workers were created, and the four leaders developed seven male and seven female counterparts. Permit men and women to procreate and allow primitive labors to multiply themselves. When the others said, after the allotted time descendants will have their own descendants, Enki agreed. Enki, Ninki, Ninma and Ningizida were overjoyed as they drank the fruit's nectar. The seven sperm cages and their contents were distributed among the trees. Let them attain adulthood and maturity simultaneously. Permit the men and women to reproduce along with their offspring. As a result, they made a remark to one another. Regarding Adamu and Tiamat, they must be exempt from the excavation work. Therefore, Enki responded to their assertions, and the others agreed. Let's send these to Edin, so the Anunnaki can observe our hard work. Adamu and Tiamat were transported to Eridu in Edin. They were supplied with a pen in which they could freely wander. At the landing location, the Anunnaki of the Edin welcomed them. Enlil came to see them, and upon seeing them, his anger subsided. Ninlil was present at Ninurta's visit. Enki's kid also descended from Lamu Marduk's way station to observe. It was an incredible sight, a miracle amid miracles. The Anunnaki notified the fashion designers that they were responsible for its creation. The Igigi that travelled between Earth and Lamu was equally enthralled. The Institute for Primitive Workers has been established. Our difficult days are closing. All of them had the same feeling. In the Abzu, infants were maturing, and the Anunnaki awaited their full development. Enki presided, while Ninma and Ningizida were also present. The Anunnaki grumbled throughout the excavations. Their patience gave way to frustration. Enugi, their boss, was constantly inquisitive. For the inexperienced employees, his yell signified danger. The number of Earth's circuits grew, and its people's maturity was long overdue. Females were not seen to conceive, and there were no births. Ningish Zida erected a grass couch near the cages amid the trees. He sat on it day and night to discern what the people were doing. He really saw them copulating. The males and females were inseminating. There was no fertilization and no birth. Enki went over the subject matter and found that none of the once combined animals had offspring. The union of two species has produced a curse, 
Enki, as the others have mentioned. Ningish Zida was saying, Let us study the essences of Adamo and Tiamat once again. What is wrong with progressively calculating their MEs? In the House of Healing in Shurubak, Adamu and Tiamat's essences were discussed. The essences of Ningish Zida are divided like two coiled serpents. Using the life essences of male and female Anunnaki, a comparison was made between them. The essences were organized as the twenty-two branches of the Tree of Life. Their bits were equivalent, and their pictures and similarities had been established precisely. They numbered twenty-two, but none of them could reproduce. Two other Anunnaki essence particles presented Ningish Zida to the others. There was only one male and one female. Reproduction was impossible without them. Consequently, he expounded to them, they were eliminated from the Adamo and Tiamat mold fusion. Ninma grew distressed upon hearing this, and Enki grabbed her in wrath. The ruckus aboard the Abzu is fierce, and rebellion is once again brewing. Enki treated every one of them equally. Locate the primitive laborers, otherwise the mining of gold will be halted. Ningish Zida resolved these issues by whispering to Enki and Ninma, his elders, in the House of Healing. They all forced Ninma's heroines to flee. They shut the door and left the three and two earthlings behind. Ningish Zida rendered the four others soulless by putting them to sleep. He extracted vitality from Enki's rib. Enki's life essence was pumped into Adamu's rib while Ninma was extracted. He implanted Tiamat's rib with the essence of life. Wherever incisions were made, the flesh was closed using sutures. Then, under Ningish Zira's leadership, the four of them awakened. It's done, he said with satisfaction. With the power to procreate, their lives are now interwoven. The two branches listed below have been added to their tree of life. Adamu and Tiamat were left free to tour the orchards of Edin. Allow them to wander freely, just as flesh allows thorns to entangle, Ninma was saying. They became aware of their nakedness as well as their gender identities. Tiamat must be recognized among the leaf aprons of wild animals. Enlil appreciated the shade as he walked through the orchard during the day's heat. He came across Adamu and Tiamat and saw the aprons on their hips. What is its relevance? Enlil was perplexed, so he sought an explanation from Enki. From Enki to Enlil, the following is said about procreation. Enlil saw that the seven and seven didn't work. Ningish Zida, the essence of life, was looked at, and more merging was needed. Enlil's anger was extreme, and his words were poisonous. I disliked us behaving as creators, and was uninterested in the scenario as a whole. The required entity already exists. So were you, Enki, when you said, All we have to do is stamp our mark on it, and primitive labourers will become fashionable. Your job was a failure. Your efforts were in vain. The healing heroes Ninma and Ninki were in peril. Now that we have given these animals our life essence, you have generated the last of our life essence so that they may inherit our life cycles by reproducing like us. Enlil spoke these words with wrath. To satisfy Enki, Ninma and Ningizida, the name Enlil was evoked. My master Enlil, Ningizida was saying. The branch of the immortal tree connected to their essence tree was not made available for reproduction. Ninma then asked her brother Enlil, What choice have you made, my brother? To end it all in failure and abandon Nibiru to its destiny, or to continue and try again, allowing earthlings to undertake the task via procreation? Could you send them to the Abzu from the Edin, then allow them to serve where necessary? Enlil screamed loudly. The summary of the seventh tablet brought progeny to Abzu, Adamu, and Tiamat. Humans multiply, laboring in mines and as servants, and Enlil's offspring, 
Utu and Inanna are born. Anunnaki spouses have more offspring on Earth. On Lamu, Nibiru's orbital approach causes disturbances. On Earth, climate change and Nibiru's orbital approach both create disruptions. Enki and Marduk realize after exploring the moon that it is hostile. Enki calculates astronomical time and constellations. Bitter over his destiny, Enki pledges dominance to Marduk Anu and places Utu in command of a new spaceport rather than Marduk. Enki encounters and mates with two earthling women, gives birth to a boy, Adapa, while the other gives birth to a girl, Titi. Enki raises them in secret as orphans. Adapa, the most intelligent, becomes the first civilized man. Ka-in and Abel are the offspring of Adapa and Titi. The Adamu Tablet Could you send them to the Abzu from the Edin? Adamu and Tiamat were exiled from Edin to Abzu at the direction of Enlil. Enki enclosed them in a forest and let them grow acquainted. Enki was ecstatic to see Ningish Zida's efforts yield fruit. Tiamat engaged in childlike behavior. Ninmar arrived to witness the birth of the twin son and daughter of the earth beings. Ninmar and Enki are in awe of the infants. Days were as long as months due to their development and evolution, while months contributed to the earth's years. Before Adamu and Tiamat had children, the first generation had already started having babies. Earthlings started to multiply before a single shah of Nibiru had passed. The workers' grasp of the commandments provided them with insight. They were ecstatic to be among the Anunnaki and worked assiduously to get food supplies. They did not complain about the heat, dust, or exhausting effort. Abzu's Anunnaki were freed from their onerous responsibilities. Nibiru was getting the gold it needed. Its atmosphere was slowly getting better, and, to everyone's delight, the Earth's mission was moving forward. The Anunnaki, who fell from heaven to earth, often engaged in romance and procreation. The sons of Enlil and Enki took their sisters and half-sisters, who were healing heroines, in marriage. On earth, sons and daughters were born to them. Who on Nibiru was wearing diapers and would have stayed on earth if he grew up? Who on Nibiru began to crawl while everyone else was running? Their parents were overjoyed with the birth of Nana and Ningal, their twins. Ningal gave them the names Inanna and Utu. They were girls and boys. With them, a third generation of Anunnaki was present on earth. The leader's children were given work. Some old occupations were split to make them more accessible to the offspring for whom they were intended, and new chores were added to the list. Temperatures on earth rose, flora flourished, and wild creatures overran the region. The rains became more complex, the rivers roared, and habitation restoration was necessary. On earth the temperature was increasing, the snow-white water regions were melting, and the seas no longer had boundaries. From the center of the world volcanoes erupted, spewing fire and brimstone, and each earthquake made the ground shake. In the section of the lower world that was colored white, the earth rumbled. At Enki, an observation station was constructed on the Abzu's tip. It was delegated to his son Nergal and his wife Ereshkigal. Something strange and ominous is brewing under the surface. Nergal addressed his father Enki. Enlil was monitoring Nibiru Ki, the location of the heaven-earth bond from the celestial circuits. He scrutinized the celestial movement shown in the MEs of the Tablets of Destiny. The skies are in turmoil. Enlil sent this information to his brother Enki. From the planet Lamu, where the way station was, his father Marduk told Enki that strong winds and annoying dust storms were getting worse. Therefore, Marduk informed his father. The hammered bracelet is enduring turbulent conditions. Hailstones were raining from the sky on earth. 
As they got closer, evil demons caused a lot of damage and turned the earth into a blazing fire in the sky. As they battled around in what looked to be broad daytime darkness, they triggered violent storms and winds. As though armed with stone missiles, they were striking the globe. These bad things also happened to Kingu, the moon of earth, and Lamu, whose face was scarred by many wounds. Enlil and Enki sent an urgent letter to King Anu, and the prophets of Nibiru gave a terrible warning. The earth, the moon, and Lamu are in danger from a disaster that hasn't been named yet. The savants from Nibiru responded, but their words did not comfort the leaders. In the skies, the family of the sun assumed its place. The celestials, of which earth is the sixth, were choosing sites. In the sky, Nibiru was coming, and the sun's home was close. Nibiru was obsessed with the seven defendants in a row. The way through the hammered bracelet was no longer accessible. Without the celestial bar, Lahamu and Mumu were stooping towards the sun, and Lahamu was leaving her exquisite dwelling in the sky. She longed to be the celestial queen, and was enticed by Nibiru, the king of heaven. Nibiru, a monstrous beast from the heavenly depths, soothed her. The celestial battle resulted in the creation of a monster that once belonged to Tiamat's host. It awakened from its slumber in the depths of the cosmos when Nibiru alarmed it. It extended from the horizon to the middle of heaven, like a blazing dragon with a head of one league, a body of fifty leagues, and a massive tail. The daytime sky on earth grows darker. At night, a spell of darkness was cast onto the surface of the moon. Lahamu was screaming for help from her celestial brethren, demanding to know, Whom will the dragon hinder? Who is going to stop and remove it? She was curious. Only the valiant Kingu, who had previously defeated Tiamat, answered. Kingu moves quickly to intercept the dragon en route. During the fierce fight, a cloud storm poured onto Kingu. The moon shook and trembled due to the impact on the foundations of Kingu. The cosmic chaos eventually subsided. Lahamu was not abandoned when Nibiru returned to its home in the great depths. After the stone projectiles impacted the ground, the rain stopped falling in Lamu. Enki and Enlil gathered with Marduk and Ninurta to see the devastation they had caused. Enki researched the status of the Earth's foundations and platforms. In the furthest reaches of the world, he measured the depths of the seas and scanned the mountains of gold and copper. There will be a great deal of vital gold. Enki mentioned this. Ninurta was the surveyor of the Edin. Wherever mountains and valleys trembled, he flew and went in his airship. The landing pad was intact, and molten planet fluids flowed into the northern valleys. As Marduk explained to Enki, the environment in Lamu had worsened, and dust storms had become a nuisance to everyday life. Consequently, Ninurta informed his father Enlil of his finding of sulfuric mists and bitumen. He expressed to his father his wish to return to Earth. Enlil reverted to his earlier plans and re-evaluated his envisioned cities and duties. In Edinburgh, a chariot track must be erected. On the crystal tablet, he exhibited the initial layout designs to the others. The mode of transportation from the landing location to the way station on Lamu remains to be discovered. We must be capable of reaching Nibiru from Earth. Enlil treated every one of them equally. Establish the place of the chariots next to Bodtibira, the metal city, and carry the gold straight from Earth to Nibiru. Since the original hit, eighty shahs have appeared. Thus spoke Ninurta, the leader of Bodjibira, to them. This explains Enki and Marduk's trip to the moon and Enki's finding of the three pathways to heaven and the stars. Enlil listened carefully to Ninurta's remarks. He was pleased with his son's wisdom. King Enlil relayed his words to Anu. Establish a place of celestial chariots in Edin and construct it where gold ore is refined. 
Let the chariots carrying pure gold go straight from earth to Nibiru, while the heroes and supplies journey the other way. Hanu, the father, was discussing Enki. My brother has a brilliant plan. The net gravitational attraction of earth is far more potent than that of Lamu. We will need all of our might to overcome it. Before hastily reaching a decision, let's explore other choices. The moon is the companion of the earth. Its net pull, ascent and fall are all modest, requiring little effort. Permit Marduk and me to go on our adventure. Consider the location a stopover. Let's begin by exploring the moon. King Arnu presented advisors and geniuses with two proposals for consideration. They did provide guidance to the king. Let's begin by exploring the moon. The decision was communicated by Arnu to Enki and Enlil. Enki was overjoyed. The moon had always fascinated him. He enjoyed contemplating whether it was lurking in the ocean and what its habitat was like. Over the course of several sleepless nights, he was captivated by the bright silver disc. He felt that the sun was engaging in a game of waxing and waning, which was a phenomenon of incredible proportions. The mysteries it had hidden since its creation interested him. Enki and Marduk travelled to the moon on a rocket ship. They encircled the Earth's ally three times while examining the dragon's horrific wound. The moon's surface was scarred with craters, resulting in the devil's destruction. They successfully landed the rocket ship among undulating hills. From Earth, they were able to observe the expanse of the sky. They navigated in all directions with ease. They were compelled to don eagles' helmets due to the lack of oxygen in the air. The terrible dragon brought about desolation and aridity. Unlike Lamu, it is improper for me to stop. Marduk was. Let's abandon this region and return to Earth. My child, do not behave in a hurry. Enki therefore explained this to Marduk. Are you fascinated by the cosmic dance of the Earth, Moon and Sun? From this vantage point, the view of the closest quarter of the Sun is uninterrupted, and the Earth seems to be a globe in the void with nothing hanging. We can inspect the far heavens using modern technology. In this solitude, we can enjoy the work of the All Creator. Let us stay. The circuits will watch the orbit of the moon around the Earth and the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Enki, angered by the sight of his son Marduk, listened to what he had to say. The words of Marduk's father convinced him to board the rocket ship, and they did so. They waited for one rotation of the Earth and three rotations of the Moon, at which point they tallied the Moon's revolutions around the Earth and calculated its month-long duration. The duration of the Earth's year was calculated using six orbits around the planet and twelve orbits around the Sun. They documented how the two were connected, which led to the appearance of the luminaries. Then they headed to the sun section and focused on Mumu and Lahamu's researched paths. Lamu, the second Sumerian quarter, began to form in conjunction with the earth and moon. There were six celestials in the lower waters. Enki therefore explained this to Marduk. Anshar and Kishar, Anu and Nudimud, Gaga and Nibiru were the six celestials of the upper waters, beyond the bar and the hammered bracelet. There were twelve, including the sun and its immediate family. Marduk questioned his father over the recent upheavals. Why have seven consecutive celestials had their places usurped? His father questioned. So was he? Then their sun Enki revolving circuits were studied. Enki, their progenitor, carefully observed the many rings surrounding the sun. Enki has created a chart depicting the locations of the Earth and Moon. He drew a broad band whose breadth was determined by Nibiru, the Sun, and not by a descendant. Anu the king picked Enki as the name for his son. 
Enki was mesmerized by how close and close together the stars were that he saw with his father in the majesty of the sky that seemed to go on forever. He sketched twelve constellations on the horizon-to-horizon arc of the sky. He partnered with one of the sun's twelve families in the great band, the Way of Anu. Based on their names, he assigned each individual to a station. Then, under the Way of Anu, from whence Nibiru, the sun, was coming, he constructed the Way of Enki and allocated twelve constellations based on the forms of their stars. The sky was called the Path of Anu, the Upper Tier, and Enlil. From the stars, twelve constellations were constructed. In their three places, there were thirty-six constellations of stars. Also, would the location of the earth around the sun be calculated as it travelled? At the beginning of the cosmic time cycle, Enki's letter to Marduk declared, When I arrived on earth, the station I was leaving, the station of the fishes, was named after me. I gave him the water to a follower of my name, Enki, who was overjoyed with his son Marduk, made this observation. The sky welcomes your knowledge, and the reach of your lessons is beyond your grasp. On earth and Nibiru, however, knowledge and authority are distinct. What did Marduk overhear his father say as a result? This is what Enki told him. My kid, my kid, what do you need more information about? What specifically do you lack? I have disclosed the secrets of the heavens and the earth to you. Poor old father, Marduk was saying. His voice conveyed anguish. Ninma Ninurta's mother was called to assist you when the Anunnaki in the Abzu halted working and the primitive worker was assigned to fashion, not my mother. My younger brother, Ningish Zida, not I, was requested to aid you. However, you did not share your perspective on life and death with me. My kid, you deemed Igigi and Lamu's instructions to be superior, Enki addressed Marduk. Poor old father, this was the statement made by Marduk. Unfortunately, we are unlucky. You, my father, are Anu's firstborn, but Enlil is the legal heir. You constructed Endu first. However, Eridu is in Enlil's dominion, while yours is in distant Abzu. I am your oldest child. My mother gave birth to me on Nibiru, yet the gold in Inurta is collected from that spot to convey or withhold it. Nibiru's existence is in his hands, not mine. We are now returning to earth. What is my responsibility? Am I destined for greatness and reign, or will I again suffer humiliation? Enki cradled his kid in silence as he made a pledge to him on the lonely moon. Whatever I have been deprived of must be your future destiny. Your moment in paradise will come at the same time as mine. This is the story of Sipa, the location of the chariots in the Garden of Eden, and the return of the first workers to Edin. Father and son were away for several earth cycles. On earth no plans were carried out, and on Lamu the Agigi were in disarray. After hearing his words made confidentially, Enlil expressed concern to Anu. He relayed this via Nibru Ki. Enki and Marduk on the moon have completed many revolutions where they reside. Their acts are a mystery. What they are planning is unknown. The Lamu waystation Marduk has been abandoned, and the Agigi are taken aback. Dust storms have been the most common. What damage has been done to us is unknown at this time. To determine where the chariots are located in Edin. As a consequence, the gold is transported straight from Earth to Nibiru. On Lamu there will no longer be a need for a waystation. Ninurta's plan and understanding of these issues are great, so have him build the place of chariots near Bud Tibira. Ninurta should serve as the first commander. Anu scrutinized Enlil's remarks before saying, Enki and Marduk are returning to Earth. What have they learned about the moon? Let's hear what they have to say first. Enki and Marduk fell to earth from the moon. They came back. They evaluated the situation. 
a way station is now unfeasible. As such, they reported. Let the location of the chariots be built, Anu was saying. Marduk should serve as its commander. Enki was conversing with Anu. Ninurta must abort the mission, Enlil angry roared. Igigi no longer needs the command. Let Marduk be in charge of responsibilities. Let Marduk be in charge of responsibilities requiring his comprehension. Similarly, as Enki's father concerned, Anu studied the situation and concluded, Rivalries have now reached the boys. Did Anu have intelligence? His conduct demonstrates this. Let's see what a new generation receives at the place of the chariots, where new gold-handling methods are assigned. Instead of Enlil, Enki, Ninurta and Marduk, the third generation, under the leadership of Utu, will be in charge. Sipar, the bird city, should be named the place of the celestial chariots. This was Anu's word. The king's word could not be changed. In the 81st Shah the building started, followed by Enlil's plans. As Enlil had suggested, Nibru Ki was located in the center or navel of the planet. The ancient cities were organized in rings according to their distances and positions. From the lower sea to the mountains they were arranged like arrows. He drew a line from the twin peaks of Arata to the northern sky, intersecting the pointing arrow of the Arata line. He assigned Sipa the task of locating the chariots on earth. A perfect circle indicated its position concerning Nibru Ki, where the arrow pointed directly. Everyone was astounded by the originality and precision of the concept. The building of Sipa was finished in the 82nd Shah, and its leadership was given to the grandson of Enlil, the hero Utu. With the wings of an eagle adorning his helmet, it was created for him. Anu drove the first chariot from Nibiru to Sipar to see the installations and marvel at his desired achievements. Marduk summoned the Agigi from Lamu to Earth as well as the Abzu Anunnaki for the occasion. Before departing, there were backslaps and shouts, a meal and a celebration, and the heroes and heroines gathered. Anu Mana, the granddaughter of Enlil, was honoured with singing and dancing and she kissed her with love. He lovingly referred to purity as Anunitu. The golden redemption reveals that the end of the toil is nigh. As soon as adequate riches for defense have been amassed on Nibiru, work on earth may be lessened, and heroes and heroines from Nibiru will return. With a few more sharias of labor they will be tied. King Anu spoke to the gathered people, promising them great hope. Anu planned the return of Nibiru with great splendor. He was bearing pure gold. His new mission, Utu with Cherish, was fulfilled, and Ninurta of Bad Tibira maintained his position as leader. Marduk returned neither to Lamu nor to Abzu with his father. Utu was in charge of the Yagigi, some of whom lived on Lamu and others on Earth. In all, the number of areas he wanted to tour in his skyship and grasp on Earth was in the millions. After Anu and Nibiru's return to Earth, the leaders were optimistic. They expected the Anunnaki with renewed labor motivation. The quick collection of gold facilitates the journey back home. Sadly, the exact reverse happened. The Anunnaki wanted to relax in the Abzu, not work all the time. Now that earthlings are multiplying, let them do the work. According to the Abzu, the Anunnaki existed in this manner. In the Edin, tasks were more complicated, requiring more homes and resources. The heroes of Edin requested that primitive workers be incarcerated by the Abzu. Only Abzu could offer forty shahs of relief. The heroes of Edin said, Our labor has grown terrible. Give us the laborers too. Ninurta took the initiative as Enlil and Enki discussed the matter. He sent fifty heroes and their respective weapons on an expedition to the Abzu. They followed earthlings across Abzu's forests and steppes. 
males and ladies were captured and carried to Edinburgh. They were taught all municipal and orchard duties. Their actions upset Enki, and Enlil was furious. You have undone my expulsion of Adamo and Tiamat. The Abzu revolt, not the Edin revolt, should be reinstated. Therefore, Enlil informed Ninurta. The heroes are at peace now that the earthlings are in Edin. A few more shahs and it won't matter any more. Following Enlil, Ninurta. Enlil was unsatisfied and muttered, Let it be, to his son. Let the wealth amass quickly, and let us all return to Nibiru as soon as possible. The earthlings, the Anunnaki, valued Edin's intelligence and understanding of commands. They claimed responsibility for all duties. They accomplished tasks in their naked state. Males and females were constantly mating, and reproduction was rapid. Their generations ranged from four to more than ten inside a single shah. As the human population increased, the Anunnaki had more workers, but demanded more food. The people of Earth are always hunting for food in cities, orchards, valleys and hills. In those days, neither a sheep nor a lamb had been formed, nor had grains been gathered. Enlil responded to Enki's harsh words by stating, Your acts created confusion. Let you be the one to provide redemption. This is the story of how man became civilized, how Enki, Adapa, and Titi's secret was revealed in the Edin. Enki was both happy and worried about how many earthlings there were. The Anunnaki's situation was greatly improved, and their suffering was lessened. Due to their increasing population, the Anunnaki rejected labor, and the workers became serfs. The seven shahs made the Anunnaki's circumstances significantly more hospitable, and their dissatisfaction diminished. What was inadequate for everyone was rendered sufficient by the multiplication of humans. Three further shahs of fish and poultry were necessary to satisfy the Anunnaki and humans. Enki was preoccupied with a new effort. He imagined civilizing humankind. Allow them to look after the agricultural grains they planted and the sheep they raised from ewes. Enki had an idea for a new project, but needed the knowledge to execute it. The necessary Abzu employees for this plan were identified. The residents of Edin, the towns and the orchards were among those he considered. What attributes of the assignments make them suitable? What, the substance of my existence, the substance of my existence has not been merged? Upon observing the offspring of humans, he noticed a troubling reality. Enki's vizier Isimud was inquiring. Isimud talked with Enki. Here is where the boat will paddle. Please kiss the children. Enki walked from the boat Isimud had steered and onto the land. Thus did Enki comment to his vizier Isimud. Isimud sat beside the infants. By the fourth count their bulges were visible. By the end of the ninth count, which had been completed, the tenth count had been completed. The first infant squatted, and a boy was delivered from her. The second child gave birth to a girl while squatting. The two were born at dawn and dusk, which define a day. On the same day as the gracious ones, dawn and dusk, afterward they were referred to in legends. Enki's two sons from the Edin were born in the ninetieth year of the Shah. Isimud and Enki's births were soon publicized. Enki was happy with the births. Whoever has ever experienced such a thing? The Anunnaki and the earthling, the educated man I produced, were pregnant. My act must remain a secret, he informed his vizier Isimud Enki. The newborns were breastfed and raised by their mothers until Isimud took them to Enki's home in Eridu. Ninki took an interest in the orphans and raised them like his own children. I spotted them in reed baskets amid the bulrushes. Everyone agrees that Isimud performed similarly. She named the boy Adapa, the foundling, and the girl Titi, one with life. 
Unlike all the other terrestrial children before them, this pair grew up more slowly than humans, but they understood much more quickly. Because of their intelligence, they could speak with words. The girl was beautiful and kind, and her hands were very talented. Ninki, Enki's husband, and Titi acquired a fondness for all the crafts she taught. Adapa Enki's training taught him how to keep records. Enki and Isimud display delight at their accomplishments. I delivered a civilized man. He told Isimud that his seed created a new kind of earthling in his image and likeness. From now on, the Anunnaki and humanity will be well fed. Enki relayed a message to his brother Enlil, who journeyed from Nibru Ki to Eridu. A new type of person has evolved in the wild. Enki was chatting with Enlil. They may be taught knowledge and skills, since they are rapid learners. Let's send seeds from Nibiru and sheep from Nibiru to earth, and teach the next generation of earthlings about farming and shepherding. Let's satisfy both the Anunnaki and the earthlings. They are akin to us in many ways. Enki then elaborated on Enlil. This was told by Enlil to his brother. What a wonder it is that they sprouted independently in the desert. Isimud was requested. He said, I found them amid the bulrushes in reed baskets. Enlil pondered the topic intently, and his head shook in astonishment. Indeed, the evolution of a new species of earthling is a marvel of miracles. The planet itself has given birth to a cultured man who can be taught farming, shepherding, crafts, and toolmaking. Therefore, Enlil, explained Enki, let us, the new species, speak with Anu. Send seeds that can be planted and used that can become sheep to earth. The word about the new breed was sent to Anu on Nibiru. Enki and Enlil both proposed the same thing to Anu. Let cultured men appease the Anunnaki and earthlings. Immediately upon hearing the words, he was stunned. It is not unheard of for one kind of licescence to lead to another. He responded with a message. Unprecedentedly, a cultured Adamu man has arrived on earth. Planting and farming require a lot of people, and people who keep having babies can't do these things. Titi gave birth to twins and two brothers on Eridu as authorities on Nibiru pondered the issue. There was a gap between conception and birth. Adapa knew that his sperm had entered Titi's womb during their encounter. The word of Anu's birth on Nibiru has been communicated. Because the couple is compatible for reproduction, they can procreate. Let seeds and ewes that will become sheep be brought to the earth, and let farming and shepherding begin on the planet. Let us all be satisfied. Enki and Enlil thus told Anu about Nibiru. Permit Titi to stay in Eridu to nurse and care for the babies. Send Adapa the terrestrial to Nibiru. So did Anu share his decision. A Summary of the Adapa Nibiru Tablet Adapa's vast knowledge astounds the geniuses of Nibiru. Adapa is brought to Nibiru at the direction of Anu. Enki reveals the truth about Adapa's parenting of Anu during the very first human space journey. Enki justifies his behavior by claiming he needs more food. Adapa is sent back to resume cultivating and shepherding. Enlil, after Enki, develops agricultural seeds and sheep lines. Ninurta instructs Ka-in in crop growing. Marduk instructs Abel in shepherding and tool making. After a fight over water, Ka-in kills Abel. He is tried for murder and condemned to exile. There are further descendants of Adapa and Titi who intermarry. On his deathbed, Adapa blesses his son Sati as his successor. Marduk brings Enkime, a descendant, to Lamu. Adapa, a native of Earth, must be taken to Nibiru. Did Anu Den agree? Enlil was against the decision. So did Anu share his decision. 
Who would have guessed that a crude labourer like us would provide the creature with intelligence and allow it to travel between heaven and earth? Enlil was unhappy with the conclusion. On Nibiru, he will drink the water of long life and eat the food of long life, becoming an Anunnaki like us. This was what Enlil stated to Enki and the other chiefs. The dejected look on Enki's face after Anu finished speaking indicated that he disapproved of Anu's decision. Indeed, who among us would have thought? Thus Enki informed the others. The brothers, including Ninmar, sat and debated. The command of Anu cannot be avoided. She persuaded them, Let our children take Adapa to Nibiru so he can get over his fear and explain the situation to Anu. According to the reports of the others, Enki acted similarly. Let his pals Ningish Zida and Dumuzi live. It is through their eyes that Nibiru will be glimpsed for the first time. Ninmar's idea that Nibiru's life cycles are being overlooked while those of Earth are being suffocated was favoured. Let the two unmarried sons of Enki also go to Nibiru. Maybe they'll find spouses there. Ilabrat, a vizier of Anu, got off the ship when the next celestial chamber from Nibiru arrived at Sipa. I've come to fetch Adapa, an earthling. As a result, he informed the chiefs that Enki's sons, Ilabrat, Ningizida, and Demuzi had arrived. Titi and her sons, together with the chiefs of Ilabrat Adapa, also showed themselves. Indeed, they were fashioned in our image and likeness. Therefore, what did Ilabrat say? They have been chosen as Adapa's travelling companions. Enki also said that Anu's grandkids would be delighted to meet him. Therefore, what did Ilabrat say? He was called by Enki Adapa to receive instructions. You will journey to Nibiru, the planet from whence we sprang. You will stand before Anu, our ruler. You will be introduced to his majesty, and you will genuflect before him. Only speak when questions are posed. Please give succinct responses. You will be presented with brand new attire. On earth, they will not offer you a loaf of bread. Food is dead. Do not ingest it. They will offer you an elixir to sip from a chalice. The elixir is death, so do not swallow it. Ningish Zida and Dumuzi, my sons, will journey with you. Their words will be heard, and you will live. Enki Adapa gave the order. I will always remember this, Adapa stated. Dumuzi and Enki Ningish Zida were summoned for his blessing and guidance. Before Anu the king, my father, whom you are approaching, you must genuflect and show him respect. You are on the same footing with princes and nobles. Do not be frightened. Your mission is to return Adapa to earth. Resist Nibiru's allure. This will be remembered, Ningish Zida and Dumuzi stated. His little kid, Dumuzi, hugged and kissed his father on the forehead. Sage Ningish Zida hugged him and gave him a forehead kiss. Unseen, he put a sealed tablet in Ningish Zida's palm and said, My father, Anu, please deliver this tablet in secret. Enki informed Ningish Zida of the same. Adapa and Sipa joined the three as they travelled to the place of celestial chariots. The three of them each carried Ilabrat, Anu's vizier, wherever they travelled. Ningish Zida and Dumuzi were dressed as heavenly eagles after receiving the clothing of Igigi. Adapa was positioned between Ningish Zida and Dumuzi inside that which ascends. His wild hair was shaved, and he was given headgear like an eagle. In place of his loincloth, he was forced to don a snug vestment. When the signal was received, the heavenly chariot roared and shook. Adapa was terrified and cried, the eagle without wings is flying. Ningish Zida and Dumuzi helped him feel better by putting their arms around him and saying soothing things. When they reached a height of one league, they glanced upon the earth and noticed that its regions were separated by seas and oceans. Two leagues above sea level caused the ocean to shrink to the size of a bathtub. 
the property was about the size of a basket. When they were three leagues above the earth, they turned around to see their origin. A vast darkness had now engulfed the earth, which was now a tiny sphere. Adapa was upset again. He cowered and pleaded. Take me back, he shouted. Ningish Zida put his hand on Adapa's neck, at which point Adapa fell instantaneously quiet. When Nibiru arrived, there was much interest. Enki's descendants on earth will see much more, so an earthling will hear. An extraterrestrial has landed on Nibiru. Similarly, the populace yelled. When Ilabrat transported them to the palace, aromatic oils were used to cleanse and anoint them. In response to Enki's comments, they were given new fitting apparel. Adapa wore the new gear. The palace was full of nobles and heroes, and princes and advisers were meeting in the royal chamber. Adapa and the two sons of Enki followed Ilabrat into the royal chamber. They bowed in the royal chamber before King Anu. Anu rose from his seat and advanced. My grandkids, he yelled at his grandchildren. He hugged and kissed Dumuzi and Nigisida, whom he had just embraced with tears in his eyes. Dumuzi wanted to be placed on the right side of Ningizida, who sat on the left. Then expand on Anu's, the earthling Adapa's, presentation. Anu, the king of Ilabrat, inquired, Does our communication make sense? Indeed he does. He was trained by Enki, praise God. Ilabrat responded accordingly. Come inside, Anu told Adapa. What is your complete name and profession? Adapa came forward and bowed again, saying, My name is Adapa, and I am Lord Enki's servant. This is how Adapa vocally expressed himself. His impressive fluency was astonishing. The summit of planetary wonders has been attained, Anu declared. The summit of planetary wonders has been attained, everyone in attendance screamed. Let there be a party, and let's greet our visitors this way, Anu was saying. He pointed energetically to the banquet room. Anu guided the gathered party to the occupied tables. Nibiru Adapa was given bread at a table laden with food, but he declined. Nibiru Adapa's elixir was given at the ladle tables, but he did not drink it. Anu was shocked and angry that Enki, a crook from earth, had told him about the ways of heaven. Come swiftly, Adapa. Why, Adapa wonders. Anu, did you deny our hospitality by refusing to eat or drink? My lord, Lord Enki commanded, the bread does not eat and the elixir does not drink. Likewise, Adapa, King Anu, reacted. Anu was saying, How strange is this? Why has Enki prohibited earthlings from eating our food and drinking our elixir? Ilabrat did not know the solution, and Dumuzi could not provide an explanation. Ningish Zida to Anu The monarch Anu was unaware of the personal tablet he carried. He interrogated Ningish Zida. The solution may be here. Then he donated. Concerned and bewildered, Anu retreated to his private room to understand the tablet. This is the narrative of Adapa, the creator of civilized humanity, and how his sons Cain and Abel introduced satisfaction to the planet. In Anu's private room, the tablet's seal was broken. He placed the tablet into the scanner to decode Enki's message. Adapa was born to a lady from Earth with my seed. Enki mentioned this in his message. Titi was also created by another earthling lady using my sperm. They possess intelligence and language, but need to maintain the longevity of Nibiru's inhabitants. Neither the longevity bread nor the longevity elixir should be ingested. Adapa must return to earth to live and die. He must accept his mortal destiny. Satisfaction will be attained via the procreation and care of his offspring on earth. Anu was informed of the truth about Adapa by Enki. Enki's hidden message left Anu speechless. 
he did not know whether to be furious or to laugh. Ilabrat called his vizier to a private room and told him, My son Ea is as promiscuous with women as Enki. He provided Ilabrat with the tablet containing the message. Anu questioned his vizier, How should the king behave, and what are the rules? Our laws allow for concubines, but there are no laws regarding interplanetary cohabitation. So said Ilabrat to the king, Damage must be limited, and a DARPA must be returned to earth without delay. Please lengthen the stay of Ningizida and Demuzi. Anu then escorted Ningizida to his private room and called for a servant. Do you know what your father's message contained? What questions did he have concerning Ningizida's message? He interrogated Ningizida. Ningizida said it in a whisper with his head lowered. I do not know, but I can. I have analyzed the essential essence of Adapa Enki's seed. That is the message indeed. Anu informed him that Adapa would return to earth immediately and that his destiny would be to start a civilization. You, Ningizida, will go back to earth with Adapa to teach people how to be civilized with your father. Similarly, Anu, the king and decision-maker, decided the destiny of Adapa and Ningizida. Anu and the two others returned before the servants, nobles, princes and counsellors. Anu declared in a resolution to the assembly that the reception of earthlings must not be excessive. On our planet he can't eat or drink. We've all seen how amazing he is, so let him come back to earth. Let his children work the fields and take care of the meadows. Ningish Zida will go with him to make sure he is safe and to keep him from worrying. He will bring the Nibiru grain seeds that grow well on earth. Demuzi, the youngest, will stay with us in exchange for a shah. He will then go back to earth with ewes and sheep essence. This was Anu's decision, and he nodded in agreement as he listened to the king's speech. At the right time, Ningish Zida and Adapa were carried to the place of the celestial chariots. Anu and Demuzi, the Ilabrat and their counsellors, bid the nobles and warriors goodbye. They could see from the horizon to the highest point in the sky. As the chariot climbed into the air, there was rumbling and shaking. The size of the planet Nibiru shrank. As they journeyed from Ningish Zida to Adapa, the planet gods explained. He taught him about the sun, the earth and the moon, as well as the progression of the months and the calculation of the earth's year. When they got back to earth, Enki Ningish Zida's father was told everything that had happened. The unexpected arrival of Ningish Zida and Adapa Enlil profoundly confused me. Enki chuckled and stroked his genitalia. Everything went according to plan except Demuzi's arrest. That is a mystery, so did Enki say. What is the difficulty? What happened on Nibiru? He asked Enki and Dingizida questions. Let Ninma also be called. Let her know what has transpired, Enki said to him. Enlil and her sister Ningizida knew everything after Ninma's arrival. Enki is also connected through his relationships with earthling women. I have not violated any rules. Our satisfaction has been secured. Enki told them this. You did not break any laws, yet your irresponsible deed affected the fates of the Anunnaki and humans. Enlil angrily said, Now that the dice have been rolled, destiny has been defeated by fate. In a fit of wrath, Enlil grabbed him and then turned and left them standing. Domkina, the mother of Marduk, commanded him to journey to Eridu. He wanted documentation of the strange incidents to validate his father's and brother's accounts. Father and brother decided to keep the news from Marduk's secret. Anu was intrigued by the civilized man and demanded that everyone on earth immediately appease him. Consequently, just a piece of the truth was disclosed to Marduk. The gorgeous lads he discovered astounded Adapa and Titi Marduk. While Ningizida Adapa educates the guys, let me be. 
Thus spoke Marduk to his father Enki and his grandfather Enlil. Marduk should teach one, and Ninurta should instruct the other. Enlil's reaction was intended for them. Titi and Titi were taught numbers and writing by Adapa in Eridu, Ningishzida, Ka'in. He who grows food in the field was the name given to Ninurta's firstborn twin in Baddibira, his city. He taught them how to dig canals for irrigation, planting and harvesting as part of their education. Ninurta used tree wood to make a plough and a cultivator for Ka'in and the land, respectively. Marduk took the second brother, the son of Adapa, to the meadows, and gave him the name Abel, he of the watered meadows. Marduk showed him how to build stalls, and they waited for Demuzi to come back so they could start shepherding. After the construction of the Shah, Demuzi returned to earth. He delivered the crucial seed for the development of sheep and ewes to another planet, earth, as well as the four-legged creatures of Nibiru. His return to his father, Enki Dumuzi, with essence seed and ewes was cause for tremendous celebration. He returned with this rich cargo. The leaders subsequently convened to discuss the future of the new breed. They reasoned, there has never been a ewe on earth, a lamb has never fallen to earth from the sky, a she-goat has never given birth to a youngster, and weaving sheep's wool has never been. The leaders of the Anunnaki, Enki, Enlil, Ninmar and Ningishzida, decided to set up a creation chamber or a place where things are made. Ninurta served as the assistant to planting and harvesting guide Ka'in. On the new mound of the landing place in the Cedar Mountains, the creation chamber was built. At the location where Ninmar sowed the elixir seeds, the multiplication of grains and sheep on earth began. The proliferation of wheat and sheep on earth has begun. Marduk was Abel's instructor in sheep and lamb husbandry and shepherding. Let there be a celebration when the first crops are gathered and the first sheep reach maturity. Enlil released an announcement. Before the first grains were brought to the assembling Anunnaki, the first lambs were sacrificed. Ninurta was in charge of putting his gift at the feet of Enlil and Enki Ka'in. Marduk was in charge of putting his gift at the feet of Enlil and Enki Abel. Enlil extended a joyous blessing to his brothers and lauded their efforts. Enki hugged his son Marduk. He raised the lamb for all to see. Food and clothing had arrived on earth, Enki said. This is the account of the generations of Adapa, the assassination of Abel by Cain, and the events that followed. After the celebration of firsts concluded, Ka Demina was visibly disappointed that Enki's benediction was absent. Concerning their responsibilities, the brothers returned, with Abel bragging to his brother, I am the one who delivers prosperity, which satisfies the Anunnaki, and who gives bravery to the heroes. Who sources the wool for their garments? Ka In was offended by his brother's words. He strongly objected to his boasting. I am the one who makes the plains lush, who fills the furrows with grains, in whose fields birds multiply, and in whose canals fish abound. I produce the bread that sustains the Anunnaki, and I supplement their diet with fish and birds. Throughout the whole winter, the twin brothers fought continuously with one another. At the beginning of summer, there was no precipitation. The meadows were scorched and the pastures contracted. His sheep invaded his brother Abel's farms to drink from the hills and canals. Farmer and shepherd, two brothers, shouted accusations. They spat on one another and used their fists to fight. Cain was outraged and ordered the removal of his brother's flocks. Extremely enraged, Cain picked up a stone and used it to strike Abel. He beat him repeatedly until Abel collapsed and began to bleed profusely. Cain exclaimed, Abel, my brother, upon seeing Abel covered in his brother's blood. Abel was still on the ground. His spirit had departed. Cain wept for a considerable amount of time after killing his brother. 
Titi was the first person to foresee the murder. She witnessed Abel's blood in the hands of Cain in a dream. Adapa was awakened by Adapa's description of her dream vision. My heart is heavy with sorrow. Did anything terrifying occur? This is what Titi said to Adapa. She was somewhat upset. The two from Eridu proceeded to Cain and Abel's place in the morning. They spotted Cain sitting next to Abel's body on the field. Titi yelled in anguish as Adapa applied dirt to his head. What successes have you had? What successes have you had? They yelled at Cain. In reaction to the silence, Ka collapsed to the ground and wept. Adapa relayed to Eridu City what occurred with Lord Enki upon his return. He cried out, You are condemned. When met with fury, Enki Kain said, You must forsake the Edin. Neither the Anunnaki nor the civilized earthlings would accept you. Due to the wild birds, Abel's corpse cannot stay in the fields. According to Anunnaki custom, he will be buried beneath a stone mound. The unknown is how Abel buried Enki and explained the practice to Adapa and Titi. After Abel's death, his parents grieved for thirty days and nights. To declare Enki's desires, Cain was carried to Eridu for judgment with the exile sentence. Cain must pay for his deeds with his life, indignantly Marduk said. Let the seven judges gather. Anunnaki rulers will be called judges for those not from Nibiru. This was spoken by Ninurta of Khan to the assembly. Is the death of the person I liked and nurtured under Ninurta insufficient? Just after Ninurta, Anzu vanquished his brother. Did not Cain rise up against him? Anzu, Ka, life, as it should be, should be cut short. In a rage directed towards Enki, Enlil and Ninurta, Marduk declared that Ninurta's answer to his comments was silence, not words. Allow me to speak privately with my son, Marduk, Enki said. At the moment, he and Marduk were in Enki's private apartments. My kid, my kid, Enki, Marduk responded calmly. Let us not torment ourselves with sorrow. Your pain is humbling. Permit me to divulge a secret that has burdened my heart. Once upon a time, as I was wandering by the river, I saw two worldly maidens, Adaba and Titi's mothers. These means introduced a new sort of earthling, a civilized man, to the planet. Whether they were capable of reproduction was in question in the mind of our monarch Anu, but the birth of Cain and Abel satisfied Anu and the council on Nibiru. Now that Abel has been slain, and if Cain is also extinguished, satiation will end, rebellions will recur, and everything that has been done will crumble. A new phase of the Anunnaki's existence on earth was sanctioned and embraced. Given that Abel was your half-brother, it is not strange that you fell in love with him. Conversely, show compassion and allow the Adapa line to live. Enki also regretfully revealed a secret to his son Marduk. Marduk was shocked and overcome with laughter at this revelation. I had heard much about your skill in the art of seduction, but now I am convinced. Indeed, spare Car life's life and send him to the ends of the earth. As he listened to his father speak, Marduk's anger turned to hilarity. In Eridu, Enki passed judgment on Cain, ordering him to relocate eastward to a land of wandering. Essence's Ningish Zida, the vital essence of Cain, was altered. He and his descendants need to be acknowledged. What impact did Ningish Zida have on Ka life? He journeyed to the land of wandering with his sister Awan and his Adina based bride Cain. The Anunnaki sat and pondered. Without Abel and Cain, who would cultivate the grains and prepare the bread? Who will shepherd the flock? Who will breed the sheep? Who will provide the wool needed for clothing? Let Adapa and Titi produce more, so said the Anunnaki. With the blessing of Enki, Adapa and Titi's husband, 
they repeatedly knew. Every time a daughter is born, a second daughter is born. In the 95th Shah, Adapa and Titi finally gave birth to a boy. Titi dubbed him Sati, he whom life binds again. Generations of Adapa were tallied by him. Adapa and Titi had a total of thirty boys and thirty girls. Land cultivators and herders for the Anunnaki were among them. They satisfied the Anunnaki and cultivated earthlings returned. In the ninety-seventh year of Shah's reign, Sati gave birth to his wife's son, Azura. His name in the historical record was Enshi. His name was Mitra de l'Humanité. Adapa, who taught him to comprehend his father's writing and numbers. And Adapa Enshi explained everything about the Anunnaki at Nibiru to them. He was transported to Nibru Ki by Enlil's sons, where he was taught the mysteries of the Anunnaki. He illustrated how the fragrant oils were used to anoint Enlil's oldest son on earth, Nana, and how the elixir from the Inbu fruits was used to prepare Enlil's youngest son, Ishkur. Since then, civilized man has referred to the Anunnaki as rulers. That marked the beginning of Anunnaki religious rituals. After that, Enshi's sister Noam bore him a son, Kunin, he of the kilns, who had a specific significance. For he was instructed in Bhadibira by Nibuta. He learned how to build bitumen fires, smelt and refine in furnaces and kilns. He and his descendants laboured in the smelting and refining of gold for Nibiru. Shah raised this issue in the 1980s. This is the tale of Adapa's descendants after Cain's banishment and Enkime's holy voyages and Adapa's death. Kunin had a son in the 99th Shah, Mualit. Kunin's half-sister conceived him. Malu, he who plays, was his name. He excelled in music and singing. He received a flute and a stringed harp from Ninurta. His daughters led the singing of hymns to Ninurta Malalu. Duna was the partner of Malalu, the daughter of his father's brother. In the hundredth year of Shah, after Earth's count started, Malu and Duna had their first child, a boy named Irid, he of the sweet waters, after Duna. The Igigi returned to Earth more frequently during his lifetime. Dumuzi had instructed him to dig wells to give water to the sheep in distant meadows. There, Shepherds and maidens mingled by the wells in the meadows, and there was an abundance of civilized human procreation and marriage. They were increasingly interested in observing and observing what was happening on earth, as they could see from the sky that they were being gradually abandoned. To go with them on Lamu, Enki Marduk's pleading to see and observe what was occurring on earth, as Marduk desired more ardently. At a well in the meadows, Irid meets his wife. She went by the name Baraka and was the daughter of his mother's brother. Their son, Shah, was born one hundred seconds later. In the historical records, Enki Mei was described as intelligent and clever and having a rapid understanding of mathematics. Concerning the skies and all heavenly issues, he was insatiably interested. After Adapa exposed the secrets to him, Lord Enki became interested in them. Of the family of the sun and the twelve heavenly gods that Enki was instructing, as well as how the months were tallied by the moon and the years by the sun, as well as how the shahs were numbered by Nibiru and how the counts by Enki were merged, how Lord Enki split the circle of the sky into twelve sections. Enki gave each of the twelve stations its own constellation and put them all in a big circle. How to honour the twelve Anunnaki great leaders via the names of the stations, Enkime was anxious to explore the sky. He made two trips to the heavens. Enkime was designated as Marduk's companion at the landing location. This is the record of Enkime's travels through the sky how the Igigi conflicts and intermarriages were initiated by Marduk. From then on, Marduk travelled to the moon by rocket ship. 
Marduk imparted to Enkime everything he had learned from his father, Enki. Enkime was sent when he returned to earth to live with Utu in Sipa, the place of chariots. There was a tablet for recording what Utu was teaching Enkime, and Utu was placed as the earthling's prince. With the teachings he imparted, the priesthood's duties were initiated. Enkime, his half-sister, and Edini, his wife, resided in Sipa. In the 104th year of Shah, they had a son. His mother called him Matushal, which translates to Who by the Bright Waters raised the name. After that, Enkime made his second voyage to the sky, with Marduk again serving as his guide and companion. They circled the sun while travelling in a heavenly chariot toward it. Marduk was escorted to Lamu to meet with the Agigi. The Agigi liked him, and civilized earthlings gained knowledge from him. According to the chronicles, he ascended to heaven, that he spent the remainder of his life in the skies. Before Enkime travelled to the sky, he was instructed on every aspect of the heavens. Enkime preserved their letters so that his sons would recognize his handwriting. He recorded everything in the skies, the sun's family, the earth's regions, territories and rivers. Ragim and Gaidad, the eldest sons of Matushal, were handed the text to study and follow. Matushal was born in the 104th year of Shah's reign. He was a witness to the Igigi conflicts and the actions of Marduk. Matushal and his wife Edda have a son. Mighty Man, or Lu Mark, was his name. In his time, circumstances on earth worsened, and field and meadow labourers began to protest. As a workmaster, the Anunnaki Lu Mark imposed ration restrictions and quotas. During his lifetime, Adapa passed away. And when Adapa saw that his days were ending, he said, let all my sons and sons of sons come around me, so that I may bless them and give my last words to them before I die. And when Sati and the sons of the sons assembled, he inquired, Where is Ka'in, my eldest son? Adapa, the seniormost of the group, inquired. Let him be handsome. He disclosed everything. Before presenting his father's request, Lord Enki Sati inquired about what the Lord should do. Enki commanded Ninurta, Bring the exiled one, your teacher, to Adapa's deathbed. Ninurta took his bird of heaven to the area of wandering and soared around the land while looking for Ka'in, and when he discovered him, he took him to Adapa like an eagle on its wings. Adapa was instructed when his son's coming was announced. Let Kain and Sati arrive before me, Adapa stated. The two children came before their father, Kain, the oldest on the right, and Sati, the youngest on the left. With Adapa's vision fading, he identified his boys by touching their faces. And Ka's faces on the right was beardless, while Sati's face on the left was bearded and Adapa placed his right hand on Sati's left side of the head, and he praised him and said, The earth will be filled with your offspring, and humankind will experience a severe disaster as a result of your offspring, like a three-branched tree. And he placed his left hand on the head of Ka'in standing to his right, and said to him, You have forfeited your birthright because of your wickedness, but seven nations will descend from your offspring. They will flourish in a distinct domain and populate distant countries. However, if a stone kills your sibling, you will perish. Adapa's hands fell. He groaned, and he added, Now, call my wife Titi and all the boys and all the girls, and when my soul passes, transport me to my birthplace by the river and bury me with my back to the rising sun. Titi howled like a wounded animal and sank beside Adapa's knees. According to Titi, Adapa's two sons, Ka'in and Sati, wrapped his corpse in a cloth and buried him in a cave near the riverbanks. 
Shah was born during the 93rd year and died at the end of the 118th. He lived a long life for an earthling, but not as long as Enki. After Adapa was buried, Kain said goodbye to his mother and brother. Ninurta returned to the world of nomadism in the Bird of Heaven. Cain had both sons and daughters in a distant world, and he built a city for them only to be killed by a falling stone while working on it. The Adina's overlords were the Anunnaki. Marduk and the Igigi intermarried with humans under the reign of Lumark. A summary of the Adapa Lamu tablet. Humanity proliferates and Adapa's dynasty reigns supreme. Contrary to Enlil, Marduk calls for a female earthling. Lamu is affected by celestial disturbances and climatic variations. The Igigi descend to earth and abduct human ladies to serve as their spouses. Ziusudra is the human offspring of the promiscuous Enki. Droughts and diseases bring about hardship on earth. Enlil interprets this as divine vengeance and wants to return home. Aged by the earth cycles, Ninmar too wants to return. A mysterious messenger cautions them against defying their fate. The probability of a catastrophic flood is growing. Most of the Anunnaki start to go back to Nibiru as Enlil makes sure that all humans die. Enki and Ninmar begin to safeguard the seeds of life on earth. The surviving Anunnaki make preparations for the day of the flood. Nergal, lord of the underworld, will deliver the warning 194. Marduk and the Igigi intermarried with humans under the reign of Lumach. At the time, the hardships on earth were mounting. During those days on Lamu, the planet was covered with aridity and dust. Enlil, Enki and Ninmar are the Anunnaki who decide what will happen, and they are all consulted. They pondered the evolving situations on earth and Lamu. They saw sunspots that blazed in the Earth's and Lamu's net forces. Observational equipment was installed in the Abzu near the White Land facing point. The instruments were entrusted to Nergal, Enki's son, and Irishkagal, his wife. Ninurta was given to the land beyond the seas, and Heaven-Earth was to be built in the mountains. The Igigi were upset over Lamu, so Marduk was tasked with calming them down. The Lamu way station must always be maintained. The chiefs then informed Marduk, the three who jointly determined the destiny. They shared eye contact. How old are the others? Each of the other individuals agreed. Enki, mourning Adapa's passing, was the first to speak. It has been almost a hundred shahs since my arrival, he told his brother and sister. I was once a dazzling leader but now I am bearded, weary, and elderly. Enlil said, Now I have children who have children, all of whom were born on earth. We aged on earth, but those born now are much older. I was a courageous hero who was eager for leadership and adventure. So she regretted Enlil's brother and sister. As for me, they refer to me as an old sheep. Ninmar expressed her longing. While others have come and gone, taking turns serving and being served on earth, we, the leaders, have remained. It may be time to go, as Enlil said. As Enki said, I often pondered this. Whenever one of us wants to return to Nibiru, Nibiru's word is always our agreement with it. I too did wonder, Enlil said. Is that anything from Nibiru or something from earth? Possibly, Ninmar was pointing to the disparities in life cycles. The three leaders agreed to observe what transpired. Was it destiny or fate at the time? The situation was under their control. As Marduk had wanted, he told his father Enki that they needed to talk about something very important soon. On earth, the three sons of Enlil's wives have been selected. Ninurta Bau, the youthful daughter of Anu, has wed. Nana has chosen Ningal. Ishkor Shala has selected Shala. 
Nergal took your son, Ereshkigal, a grandchild of Enlil, as a wife. Threatening her life was how we got her permission. Nergal did not await my marriage since he was your oldest child, but the other four waited out of respect for my marriage. I aimed to choose a wife. Having a spouse is my goal. Thus Marduk told Enki his father. Enki talked to Marduk. Your remarks make me smile. Your mom also will be happy. Marduk signalled his father with a raised hand to limit his comments to Ninki. Is she among the young people who heal and provide comfort? Enki continued by asking. She is Adapa's descendant. She is not from Nibiru, Marduk muttered gently. Enki was perplexed and dumbfounded. Will a human marry a Nibiru prince? the firstborn to succession. He yelled angrily, Not an alien, but your own progeny. Marduk informed him that Sarpanit was the name of an Enkime daughter who had been transported to paradise. Enki summoned his wife Ninki and informed her of what had transpired with Marduk. His heart's desire was reiterated to Ninki and his mother Marduk, and he said, we have gradually developed a primitive creature identical to ourselves on this planet. Except for longevity, people are formed in our image and likeness in every way. I wanted to marry an Enkime daughter since I was attracted to her. Ninki thought over her son's remarks. What does the virgin think of your gaze? Marduk's mother acknowledged that she does, so Marduk questioned. There are other problems. Enki stated in a firm voice. If our kid does this, he will never go to Nibiru with his future wife. He will forever forfeit his princely privileges on Nibiru. Bitterly, Marduk said, My rights on Nibiru are non-existent, and my rights as the firstborn have been violated even on earth. This is my decision. I will ascend from prince to king on earth and rule this planet. Let it be so, Ninki said. Let it be so, Enki also stated. They informed Matushal, the bride's brother, about Marduk's request. Matushal was modest yet overcome with happiness. Let it be, he said. When Enlil heard about the choice, he became enraged. It was one thing for the father to associate with humans, but quite another for the son of a human to marry and for her to confer dominion. Ninmar felt disheartened at learning about the scenario. Marduk could marry any one of our young women, and Enki could choose one of my daughters. According to royal tradition, he may marry half-sisters. Ninth confirmed this. Enlil notified Anu Nibiru of the situation with rage. His words radiated. This behavior cannot be tolerated, King Enlil stated to Anu. On Nibiru, Anu, the councillors were asked to consider the situation immediately. They discovered that there was no such rule in the rule books. The savants, including Anu, debated the event's consequences. On Nibiru, Adapa, the maiden's ancestor, could not remain. Therefore, Marduk must be permanently prohibited from returning to Nibiru with her. What they were saying to Anu. Indeed, Having been used to earth cycles, Marduk's return without her may be unthinkable. Make a choice to shoot down to earth. Anu was saying that Marduk may marry, but he will no longer be a prince on Nibiru. The savants and the counsellors agreed with Anu's assertion. Enki and Marduk's choice was accepted, and Enlil also bowed at Nibiru's command. Let a wedding party take place in Eridu. Ninki informed them. Marduk and his wife cannot reside in Edin, Enlil the commander said. Let us give Marduk and his wife a wedding gift. Outside of England, they have their own realm on a foreign continent, so Enki told Enlil. Enlil, with his approval, was contemplating Marduk's exile. Enlil addressed Enki, his brother. What land is it? Which domain do you refer to? a territory above the Abzu in the upper sea region, 
cut off from the Edin by sea and only accessible by ship. So Enki told Enlil. Let it be so, Enlil stated. Ninki planned a wedding reception in Eridu for Marduk and Sopanit. The event was signalled by the sound of a copper drum, and the bride and groom were given seven tambourines by the bride's sisters. A lot of civilized people from Earth gathered in Eridu for the wedding and coronation, which was also their wedding. Young Anunnaki were also there, as were several Ligigi from Lamu. We have come to attend the wedding of our leader, Nibiru and Earth. So does the arrival of many Igigi explain why? This is the story of how the Igigi, who were the daughters of earthlings, were taken away, how diseases spread, and how Ziusudra appeared out of nowhere. The Igigi migrated from Lamu to Earth in great numbers. Only one-third of the population survived on Lamu, and two hundred were taken to earth. They said they were required to attend the wedding of their chieftain Marduk. Enki and Enlil were unaware of their plan, which consisted of conjugation. Numerous Igigi on Lamu gathered together, unknown to earth's authorities. What Marduk authorized is also ours, and it must be maintained, they said to each other. Enough of sorrow and loneliness, never have children. This was their motto. The earthlings' daughters, also known as Adapite females, were often seen during their travels between Lamu and Earth. They beheld them and lusted for them, and the conspirators whispered to one another, Let's marry Adapite women and have children. Shamgar, the name of their commander, was one of them. Even if no one else agrees, I shall carry out the action. He told the others that if punishment was imposed for this transgression, he would face it alone on your behalf. Others in the scheme joined them separately, and they swore an oath to carry out the plan. By the time of Marduk's wedding, two hundred guests had arrived at the landing site. They dropped onto the vast platform of the Cedar Mountains. They travelled to Eridu, passing through regions where earthlings worked, and arrived with the earthling population. After Marduk and Sopanit's wedding ceremony, Shamgaz signalled the others. Each Igigi kidnapped a young woman from Earth and brought her to their landing site in the Cedar Mountains. They established a foothold there and challenged the leaders. Enough with the deprivation and childlessness. We hope that the Adapite girls will wed. You must bless this, or we shall burn the whole planet to the ground. Concerned, the chiefs asked that Marduk, commander of the Igiki, assume charge. If I'm searching for a solution, I giggle with Igigi. According to the others, Marduk acted similarly. What I have done with them is indisputable. Enki and Ninma shook their heads as they reluctantly agreed. Only Elil was furious without being appeased. Another terrible act followed the Igigi's adoption of Enki and Marduk's fornication. Our holy duty to the winds has been abandoned, as has our pride. We shall annihilate this planet and all its people. Enlil said his words with contempt. Let the Igigi and their earth-based ladies go. It is now challenging to survive in Lamu owing to the intolerable circumstances. Marduk informed Enlil and Enki of identical information. They can't remain in Edinburgh, Enlil roared with rage. He walked out of the gathering in disgust. In his heart, Enlil was scheming something against Marduk and his people. The Igigi and their ladies were alone on the Cedar Mountain's landing platform. They had offspring who were known as the Rocket's children. Marduk and his wife, Sapanit, also had children. Asa and Satu were their firstborn boys. Marduk the Igigi told him to go to the land above the Abzu that he and Sapanit had been given and live in the two towns he had built for his sons. Some Igigi and their descendants were granted dominion in the land of Black Hues. On the Cedar Mountain's landing platform, Shamgars and others remained. 
some of their ancestors located to the remote mountainous eastlands. Enlil, Ninurta's father, Enlil Ninurta, Ninurta closely studied Marduk's growing strength. What do Enki and Marduk have in mind? The earth that humanity has inherited will exist. Enlil spoke to Ninurta. Let Cain's descendants locate them and create your own dominion with them. Ninurta journeyed to the other side of the world, where he found Ka's offspring. He showed how to engage, smelt and refine metals in mining, just as he had shown how to build instruments and perform music. He instructed them to construct balsam tree rafts and traverse a vast ocean. They started a new domain on a new piece of land and built a city with two tall towers. It was a realm beyond the oceans, not the heaven and earth mountainous region of the new bond world. Lu Mark was Edin's master. He was responsible for implementing rations and reducing the quantity of food offered to earthlings. His bride was Botanash, the daughter of the brother of Lu father. Mark's Enki was mesmerized by her extraordinary beauty. Enki delivered a letter to his son Marduk that said, Lu Mark, summon number 203 to your kingdom. Teach humans how to construct a city there. Bartanash was taken to Ninmar's home in Shurubak, the haven city, after Lumark was called to Marduk's kingdom. They were sheltered and shielded from the hostile crowds of earthlings. After that, Enki's sister Ninmar promptly paid him a visit to Shurubak. Bartanash was bathing on the top of a building when Enki grabbed her loins, kissed her, and emptied his sperm into her womb. Bartanash's stomach was bloated since she was pregnant. Return to the Edin because you have a son, Shurubak said to Lu Mark. Bartanash, Edin, and Shurubak's son appeared to Lu Mark after his return to Edin and Shurubak. His complexion was as white as snow, and his hair was the color of wool. His eyes were as brilliant as the sky and shone with radiance. Lu Mach was shocked and afraid and rushed to his father, Matushal. Matushal travelled to Bartanash with the infant, whose resemblance astonished him. Bartanash was given a kid unlike any other. I am mystified by this occurrence. Is one of the Agigis the father of the child? Bartanash Matushal was urged to reveal the truth. The truth has been disclosed to your husband, Lu Mach, about whether or not this child is his son. I assure you that none of the Igigi are the boy's father. So too did Bartanash's response. His son, Lu Mark Matushal, then turned and wrapped a comforting arm across his shoulders. The youngster is a mystery, yet his peculiarity reveals a portent for you. As unusual as he is, fate picked him for a unique mission. I am still determining what that duty entails, but I will know when it arrives. So Matushal informed his son Lu Mark, referring to the situation on earth. In those days, the amount of human misery on earth was rising. The days became colder, and the sky withheld its precipitation. In the fields, harvests decreased, and in the sheepfolds there were few ewe lambs. Permit your peculiar kid to be a portent of upcoming relief. Matushal relayed the same message to his son, Lu Mark. Let his name be Respite. Matushal and Lu Mark Bartanash were unaware of their son's secret. She dubbed him Zhu Sudra, he of long and bright life days. He was nurtured in Shurubak. Ninma provided the youngster with her protection and compassion. Thanks to the information she imparted, he had great intelligence. Enki, the child, enjoyed reading Adapa's works, which he taught. The priestly ceremonies taught the lad how to watch and perform as a young man. In the 110th year of Shah, Ziusudra was born. In Shurubak, he grew up and wed Emzara, and she bore him three sons. During his reign, the world's woes intensified. Diseases and famine plagued the globe. 
This is the tale of the Earth's trials before the deluge, and how the enigmatic Golzu's decisions about life and death led them astray. Igigi's marriages to earthling daughters severely distressed Enlil, as did Marduk's marriage to an earthling female. In his view, the Anunnaki mission to Earth had been distorted, and the wailing, yelling throngs of earthlings had become anathema. The earthlings' tyrannical proclamations had become, The conjugations of slumber deny me. Also, according to the other chiefs, Enlil acted similarly. Pestilences and plagues ravaged the land during Ziusutra's reign. The inhabitants of earth were overcome with pains, vertigo, chills, and fevers. Let us, the earthlings who are curing, educate others on how to heal, so did Ninmar say. As a result of this prohibition, Enlil replied to her pleadings. The earth's womb closed, and plants did not grow in the places where earthlings had moved. Let us, the people of earth, teach them how to build ponds and canals, and let them get fish and food from the oceans. According to the other leaders, so did Enki. As a result of this prohibition, let the inhabitants of the planet die from starvation and disease. Enlil talked to Enki. Shah, the earthlings consumed the field grasses to begin with. They endured Enlil's second, third, and ultimate acts of revenge. In Shurubak, the city of Ziusudra, the horrible pain intensified. A person from Earth went to Eridu Ziusudra and told them, He went to the home of Lord Enki and called him by the name of his lord. Enki was bound by Enlil's decrees, despite his pleading for rescue and deliverance. The Anunnaki were anxious about their existence at the time. Their supplies were diminished due to the Earth's alterations. As on Lamu, the seasons lost their regularity on Earth. The celestial circuits of one Shah and two Shahs from Nibiru were looked at, and strange things about their planet's fates were found. Black blotches formed on the sun's face, and flames burst from its surface. Kishar was likewise misbehaving. Its host had lost its footing, and its circuits needed further stability. Unseen net forces tugged and pushed the hammered bracelet. The son and its family were upset for no clear reason. Bad fates had taken control of the celestials' lives. The savant sounded the alarm on Nibiru, and the populace assembled in the public squares. The All-Creator, the skies, and all of nature are reverting to their early days. All are formed by fury. People yelled amongst themselves. As the planet's difficulties worsened, fear and starvation set in. Three and four shahs were spent observing the instruments facing the white land. Nergal and Ereshkigal recorded strange rumblings in the snows of the white land. The white land's snow ice had slipped. According to Abzu's tip report, so did they. In the land beyond the seas, Ninurta erected divination equipment in his sanctuary. The devices detected tremors and vibrations at the surface of the earth. Unusual circumstances are afoot. So Enlil notified Anu of the warning from Nibiru. On Nibiru, the savants warned the king of impending horrors. The next force of earth and Nibiru will be known the next time Nibiru and the sun are nearby. On the other side of the sun, a station will include Lamu in its loops. The sky will keep Nibiru's net power from reaching Earth, but Kishar and its people will be upset, and Lahamu will also shake and wobble. Snow ice on the white land's surface will slip the next time Nibiru, the planet closest to Earth, approaches. It will cause a watery disaster, a massive wave, a deluge will overrun the Earth. There was tremendous anxiety. The king, savants, and advisers from Earth and Lamu were all very concerned about Nibiru's future. The king and his advisers agreed to leave Earth and Lamu to prepare. The gold mines in the Abzu were closed, and the Anunnaki moved to Edin. 
refining stopped in Badibira, and all the gold was sent to Nibiru. A fleet of fast heavenly chariots came back to the surface of the planet, empty and ready to leave. On Nibiru, the celestial signals were seen, while on Earth, earthquakes were reported. A white-haired Anunnaki named Galzu, the great Noah, came down from one of the heavenly chariots at that time. He sealed a letter from Anu and gave it to Enlil along with gorgeous stairs leading to his path. Enlil examined Anu's entire and legitimate seal. I am Galzu, special envoy of the king and council, he said. Since he hadn't heard from Anu, Enlil was surprised by his appearance. The message tablet was deciphered at Nibru Ki, and its encoding was reliable. When Galzu speaks for the king and council, his words are my command. The message from Anu state did as well. Galzu sought the summoning of Enki and Ninmar as well. When they approached Ninmar, Galzu grinned warmly. We are of the same school and age, he said to her. Ninmar couldn't remember this, because the envoy was as young as a son, and she was as old as his mother. The rationale is straightforward. Gazu remarked, It is a result of our winter's dormant life cycles. This is, in fact, part of my assignment. Nevertheless, the evaluation is a secret. Since Demuzi had remained on Nibiru, the returning Anunnaki on Nibiru had examined. Those on earth who had stayed the longest were harshly tormented by the returning. Their bodies were no longer acclimated to the cycles of Nibiru. Their sleep was interrupted, their vision was deteriorating, and Nibiru's net force slowed their progress. Their thoughts were also impacted by the fact that their boys were older than the parents they had abandoned. Death came swiftly to the returnees, my companions. I am coming to warn you. The three longest-serving world leaders were stunned and speechless by the statements. Ninmar was the first to remark. This was to be anticipated. She was making a statement. Enki, the sage, agreed. That much was evident, he said. Before we were earthlings, we were not imprisoned on this planet, but now we are, Enlil raged. Enki and his earthlings, who were made to be our slave masters and slaves, have turned this whole thing into a nightmare. Galzu listened compassionately to the outburst. Indeed he added, there is much to think about. On Nibiru, there was much contemplation and soul-searching over profound questions, such as whether Nibiru's destiny is determined by the Creator of all, or whether the Creator of all conceived going to earth, and we were only unknowing messengers. The discussion shall continue, comrades. Galzu treated them in the same manner. Now, here is the hidden instruction from Nibiru. You'll be back. You will confront the disaster in heavenly chariots encircled by earth. The three of you remaining on earth will perish on Nibiru. The other Anunnaki must be let go or face impending disaster. The Agigi earthlings must choose between departure and spouse preference. No earthling, not even Marduk Sopanit, is permitted to go to Nibiru. Regardless of what happens in angelic chariots, Everyone who remains must seek safety. Everyone else must be prepared to go for Nibiru immediately. Similarly, Gazu Nibiru's secret gave the commanders orders. This is why the Anunnaki left Earth and promised to let people die in the deluge. A council of Anunnaki and Igigi chiefs were convened at Nibru Ki, Enlil. The children and sons of the leaders were also present. Enlil conveyed the approaching calamity to them as a secret. The Earth mission has come to an end. He told them that all celestial ships that were getting ready to go to Nibiru would be evacuated, but if they had wives from Earth, they would have to leave without them. Igigi, to whom their husbands and kids are connected, let them flee to the highest heights on Earth. As for those of us Anunnaki who want to stay, 
we shall do so on the boats of heaven in the earth's sky. The impending cataclysm, the fate of earth to be seen. As the commander, I will be the first one to remain. By their own decision, it will be the others. So what exactly was Enlil saying? The following Sumerian texts are some of the most fascinating ever deciphered regarding Enki and the Flood. Ryan Morhen has pioneered this research with his grandfather George Morhen, the curator of the Morhen Collection in Liechtenstein. It reads as follows. After the deluge, I will return the Sumerian lands beyond the oceans. So did Ninurta proclaim this. Nana, Enlil's firstborn on earth, has a peculiar wish. He wishes for the deluge to survive not in earth's skies but on the moon. Enki arched his eyebrow. Enlil, though perplexed, gave his approval. Ishkur, the youngest son of Enlil, has decided to remain on earth with his father. It was decided that Nana's earthborn children, Utu and Inanna, would remain. Enki and Ninki chose to remain and earth did not abandon their decision. They announced it with pride. Igigi and Sapanit cried out, I will not abandon. Marduk's response was one of anger. One by one, Enki's other sons declared their intention to remain. Nergal and Gibil, Ninagal and Ningishzida, and finally, Demuzi. When all eyes were on Ninmar, she proclaimed with pride, my life's work is here. I will not abandon the human beings I created. Her words infuriated the Anunnaki and Igiki, who inquired about the fate of the earthlings. Let the inhabitants of the earth perish for their abominations, declared Enlil. Enki exclaimed to Enlil, We have created a marvellous being. It must have been due to our efforts. Enlil responded with his own shouted words. From the beginning, each choice you made was correct. You granted primitive workers procreation and endowed them with knowledge. You hold the powers of the All-Creator in your hands. You subsequently sinned even by abominations. Adapa, you conceived via fornication. You gave by understanding his line. You took his offspring to the heavens and imparted them with our knowledge. Every rule you have broken, every command you have disregarded. A brother was murdered because of you, by a civilized earthling brother, because Marduk, your son, the Igigi, intermarried with earthlings, as did he. Who is lordly from Nibiru, and who owns the earth? Enough, enough. Stop listening to me. These outrages cannot continue. Now that a disaster caused by an unknowable fate has been decreed, Allow what must occur. Thus did Enlil vehemently proclaim. That all leaders solemnly swear to allow events to transpire following Enlil's demands. Ninurta was the first to take the oath of silence. Others on Enlil's side followed. Nergal, one of Enki's sons, was the first to take the oath, followed by the other. I bow to your command. Marduk said to Enlil. But what value does swearing have? If Igigi's spouses abandon them, will fear not spread among the inhabitants of earth? Ninmar was in tears, and she whispered the words of the oath. Enlil regarded his sibling Enki. It is the king and council's desire. He addressed him with the following phrase. Why will you swear me to secrecy? Enki's brother Enlil asked. You made the decision. It is a commandment on earth. I can't stop the floodwaters, and I can't save the masses of earthlings. Therefore, to what oath do you wish to bind me? inquired Enki's brother. To let everything transpire as if predetermined by fate. Let it be known as Enlil's decision, and let Enlil alone bear the responsibility for ever. Enki treated all pronounced identically. Enki then left the assembly, accompanied by Marduk. With immediate commands, enlilling the assembly's call to order, 
resulted in assigning tasks and adopting resolutions. Places of assembly are designated, equipment is gathered, and chariots are assigned to those who will depart and remain. Returning citizens of Nibiru were the first to depart. They boarded the celestial vessels while embracing and arm-locking in both happiness and sorrow. One by one, the Sipa vehicles roared into the air. Initially, those left behind travelled without incident. The screams were first audible, then muffled. After the completion of the launches toward Nibiru, Marduk and the Agigi with earthling spouses took their turns. Marduk gathered them all at the landing place and gave them a choice. With him, Sarpanit, two sons, and the daughters, Talamu, where disaster awaited, or return to Nibiru with him, Sarpanit, two sons, and the daughters. Or to find refuge from the deluge, dispersed to remote mountainous regions on earth. Enlil then considered the survivors and assigned them chariots in groups. Ninurta to the mountainous regions beyond the oceans. Enlil to report on the rumblings of the earth. The White Land assigned Nergal and Eshkigal the duty of keeping an eye on Enlil. Enlil tasked Ishgur with defending against an onslaught of earthlings. Install and fortify a barrier and a bolt to prevent access. Sipar, the place of the celestial chariots, was the focal point of all preparations. The tablets of destiny from Nibru Ki were transferred to Sipar, Enlil creating a temporary bond between heaven and earth. Enki Enlil, his brother, then dressed him, saying, However, if the catastrophe survives, everything that transpired must be remembered. Let us safely bury record tablets in Sipar deep within the earth, so that what has been accomplished from one planet to another will be discovered in the coming days. The words of Enki's brother were received with approval. In the golden chests were kept M.E.s and other tablets. In Sipar they are interred for posterity in the depths of the earth. Thus prepared, the leaders awaited the departure signal. In its great circuit, the approach of Nibiru was closely monitored. Enki's sister Ninma addressed him during that period of anxious waiting, and Enki told her that Enlil had lost focus due to his preoccupation with humans and all other forms of life. Other living creatures, some of which we recognize from Nibiru and the majority from Earth, will perish when the tidal wave of water sweeps over the land. Let us, you and I, preserve their life-giving essences and extract their vitality for safekeeping. Ninma, who gave life to Enki's words, said, I will do it in Shurubak, and you will do it with Absu's living creatures. So to Enki she said. Enki and Ninma took on a difficult task while the others sat idly by. Ninma was assisted in Shurubak by some of her female assistants. Enki was assisted by Ningish Zida in the Abzu at the ancient House of Life. The collected male and female essences and life eggs were preserved in pairs of each species in Shurubak and Abzu. The living species must recombine for the duration of the Earth's circuit. At that time Ninurta sent word, The Earth's tremors are ominous. At that time Nergal and Ereshkigal sent word, the white land is shaken. The Anunnaki congregated at Sipa in anticipation of the day of the deluge. A summary of the Enki Dream Deluge Tablet Enki dreams that the mysterious messenger appears. Enki is tasked with saving humanity via his son, Ziusudra. Enki manipulates Ziusudra to construct a submarine. A navigator arrives on board with the seeds of life from Earth. As Nibiru approaches, the White Land ice sheets begins to slide. The resulting tsunami floods the planet with water. The remaining Anunnaki lament the disaster as they orbit the Earth. The waters recede. The boat of Ziusudra rests on Mount Salvation. 
Enlil discovers Enki's duplicity while falling into a whirlwind. Enki persuades Enlil that it was predestined by the All-Creator. The surviving landing platform serves as a temporary base of operations. In a creation chamber, plants and animals are created. Gold is discovered in abundance in the lands beyond the seas. Ancient lands are the site of the establishment of new space facilities. They consist of two manufactured mounds and a lion-shaped carving. Ninmar proposes a peace plan to end the escalating conflict. The Enki Dream Tablet The Anunnaki congregated at Sipa in anticipation of the Day of the Deluge. Lord Enki had a dream vision when anticipation was mounting while he was asleep in his quarters. Enki recognized him as Galzu when he approached him. In his right hand he held a stylus for engraving. He held a gleaming lapis lazuli tablet in his left hand. And as he approached Enki's bed and was able to stand, Galzu said, Your accusations against Enlil were unjustified, for he spoke only the truth, and the decision that will be known as Enlil's decision was not made by him, but by fate. The fate of the earthlings is now in your hands, as they will inherit. Bring your son Ziusudra without causing him to break his oath, and let the impending catastrophe be revealed. A boat that can withstand a watery avalanche, a submersible one, of which I am displaying an example on this tablet. Permit him access to save himself and his family. This is the will of the all-powerful Creator. And Gozu, in the dream vision, drew an image with the stylus on the tablet, and placed it by the side of Enki's bed. Then the image faded, the dream vision ended, and Enki awoke with a shiver. Enki remained in his bed for some time, pondering the significance of his dream vision with awe. What omen did it hold? Then, as he got out of bed, the tablet was there. What he had witnessed physically at his bedside was merely a dream. Lord Enki grasped the tablet with hands trembling. On the tablet, he observed a design of an oddly shaped boat. The tablet's edge measurement markings indicated the dimensions of the boat. Lord Enki hurriedly dispatched his envoys at dawn, filled with awe and the desire to find Galzu. To him I must speak, so he advised them. By evening, Everyone had returned and reported to Enki that no one had been able to locate Galzu, and that he had long since returned to Nibiru. Enki was especially baffled by the mystery and its portent, which he endeavoured to decipher. Despite his inability to solve the mystery, the message was clear. That night, Enki went to the reed, but not where Ziusudra was sleeping. Not having broken the oath, Lord Enki addressed the hut's wall instead of Ziusudra. Wake up, wake up, Enki addressed the reed wall. He spoke from behind the reed screen. A dreadful storm will ravage all settlements and cities. In my words, please pay close attention to my directives and adhere. Enki spoke to Ziusudra from behind the reed screen as the words roused him. Reed hut. Read Hutt. The human race and its descendants will perish. This is the final decision by Anu, Enlil, and Ninmar, as determined by Enlil's assembly. Now, please pay close attention to what I am saying and my message. Abandon your home, construct a boat, forego possessions, and save a life. The design and dimensions of the boat you must construct are depicted on a tablet that I will leave by the hut's wall. Ensure the entire boat is covered. The sun must not be visible from within. To survive a wet avalanche, the boat must be able to flip and roll. The tackle and pitch must be solid and tight to repel water. Construct the boat in seven days and invite your family to join you. Food and drinking water pile up on the boat, and even domesticated animals bring something. Then, on the appointed day, you will be given a signal. A water-savvy boating guide will be assigned to you, 
and on that day you must board the boat and close its hatch securely. A massive deluge from the south will devastate lands and life. Your boat will be torn from its moorings and tossed about. The boat's captain will lead you to a safe harbour. Only through you will the germ of civilization endure. Ziusudra was dumbfounded when Enki's voice ceased, and he fell to his knees, exclaiming, My lord, I have heard your voice. Reveal your face, my lord, he exclaimed. I have not spoken to you, Ziusudra. I have spoken to the reed wall. As Enki explained, I am bound by Enlil's decree and the oath that all Anunnaki swore. If you see my face, you will indeed die. Now, read Shak, heed my words. My Lord Enki has annoyed Lord Enlil. I'm sailing to Enki's home in the Abzu. Maybe Enlil will be appeased. The boat's purpose, a closely guarded Anunnaki secret, must be protected. When the citizens ask, you will respond. A period of silence followed. Ziusudra emerged from the barrier of reeds. In the moonlight, he saw and picked up a lapis lazuli tablet. It was depicted as a boat with notches indicating its dimensions. Ziusudra was the wisest of all civilized men. He comprehended what he had heard. He proclaimed to the citizens, Lord Enlil was displeased with Lord Enki, my master, and as a result he was hostile towards me. I will no longer reside in this city or enter the Edin. Instead, I will sail to the Abzu, the domain of Lord Enki. In a boat that must be constructed quickly, I will depart from this place. As a result, the Lord Enlil's wrath will abate, hardships will cease, and the Lord Enlil's blessings will shower upon you in the future. People gathered in the vicinity of Ziusudra as the morning was still young. They encouraged one another to construct the boat for him as quickly as possible. Children transported bitumen from the marshes, while elders transported boatwood. As the woodworkers hammered the planks together, the bitumen melted, like Ziusudra, in a pot. He sealed the interior and exterior of the boat with bitumen. As depicted on the tablet, the boat was completed on the fifth day. The townspeople, eager to see Ziusutra depart, brought food and water to the boat. Their food was taken from them. They were in a hurry to appease Enlil. Additionally, four-legged animals were driven into the boat while field birds flew in independently. Ziusudra, his spouse, and his sons set sail on the boat. Their wives and children also accompanied them. Anyone who wishes to visit the residence of Lord Enki is welcome. Thus Ziusudra declared to the gathered crowd. Imagining Enlil's abundance, only a few artisans responded to the call. Ninogal, Lord of the Great Waters, boarded the ship on the sixth day. Son of Enki, he was chosen as the ship's navigator. He held a cedar wood box in his hands and kept it by his side in the boat. It contained the life essences and life eggs of living creatures, which the lords Enki and Ninma had gathered, from Enlil's wrath to be concealed so that life could be resurrected if the earth was willing. Ninagal explained to Ziusudra that every beast in the boat was concealed in pairs. With Ninagal and Ziusudra in the boat, the arrival of the seventh day was now expected. This is the account of the deluge that swept the earth, how the Anunnaki escaped, and how Ziusudra survived in the boat. The deluge was predicted to occur in Shah's 121-year-old year. In the tenth Shah of Ziusudra's life, the deluge was approaching, and an avalanche loomed in the constellation of the lion. The earth rumbled and groaned in agony for several days before the deluge. Nibiru was visible in the heavens as a bright star for several nights before the catastrophe. There was darkness during the day, and the moon was consumed by a monster at night. The earth began to tremble because of an unknown force. 
in the light of dawn, a dark cloud appeared on the horizon. The light of the morning faded as if death's shadow had been concealed. Then there was a thunderclap, and lightning illuminated the sky. Depart, depart! Utu gave Anunnaki the signal. The Anunnaki were elevated to the heavens while crouched in the heavenly ships. The bright eruptions of Ninagal could be seen from eighteen leagues away in Shurubok. Button up, closure of the hatch, Ninagal yelled towards the Asutra. They lowered the trap door concealed by the hatch. The boat was completely enclosed and watertight, but a ray of light was able to penetrate the interior. That unforgettable day, the deluge began with a roar. The earth's foundation shook in the white land at the earth's centre. The ice sheet then slid off its foundations with the sound of a thousand thunderclaps. It was drawn away by Nibiru's unseen net force and crashed into the South Sea. It was causing one ice sheet to collide with another. The white land's surface was crumbling like a cracked eggshell. A tsunami appeared out of nowhere, and the sky turned into a wall of water. At the centre of the planet, an unprecedented storm began to rage. Its winds propelled the wall of water, and the tidal wave was spreading northward. The wall of rushing water reached the Abzu lands from the north. It travelled from there to Edin's settled lands. When the tidal wave reached the sea wall, Shuruwak arrived. The boat of Ziyasudra was dislodged from its moorings by a tidal wave, which tossed it about like an abyss of water and swallowed it. The boat remained stable despite being wholly submerged. Not a single drop of water entered. People defeated the storm's wave in a bloody battle. The Anunnaki celestial ships were circling the earth. No one but his fellow man could see as the ground had vanished and only water remained. Everything that was once on the ground was washed away by the mighty waters. By the end of the day, the watery wall had engulfed the mountains. They squatted, squeezing into the compartments and pressing against the outer walls as they pondered what was occurring below that caused them to strain. Ninmar, resembling a woman in labour, cried out from the celestial ship where she was, My work is comparable to drowned dragonflies in a pond. All life has been eradicated by the crashing sea wave. Thus Ninma wept and wailed. Inanna, who was with her, also wept and lamented. Everything that once lived there is now clay. Thus did Ninma and Inanna weep. They cried to alleviate their emotions. In those days, the Anunnaki aboard the other celestial vessels were humbled by the sight of unbridled fury, a force greater than their own. They were famished for the fruits of the planet and thirsty for fermented elixir. Unfortunately, Clay's time has passed. As a result of the massive tidal wave that engulfed the earth, the planet was submerged. This is what the Anunnaki said to one another. The heavens' drains opened, and precipitation descended upon the earth. The waters from above and the waters of the great below were mixed for seven days. When the water wall reached its limit, the assault ceased. However, the rain continued for an additional forty days and nights. The Anunnaki looked down from their perches and saw a sea of water where once there had been dry land and where mountains had once reached the heavens, their summits now resembled islands in the ocean, and everything on land that wasn't alive in the avalanche of water perished. Then, as in the beginning, their basin's waters were collected. The water level gradually decreased as it fluctuated day by day. It was a lovely day with a light breeze. Then, forty days after the worldwide deluge, the rain ceased. After forty days, the boat's hatch opened, revealing Ziusudra's location for the survey. The boat was bobbing on a vast ocean, with no other signs of life. All living things, including humans, have been eradicated from the Earth's surface. 
We are among the few survivors, but there is no dry land to step on. So lamented Zyusutra to his relatives as he sat down and wept. Ninagal directed the boat toward the twin peaks of Arata at Enki's command. He constructed a sail for her and steered the vessel toward Mount Salvation. Zyusutra's impatience led to the release of the birds on board. He sent them to confirm the existence of dry land and surviving vegetation. Both the swallow and the raven he released returned to the boat. He released a dove, which returned with a tree branch. Now Zyusudra was aware that dry land had emerged from the ocean. A few days later, the boat by the rocks was captured. The flood is over, and we have reached the Mount of Salvation. Ninagal therefore informed Zyusutra. Zyusutra emerged from the boat after the watertight hatch was opened. The sky was clear, the sun shone, and a light breeze blew. He urgently summoned his wife and children. Let us praise the Lord Enki. Let us give thanks to him. Zyusutra addressed them. He used the stones gathered from his sons to construct an altar. He sacrificed an unblemished ewe lamb and a ewe lamb to Enki on his altar. Then he lit a fire on the altar and added fragrant incense. At the time, Enlil said to Enki from his celestial boat, Let us descend in whirlwinds from the celestial boats upon the peak of Arata to assess the situation and determine what should be done. While the others circled the earth in their celestial vessels, Enlil and Enki descended upon the summit of Arata in whirlwinds. The two brothers met with a smile, their arms interlocked in happiness. Enlil was then perplexed by the aroma of fire and roasting meat. Which is it? his sibling yelled, who has survived the flood. Let us investigate. Enki responded with humility. They flew their whirlwinds over to the opposite peak of Arata. They observed Zyusutra's boat and landed close to the altar he had constructed. Enlil's rage knew no bounds when he saw Ninagal among the survivors. Everyone on earth had to perish, he yelled angrily at Enki and charged him with the intent to kill him with his bare hands. My son, he is no mere mortal. He is. According to Zyusutra, Enki cried out. Anlil hesitated for a brief moment. You lied under oath, toward Enki he yelled. I addressed a reed wall, not Zyusutra, Enki told Enlil about the dream vision. Ninurta and Ninma had already landed in their whirlwinds upon Ninagar's notification. Ninurta and Ninma were not offended by the events described to them. The all-powerful creator desires humanity's survival. Ninurta therefore informed his father. Ninma touched her crystal necklace, a gift from Anu, and swore, The annihilation of humanity shall never be repeated. Enlil took them by the hands of Zyusudra and Imzara, his wife, and blessed them. Procreation and multiplication will replenish the earth. Thus ended the ancient era. After the confrontation at Arata, the deluge's waters continued to recede, and the face of the earth gradually emerged from beneath the waves. This is the account of how the planet's survival was restored, and how a new source of gold and other earthlings beyond the oceans were found. The mountain regions were largely undamaged, but the valleys were buried by mud and silt. The Anunnaki surveyed the landscapes from celestial ships and whirlwinds. Everything from the past in Edin and Abzu was covered in mud. Eridu, Nibruki, Shurubak and Sipar were gone entirely. But, in the Cedar Mountains, where the excellent stone platform glistened in the sunlight, the landing place which had been established in the past remained. The first to land to the chariot signalling by clearing debris and tree branches. One by one, the celestial chariots arrived and landed on the platform. The whirlwinds on the platform landed successively. The platform remained intact. 
the substantial stone blocks at the launch corner remained in place. Then messages were sent to Marduk on Lamu and Nana on the moon. Likewise, they returned to Earth and landed in the exact location. We survived the Great Flood, but the planet has been ravaged. The Anunnaki and Digigi who had been gathered for assembly by Enlil were now summoned. Thus spoke Enlil to them. Lamu was devastated by Nibiru's passage. We must evaluate all recovery options, whether on Earth or elsewhere. So did Marduk relate. Its atmosphere has been sucked away, and its water has evaporated. It is now a place with dust storms. The moon cannot sustain life without the assistance of eagle masks. So did Nana recount the other's story, and then he added, with words of adoration, Once there, one must recall that it was the leader of Tiamat's host and exclaim, What a companion it is! Earth's fate is tied to it! Enlil placed his arm on his son's shoulders with care. Regarding survival, we are now concerned. Enlil responded similarly to Nanar's mild retort. Now sustenance is our top priority. Examine the sealed chamber of creation. We may still find Nibiru's seeds. Thus, Enlil explained to Enki that he was created initially by grains. They discovered the ancient shaft while removing some mud from the platform, and they entered the sanctuary after removing the stone blocking the entrance. Copper keys were used to open the seals on the diorite chests with seals. Inside the chests, in crystal containers, were Nibiru's grain seeds. Once outside, Inurta Enlil was given the seeds, and he said, Go to the mountainside terrace, let the grains of Nibiru once again provide. Ninurta dammed waterfalls, constructed terraces, and instructed the eldest son of Ziusudra in farming in the Cedar Mountains and other mountains. Another assignment was given to Ishkur, his youngest son, and Enlil. Search for fruit-bearing trees in areas where the water had receded. The following responsibilities were assigned to him as the youngest son of fruit cultivator Ziusudra. Ziusudra took a sip of the fruit juice because Anunnaki's elixir was renowned. Ziusudra fell asleep like a drunkard after one sip, another and yet another. Then a gift was presented to the Anunnaki and earthlings. He opened the chest Ninagal had been carrying, revealing its unexpected contents. The life essences and life eggs in the wombs of the four-legged animals from Ziusudra's boat can be combined. Sheep for wool and meat will multiply, as will cattle for milk and hides. Together with other living creatures, we will repopulate the earth. The middle son of Ziusudra assisted Dumuzi with the shepherding duties assigned by Enki. Enki then turned his attention to the dark-coloured landmass he and his sons had ruled. Together with Ninagal, he dammed the mountains at the confluence of mighty waters and ferocious waterfalls, to create a lake where the waters could accumulate. Then, accompanied by Marduk, he surveyed the land between the Abzu and the Great Sea. Where habitations once stood, the river's valley and how to drain it, he pondered. He created an island from the water in the middle of the river where the waters cascaded. He carved twin caverns and sluices from stones above the caverns. From there, he carved two channels in the rocks for the waters and fashioned two narrows for them, permitting the flowing waters from the highlands to be slowed or accelerated and the waters regulated by dams and the two narrows. Dumuzi and the shepherds settled in the land of the two narrows on the island of Abu, the island of the cavern, where the river's serpentine valley arose from beneath the waters he raised. Enlil sent all of this to Nibiru with pleasure, and Nibiru responded with concern. The close passage that Earth and Lamu caused on Nibiru caused too much damage. The shield of gold dust was torn, and the atmosphere was once again depleting. New gold supplies were required immediately. He went fervently to Abzu Enki with Gibil, his son, to survey and search. 
all of the gold mines were buried by the water avalanche. In the Edin, Bad Dibira no longer existed, and there was no room for chariots in Sipa. The hundreds of Anunnaki who toiled on earth in mines and Bad Dibira were gone. The deluge turned a large number of earthlings into clay as primitive workers. On earth and on Nibiru there was desperation. There is no longer any gold available on earth. Enlil and Enki also announced their visit to Nibiru. Ninurta returned to the mountain land beyond the oceans after completing his tasks in the Cedar Mountains. The avalanche of waters deep cuts into the mountainsides there, he said from that land on the other side of the planet. Uncounted gold nuggets, large and small, fell from the mountainsides. The rivers below collapsed, and the gold could not be hauled without mining. Enlil and Enki dashed to the distant mountain land where they marvelled at the discovery. Gold, pure gold, no need for refining or smelting. Everything was a lie. Nibiru corrected what Nibiru wrought. It is a miracle, so Enki explained to Enlil. Who will collect the nuggets, and how will they be delivered to Nibiru? The unseen hand of the creator of all is allowing life to flourish on Nibiru. So said Enlil. Leaders asked each other. Ninurta had the following response to the first question. Some earthlings have survived in the high mountain land on this side of earth. Their leaders are four brothers and four sisters. They saved people on rafts, and their mountain top is now an island in the middle of a large lake. They are Kain descendants, and they know how to work with metals. They remember me as the protector of their forefathers, the great protector they call me. The leaders were encouraged by the news that other earthlings had survived. Even Enlil, who had planned the abolition of all flesh, was no longer enraged. They claimed it was the creator of all's will to each other. Let us now create a new home for celestial chariots, from gold to Nibiru. For a new plain whose soil has dried and hardened, they searched. They found such a plain near the landing place on a desolate peninsula. It was as flat as a quiet lake, surrounded by white mountains. This is the account of the new place of the celestial chariots, the artifice twin mounts, and how the image of the lion by Marduk was usurped. The Anunnaki chose the heavenly ways of Anu and Lilith in the peninsula. Enlil was reflected on earth. Let the new place of the chariots be precisely on that boundary, and let the heart of the heavens plain reflect. So Enlil suggested to Enki. Once Enki agreed, Enlil took measurements from the skies of distances, drawing a grand design on a tablet for all to see. Let the landing place in the Cedar Mountains be a part of the facilities, he said. The distance between the landing place and the cavalry place he measured was in the midst of this. He designated a location for a new mission control center. He chose a suitable mount and named it the Mount of Way Showing. He directed the construction of a stone platform similar to but smaller than the landing area. A great rock was carved inside and out in its midst to house a new bond heaven-earth a new navel of the earth, the role of Nibru Ki before the deluge to replace the landing path on the twin peaks of Arata in the north was anchored. Enlil, two more sets of twin peaks are required to demarcate the landing corridor, to delimit its boundary and secure its ascent and descent. Mountains can be found in the southern part of the desolate peninsula. Enlil chose adjoining twin peaks to anchor his southern delimitation. There were no twin peaks where they were needed. Only a flat area above the waterlogged valley protruded from the ground. We can create artificial peaks there. So, according to the leaders, did Ningish Zida. He drew the image of smooth-sided skyward rising peaks for them on a tablet. If it can be done, let it be. Enlil, with approval, said. 
let them also serve as beacons. On the flat land above the river's valley, Ningish Zida had a scale model built. He perfected the rising angles and the four smooth sides that went with them. He placed a more prominent peak next to it, with its sides aligned with earth's four corners. Its stones were cut and erected by the Anunnaki using their power tools. He placed the peak that was its twin beside it in a precise location. With galleries and chambers for pulsating crystals, he designed it. The leaders were invited to place the capstone on this artful peak to the heavens when it rose. The apex stone was made of electrum, an alloy that Gibil fashioned. The sunlight reflected the horizon. At night it looked like a pillar of fire, as the power of all the crystals was focused in a beam to the heavens. When the artful works that Ningish Zida designed were completed and ready, the Anunnaki leaders of the great twin peak entered, and at what they saw they marvelled. Ekur, the house like a mountain, as they named it, was a beacon to the heavens. It was declared that the Anunnaki and the deluge had survived and triumphed forever. Now the celestial chariots can receive gold from across the seas, and the chariots will carry gold to Nibiru for survival. From it to the east, where the sun on the designated day rises, they will ascend. They will descend to it in the southwest, where the sun sets on the designated day. The Nibiru crystals were then activated by Enlil's own hand. Inside, eerie lights started to flicker, and an enchanting hum broke the silence. A great cry of joy erupted from the assembled Anunnaki. It was shining brighter than the sun outside the capstone all at once. Ninma was moved by the occasion, and recited and sang a poem, House like a mountain, house with a pointed peak. For heaven earth it is equipped, it is the handiwork of the Anunnaki. House bright and dark, house of heaven and earth, the celestial boats it was put together by the Anunnaki a house whose interior is illuminated by the reddish light of heaven. It emits a pulsating beam that reaches far and high. A lofty mountain of mountains, great and lofty fashioned, is beyond earthling's comprehension. Equipment house, lofty house of eternity, a house whose components are expertly woven together. The great ones who circle to rest in the skies make their descent. The house that houses the rocket ships is a landmark with unfathomable insides. Its foundation stones are in contact with the water, and its large circumference is made of clay. Anu himself is the Ekur. Thus did Ninma at the celebration recite and sing. While the Anunnaki celebrated their remarkable handiwork, Enki responded to Enlil's suggestion, saying, when in the coming days it will be asked, when and by whom was this marvel fashioned? Let us build a monument beside the Twin Peaks, and let it proclaim the age of the lion, with the image of Ningish Zida, the peak's designer, on its face. Let it be directed precisely toward the place of the celestial chariots. Let it be revealed to future generations, when, by whom, and for what purpose. When the work to cut and shape the lion from the bedrock was proceeding, Marduk sent his father Enki words of aggrievement, saying, Did you promise to rule the entire planet for me? Now that others have granted me command and glory, I am left without task or dominion. So Enki suggested to Enlil, Of the place of the celestial chariots, Utu must again be the commander. Let the gazing lion precisely eastward facing with Ningish Zida's image be, said Enlil. The artifices are mounted in my former domain. My image must be on the lion. Ningish Zida was irritated by Marduk's words, as were the other sons. Ninurta and his brothers were roused by the clamour for domains. Everyone wanted land for themselves and devoted earthlings. Let not a contest celebration become, Ninma amidst the raised voices shouted. The earth is still in havoc. We Anunnaki are few, and there are only survivors of the earthlings. Let us not deprive Marduk Ningishzida of his honour, 
and let us heed Marduk's words. So said Ninmar the peacemaker to the contending leaders. For peace to prevail, the habitable lands between us should be set apart. Enlil spoke to Enki. They agreed to make the peninsula an undisputed divider for the peacemaker Ninmar. Tilmun, land of missiles, they called it. To earthlings it was unfathomable. The habitable lands to the east were set aside for Enlil and his descendants, as well as the descendants of Ziusutra's two sons, Shem and Yafet. The dark-hued landmass that the Abzu included for Enki and his clan was for domains granted. The people of Ziusudra's middle son, Hum, were chosen to inhabit it. To appease his son, Enki proposed making Marduk their lord and master of their lands. Let it be as you wish, Enlil informed Enki of the situation. Ninmar and his mother Ninurta were given a home in Tilman's mountainous south. Near a spring with date trees and a verdant valley it was located. Ninurta terraced the mountain crest and established a fragrant garden for Ninmar. When this was accomplished, a signal was sent to all outposts on earth. Whirlwinds carried the gold nuggets from the mountainous regions over the ocean. From the place of the celestial chariots, the gold was carried to Nibiru. Enlil and Enki decided on a new epithet name for Ninmar, the mediator, on that momentous day. Ninharsag, mistress of the mountain head, let us call her. Ninmar was given the title Ninharsag by acclamation. Previously she was known as Ninmar. Praise to Ninharsag, the peacemaker on earth, the Anunnaki declared in unison. Tilmun, the territory around the spaceport, is proclaimed a neutral zone. Ninmar was awarded and renamed Ninharsag. Marduk receives the Dark Lands, while the Enlilites get the Ancient Lands. The grandchildren of Marduk fight. Satu kills Asar while becoming pregnant, and Asar's wife Asta gives birth to Horon. In aerial combat above Tilmun, Horon defeats Satu. The Enlilites consider it wise to construct a second spaceport. Dumuzi, the son of Enki, and Inanna, the granddaughter of Enlil, fell in love. Due to his fear of repercussions, Marduk causes Dumuzi's death. Inanna is condemned to death and then revived for seeking his corpse. Inanna wages war to capture and punish Marduk. The Enlilites invade his great mount stronghold. They shut the highest room to entomb Marduk alive. The wife of Marduk, Sarponit, and his son, Nabu, beg for his life. Ningish Zida, who knows the mysteries of the mount, reaches Marduk. Marduk's life is saved, and he is exiled. Enki and Enlil allocate the earth to their other sons. The Anunnaki cried in unison, Praise to Ninharsag on earth, the peacemaker. Ninharsag was able to settle tempers during the first shah after the deluge, but Nibiru's thirst for riches made aspirations and rivalries essential. Thanks to Enki's preservation of life seeds, life gradually returned to earth. Surviving populations were reinforced on land, in the air, and at sea. The Anunnaki found that the most precious relics were those of humanity. Like primitive labourers were formed in the past, the Anunnaki begged for civilised workers. Before the completion of the first Shah following the deluge, unanticipated events ruptured the ceasefire. The eruption was neither between the clans of Marduk and Ninurta, nor Enki and Enlil. When Marduk's sons violated the truce with the aid of Igigi, while Marduk, Sopanit, and their children and grandchildren on Lamu waited, the deluge arrived. Asar and Satu fell in love with the daughters of Shamgars, the chief of the Igigi. When they all returned to earth, the two siblings were engaged. Asar, also known as Asta, made the selection, and Satu, also known as Nebat, was engaged. Asar opted to reside in the dark-coloured plains with his father, Marduk. Satu was close to the landing site where the Igigi lived, and Shamgaz had set up residence there. Shamgaz was worried about the kingdoms of earth, and asked, Where will the Igigi be? 
The second Igigi, Shamgars, also incited, which Nebat and Satu discussed regularly. By sticking with his father, Asa will become the lone heir and inherit the bountiful fields. So what did Shamgars and Nebat say to Satu daily? How Satu intends to retain the inheritance for himself and his daughter? On a day of good fortune, they prepared a feast and invited Igigi and the Anunnaki. Asa came unknowingly to rejoice with his brother. Nebat, the sister of his husband, put up the tables and footstools. She donned a tire and sang a song to the powerful Asa while holding a lyre. Satu offered him fatlings cut from prime roast beef with a salted knife. Shamgaz offered Asa a massive cup of the homemade new wine he had prepared. He presented him with an impressive-looking giant jug and an elixir. Asa was joyful. He stood and sang and chanted while holding cymbals. The mixed wine suddenly overcame him, and he collapsed to the ground. The dinner host suggested that the other guests give him an excellent night's rest. Asa was transported to another room and placed in a coffin. They sealed the casket tightly and flung it into the ocean. When the news reached Marduk, her husband's father, Asta, mourned. They scoured the sea for Asa's coffin along the beaches of the dark-coloured region until it was discovered. Asa was severely battered in the ocean's depths. The coffin must be located immediately. The lifeless corpse of Asa lay therein, and its breath had left its nostrils. Marduk hired his garments and applied ash on his forehead. My beloved son! Her pain and mourning were significant as Sapanit wailed and cried. Enki was upset and cried to his son, The curse of Kain has returned. Asta wailed to the sky, appealing to Marduk for revenge and an heir. Satu must perish. Please permit me to create a child from your sperm. May his name be remembered in your name, the lineage enduring. Sadly, this cannot be, Enki remarked to Marduk and Asta. The sibling who murdered the sibling's sibling shall be the keeper. For this reason, Satu must be preserved. You must conceive Asa's successor from his sperm. Asta was bewildered by these twists of destiny. Disturbed, she resolved to break the rules. Asta, the live seed of Asa, was taken from his phallus before his corpse was wrapped in a shroud and put in a shrine for preservation. Asta used it to compel Asa to carry an heir and an angel of vengeance. Enki and his sons, as well as Marduk and his siblings, received Satu's message. I am Marduk's only heir and successor. I shall be the master of the land of the two narrows. Asta contested the accusation before the Anunnaki council, stating, I am pregnant with Asa's successor. She felt her husband's anger in the river's bulrushes concealing a kid. She avoided Satu. She named the kid Horon and nurtured him to be his father's avenger. This upset Satu, but Shamgaz, motivated by ambition, did not recede. From one earth year to the next, the Igigi and their children from the landing place expanded until they reached the boundaries of Tilman, the holy territory of Ninhasag. Place of the Celestial Chariots was in danger of being invaded by Igigi and their earthling allies. In the dark-coloured countries, the kid Horon, who had been changed into a hero by Earth's rapid life cycles, was a hero. Horon was adopted by his great-uncle Gibil, who also taught and schooled him. For him, Gibil fashioned flying shoes. He could soar like a hawk. For him, Gibil fashioned a heavenly harpoon. Its arrows were missiles. Gibil acquired metalworking and blacksmithing skills in the southern highlands. Horon discovered the secret of the iron Gibil metal. Horon fashioned weapons from the material and recruited an army of earthlings. They marched through land and water to attack Satu and the Igigi in the north. 
Horon's earthling army has arrived at the bounty of Tilmun, the land of missiles, where Horon and his forces are preparing to attack. Satu's response to Horon's challenge is as follows. Let's participate in a one-on-one -on -one match. Horon awaited in the air above Tilmun, Satu in his fighting whirlwind. Satu fired a poisoned arrow at him as he soared at him like a hawk. Horon collapsed as if stung by a scorpion. When Asta saw this, she cried out to heaven and for Ningishzida. Ningishzida descended from his heavenly vessel to rescue the hero for his mother. The magical talents of Ningishzida transformed the poison into human blood. By daybreak, Horon was cured and rose from the grave. Then Ningishzida gifted Horon with a blazing pillar, like a celestial fish with fins and a fire tail, whose eyes changed from blue to red to blue as their hues shifted. They ascended toward the victorious Satu Horon in the fiery pillar. They followed one another far and wide. The conflict was vicious and fatal. Horon's flaming pillar was struck first. Then Horon Satu struck with his harpoon. Horon threw Satu at the ground and chained him with tethers. When Horon and his kidnapped uncle came before the council, they saw that he was blind and had deformed testicles. He stood like an abandoned jar. Let blind and airless Satu survive. What did Asta then say to the council? The council determined how his mortal existence among the Egiki would terminate. Horon, victorious, proclaimed that he would inherit his father's reign. The council's decision was written on a metal tablet and put in the Hall of Records. Marduk was happy with the judgment, but grieved by what had transpired. Horon was a son of Asa, but since he was descended from Shamgaz the Egiki, he was not granted a realm like the Anunnaki. After losing both sons, Marduk and Saponit sought comfort from one another. Over time they had another son, whom they called Nabu, the prophet-bearer. This is why a new chariot was constructed in the distant past, and Marduk's love for Damuzi and Inanna was broken following Damuzi's death. Enlil gathered his three sons to a conference after Horon and Satu's dispute and aerial combat over Tilman. Concerned about what was occurring, he informed them, First the earthlings were made in our image, and then the Anunnaki descendants were produced in the image and likeness of the earthlings. Then his brother murdered Cain. Today a son of Marduk is his brother's murderer. An Anunnaki descendant organized an army for the first time in history. He put weapons made from secret Anunnaki metal in their hands. From the time when Alalu and Anzu questioned our validity, Igigi disruption and rule-breaking have persisted. The beacon peaks inside Marduk's domain have been located, as has the Igigi's landing site. The Igigi are now en route to the place of the chariots. To all the heaven-earth infrastructures they say will be constructed in Satu's honour. So Enlil informed his three sons, proposing as a countermeasure, an alternate heaven-earth facility in the hidden institution. Let it be in Ninurta's kingdom beyond the seas, surrounded by trustworthy earthlings. Thus Ninurta was assigned the covert assignment. In the mountainous regions beyond the seas, on the shores of a large lake, he was building a new heaven-earth connection inside an enclosure. The amenities are rudimentary, but they will serve an important function. At the base of the mountains, where the gold nuggets were strewn, he picked a level, solid region and designated the ascending and descending paths. Eventually Ninurta proclaimed to his father Enlil, from there, gold shipments may continue to Nibiru, and if necessary, we can ascend. What had begun as a good occasion but turned into a tragedy ended at that time. Dumuzi, the youngest son of Enki, had affections for Inanna, daughter of Nana. Inanna, the granddaughter of Enlil, 
was fascinated by the king of herding. They were enveloped by an inexhaustible love, and their hearts were ablaze with desire. Inanna and Dumuzi were the first to sing many of the love songs that were subsequently performed for an extended period. They sang of their love. Dumuzi granted his youngest son Enki a larger area than Abzu had allowed. Meluha, or the Black Land, was its name. Highland trees thrived there, and water was abundant. Large bulls roamed its river reeds, and its livestock was many. Silver flowed from its mountains, and its copper was as gleaming as gold. After Asa's death, Enki's preference for Dumuzi was exceptional. His younger brother, Marduk, was envious. Enlil sat beside Inanna's cradle while her parents, Nana and Ningal, doted on her. She is beyond description beautiful and competed in martial arts with Anunnaki heroes. She learnt about celestial travel and starships from her brother Utu. The Anunnaki gifted her with a skyship to explore the skies of Earth. After the deluge, Dumuzi and Inanna looked at one another on the landing platform. At the dedication of the artificial mounts, they had a cordial meeting. He was a member of Enki's tribe, and she was a descendant of Enlil. When Ninhasag brought the warring clans together for peace, Inanna and Dumuzi could declare their love for one another while remaining apart. As they walked along, they exchanged seductively lovely words of love. They lay down side by side, each heart conversing with the other. Dumuzi extended his arm around her waist like a mad bull to seize her. He desired, Allow me to educate you. Let me instruct you, Inanna Dumuzi stated. She kissed him gently before asking him what story she might tell her mother. What would you say to Ningal? Let us of our love, my mother adds, be perfumed with cedar oil of gladness. The couple went to the residence of Inanna's mother, Ningal. The benediction of Ningal granted Dumuzi, Inanna's mother, their permission. You are worthy, Lord Dumuzi, as the son-in-law of Nana. To him she said that Dumuzi's selection as Nana's husband was welcomed, and Inanna's brother Utu exclaimed, Let it be so. When Dumuzi informed his father and brothers about his love and engagement, Enki's crusade for peace via marriage was on his mind, and he blessed Dumuzi. Promoting peace among clans will in fact bring. Dumuzi's brothers, except Marduk, were delighted about the engagement. Enlil addressed them all. Gibil fashioned a bed of gold for the wedding, while Nergal provided lapis stones in shades of blue. Inanna's favourite fruit, dates, were stacked near the bed. The lapis beads were concealed under the fruit for Inanna to uncover. As was the tradition, a lady called Geshtinana, a sister-in-law to be, was sent to Inanna, a sister of Dumuzi, to perfume and dress her. Inanna was told what was in her heart about her future with Dumuzi, and she said, I see a vision of a great country. Dumuzi will become a great Anunnaki. His name shall be elevated above all others, and I will be his queenly bride. Together we shall share royal rank and subjugate rebellious nations. I will award Dumuzi status and govern the nation appropriately. Geshtinana imparted Inanna's ideas of leadership and splendor to her brother Marduk, as recorded. Marduk was very troubled by Inanna's aspirations and Geshtinana was informed of a hidden scheme. Geshtinana went to her brother Dumuzi's herder's residence. Be beautiful and fragrant before you sleep with your young bride in your arms, she advised her brother Dumuzi. Your sister must produce a legal heir for you. The son of Inanna will not inherit. He will not be nurtured on your mother's knees. She took his hand in hers and crushed her body against his. With you, my brother, I shall lay down. We'll pair you with an Enki peer, groom. Thus, Geshtinana explained to Dumuzi, 
a magnificent offspring from her womb. De Muzi put the sperm into her womb, and while she massaged him, he fell asleep. De Muzi had a nightmare of his own demise, in which he saw seven terrible bandits approaching his house. The master has sent for you, Uta's son. They spoke to him. They chased away his ewes, lambs, and children. They expelled them. They removed his lordship's headgear and stripped him of his regal robe. They seized the shepherd's stick and shattered it, and they flung his cup from its hook. They captured him nude and barefoot and fettered his wrists. They left him to perish in the name of the royal bird and the falcon. Demuzi awakened in the middle of the night to inform Geshtinana about his disturbing dream. The dream is not auspicious. Geshtinana addressed the troubled Demuzi. Marduk will accuse you of committing crimes on me, and he will send you harm. To test and embarrass you, he will order the dissolution of your relationship with an Enlilite. As a wounded animal, Demuzi screamed, Betrayal! Betrayal! Help me, Utu, Inanna's brother. He sent a message. As a talisman, he spoke his father's name, Enki. Damuzi fled across the desert of Emush, also known as the Desert of the Snakes. To escape the evildoers, he fled to a location with powerful waterfalls. Damuzi slipped and fell where swift water had smoothed the slick rocks. The swift currents carried away his dead corpse in white foam, evil emissaries to a rescue. This describes Inanna's descent to the lower Abzu, and the great Anunnaki war, and how Marduk was alive imprisoned in Ekur. Ninagal recovered Damuzi's dead corpse from the waves of the big lake, and transported it to the lower Abzu, the residence of Nergal and Ereshkigal. On a stone slab stood the corpse of Enki's son, Demusi. Enki changed his clothing and applied ash on his forehead when he received news of what had transpired. My kid, my son, he cried out to Demusi. He pondered aloud, What did I do to deserve this? When I landed on earth from Nibiru, I was Ea, he whose home is waters. The heavenly chariots derived their propulsion from water. I splashed down in the water. The earth was then covered by a water avalanche. Asa, my grandson, perished in the water. My beloved Demuzi also died in the sea. I had performed every action for moral motives. Why have the gods conspired against me? Why am I being punished? Enki grieved and mourned as well. Enki's anguish grew as Geshtinana confirmed the authenticity of the events. Now Marduk, my firstborn, will pay for his act. Concerned and distressed by Demuzi's abduction and death, Inanna hastened to Lower Abzu to recover and bury Demuzi's remains. When her sister Ereshkigal discovered that Inanna had arrived at the precinct's gates, she believed she was plotting something nefarious. At each of the seven gates, one of Inanna's accessories and weapons was plucked from her body. Then, naked and helpless before Ereshkigar's throne, Nergal, Demuzi's brother, accused her of plotting an heir. Ereshkigar, trembling with rage, refused to listen to her sister's explanations. Let unleash sixty diseases on her. Namta, the vizier of Ereshkigar, commanded Nana to alert Enlil of Inanna's absence in Lower Abzu and Enlil sent the information to Enki. From Nergal's son, Ereshkigal's husband, and Enki, it was revealed what had occurred. Two agents of the Abzu, Enki fashioned bloodless creatures immune to the death rays out of clay. He dispatched them to Lower Abzu and instructed Inanna to bring them back, living or dead. Surprised by their appearance, Ereshkigal said, are you Anunnaki? When they appeared before her, are you off the planet? She inquired of them with confusion. Namta directed powerful magical weapons at them, but they were unhurt. He led them to Inanna's dead corpse, which hung on a stake. On the body, 
clay emissaries guided a pulsar and an emitter. Then she was showered with the water of life, and a live plant was put in her mouth. Inanna then moved, her eyes opened, and she emerged from the dead. When Inanna's two messengers from the upper world were prepared to return, she delivered them to Muzi's dead corpse. Her accessories and qualities were restored to Inanna at the seven gates of Lower Abzu. To the home of Dumuzi in the Black Land, the lover of her youth, to deliver the envoys she had commanded. There they cleaned him with pure water, anointed him with delicious oil, clothed him in a scarlet robe, and lay him on a slab of lapis. Then, when the day of ascension comes, provide a resting spot for him in the rocks. As for herself, she went to Enki Inanna's residence. She sought revenge for losing her lover, especially the killing of the offender Marduk. Marduk was a provocateur, but he was not a murderer. Enki said that there had already been enough death. When Inanna discovered that Enki would not punish Marduk, she went to her parents and brother. She waved justice down from above. Revenge, she wailed for Marduk's demise. Enlil's sons Inanna and Utu joined him at his home, where they convened a war council. Ninurta, beaten by the rebel Anzu, urged for strong measures. Utu told them about the secret dialogue between Marduk and the Igigi. Marduk, a wicked snake, must be eliminated from the earth. Enlil and both parties agreed. When Enki's father demanded Marduk's surrender, Enki proceeded to his father's residence, where Marduk and the other sons were summoned. Though I am still mourning over my darling Damuzi, I must protect Marduk's rights. Damuzi perished by happenstance, not by Marduk's hand, even though Marduk was responsible for the evil. Marduk is my firstborn, Ninki is his mother, and he is destined for the throne. We must all defend him from Ninurta's gang, so said Enki. Only Gibil and Ninagal answered their father's call. Ningish Zida was opposed, and Nergal said, Only if he is in deadly peril would I assist. The two clans, after that, engaged in a conflict of undetermined severity. In contrast to the war between earthling ancestors Horon and Satu, it was a conflict between the Anunnaki, some of whom were born on Nibiru, broke out on another planet. Inanna launched the conflict by crossing into the realms of Enki's sons in her skyship. She challenged Marduk to war and chased him to Ninigal and Gibil's territories. Ishgur unleashed an aerial attack consisting of blazing lightning and crashing thunder to shield Ninurta from the savage beams of his stormbird at the enemy's strongholds. He removed fish from the Abzu's rivers and scattered livestock over the countryside. Then Marduk fled to the north, where the artifices were located. Ninurta chased him while pouring venomous missiles on the settlements. His weapon separates the inhabitants of these regions, stripping them of their faculties. Blood stained the canals of the river, and Ishgur's brightness transformed the night's blackness into fiery days. As the deadly wars in the north approached, Marduk took refuge in the Ekur, Gibil fashioned an invisible shield for it, and Nergal elevated his all-seeing eye to the heavens. Horon arrived to protect his grandpa, but her brilliance destroyed his right eye. While Utu the Igigi and his army of earthlings beyond Tilman resisted, the Anunnaki fought at the base of the artifacts with clans backing them. Let Marduk submit, let the bloodletting halt, let brother converse with brother. The words of Enlil and Enki delivered the same message. Enki Ninhasag was sent a message. Marduk continued to resist his pursuers in his refuge, the Ekur and the house, which served as his mountainous last stand. The smooth walls of the large stone edifice prevented Inanna from scaling it, as her weapons were deflected, who may mediate alongside Inanna. 
wearing a robe of atonement, grant life to the Lord Marduk, she implored. Let his lowly existence remain, he will renounce power. Inanna was not appeased. The perpetrator of my beloved's killing must perish, Inanna responded. Marduk must be punished, his killing is not merited. The mediator Ninhasag told the brothers Enki and Enlil, Permit Marduk to dwell in exile. Ninurta should ascend to the throne on earth. Enlil was happy and grinning as she spoke. He was Ninurta's father, and she was Ninurta's mother. If the decision is between succession and life, what can I as a parent say? Enki responded with a sorrowful heart. Desolation is pervasive in my country. Fighting must cease. I am still grieving for Demuzi. Let Marduk live in exile. If peace is to be restored and Marduk is to survive, binding agreements must be reached. Enlil talked to Enki. All facilities connecting heaven and earth must be placed under my complete care. It would be ideal if you bequeathed the land of the two narrows to one of your other sons. Marduk must relinquish Igigi and evacuate the landing site. Marduk must be sent to the land of no return, where there are no descendants of Ziusudra. As intended, Enlil said with power, Be first among your brothers. The Ekur interior is only familiar with Ningishzida. Let him rule over its country. Enki recognized the hand of destiny in his heart and said, Let it be. He said this while bowing his head. After the great Anunnaki had stated their conclusions, Ningish Zida praised them for the assistance they had provided. His difficulty was to liberate Marduk from the blocked and shut bowels. It was beyond his grasp to liberate someone alive but buried. Ningish Zida, the Ekur's hidden plans, considered how to avoid the obstructions he had created. Through an upward entrance carved out of stone, Marduk will be freed. He addressed the leaders with these words. At a location I will show them, they will chisel a gateway in the stones and then dig a winding path upward to create a rescue shaft. They will proceed via concealed hollows inside the Ekur. At the centre of the stone's hollowings they will burst through a portal to the inside that they will detonate to circumvent the obstruction, they will proceed along the great gallery while elevating three stone barriers. They will reach the topmost room, the death prison of Marduk. The Anunnaki, directed by Ningishzida, subsequently executed his planned strategy. The entrance they created, the rescue tunnel they fashioned, the insides of the manufactured mountain they reached, and the exit they blasted out were all created using equipment that fractured the stones. They reached the highest room by navigating around the three impeding stones. The guard rails were elevated on a small platform, and fainting Marduk was rescued. The Lord sank himself slowly into the twisted shaft, carrying fresh air. Outside, the wives and dads of Sapanit and Nabu anticipated a joyous reunion. When Marduk's father Enki informed him of the conditions of his release, Marduk was enraged. I would sooner die than give up my birthright, he yelled. Sapanit was thrown into his arms by Nabu. She said, We're a part of your future. Marduk was enraged. He was humiliated. To fate I submit he whispered. He travelled with Sapanit and Nabu to the land of no return. He accompanied his wife and kid to a location where horned animals are hunted. After Marduk had departed, Ninurta the Ekur re-entered the shaft and followed a horizontal path to the Ekur's vulva. Red light emanates from a carved alcove on the east wall, where the destiny stone sparkles. It loses its power to murder me. It loses its killing track. Ninurta wept inside the room. Take it away, to eradicate it. 
It must be destroyed. Ninurta exclaimed to his lieutenants. Ninurta retraced through the grand gallery until he reached the highest room. The net force of the Ekua's heart was split into five compartments inside its hollowed-out chest. Ninurta hit the stone chest with his club, causing it to emit a resonant sound. Ninurta commanded that the Gug stone be transported to a place of his choice after determining its path. As Ninurta descended the grand gallery, he inspected the twenty-seven pairs of Nibiru crystals. Some of his battles with Marduk were undamaged, but many still needed to be. Ninurta ordered that the entire ones be extracted from their grooves, while the others were pulverized by his beam. Outside the house, Ninurta flew on his blackbird, his gaze focused on the apex stone marking the enemy's summit. Using his weapon, he shook it free, and its fragments tumbled. This eliminates Marduk's fear permanently. The winner Ninurta is announced. Ninurta praised the gathering of Anunnaki on the battlefield, declaring, Like Anu, you are created. They roared at their commander and hero. The crippled beacon was replaced by a mount at the place of the celestial chariots. Within its interior, the repurposed crystals were reorganized. The Gug stone, the stone of directing, was erected on its summit. Mount Mashu, also known as Mount of the Supreme Celestial Bark, was where Enlil, Ninlil, and Ninhasag summoned their three sons. The conditions for commands over ancient lands to affirm and lordships over new regions to assign were satisfied. Ninurta, whom Anzu and Marduk had defeated, was given Enlil ship powers in all areas where his father's surrogate existed. Ishgur was awarded the lordship of the landing place in the Cedar Mountains and the landing place was added to his northern dominion. The regions to the south and east, where the Igigi's descendants had extended, were handed to Nana by his successors and supporters as an endowment to retain and hold forever. On the peninsula where the place of chariots was included in Nana's territory, Utu's status as the place's commander and the earth's core was reaffirmed. Enki delegated his sovereignty to Ningisida in the land of the Two Narrows, as arranged. Only Inanna complained. None of Enki's other sons opposed. Inanna claimed the lineage of her deceased husband, Dumuzi. She of Enki and Enlil desired independence. The Fates Decree Council led the great Anunnaki to the countries and peoples where they spoke about the earth and its resettling with Anu in response to Inanna's desires. Since the Great Flood and the Great Disaster, over two centuries have passed. The expansion of humans from mountain ranges to arid plains. Through Ziusudra, there were descendants of civilized humans with Anunnaki DNA. Offspring of Igigi, who intermarried, wandered the country. Ka'in's family survived in faraway regions. The Anunnaki who had arrived from Nibiru were rare and noble, and few were their flawless offspring. How they planned cities for themselves and earthlings to create the great Anunnaki. How to elevate humanity to ensure its survival, as well as how to make the masses submit and serve. The leaders discussed all of this and the future briefly. Anu resolved to return to Earth. He intended to travel with his wife, Antu. The description of the twelfth tablet. Plains and river valleys get repopulated when the soil dries up. Gold is abundant in the lands beyond the seas. The couple Anu and Antu came for a great visit. Reminiscing, the leaders understand that they are the instruments of fate. They split humanity into three zones of civilization. Elite lands. First region and space father Enlilite established a colony. The first region is the birthplace of the first civilization, Sumer. Marduk seizes a location to construct an unauthorized launch tower. 
Marduk, who was pardoned by the leaving Anu, remains rebellious. Infuriated by the Enlilites, Marduk takes control of the second region. He deposes Ningisida, Thuth, and banishes him to the outlying territories. He proclaims himself to be the great god Ra in a new religion. Inanna is given authority over the third region, the Indus Valley. He presents pharaonic dynasties to signal the start of a new civilization. Enlil charges his son Ishgur with safeguarding the metal supplies. Anu was determined to return to earth again with his wife Antu. In anticipation of his coming, the re-establishment of Anunnaki dwellings in Edin began. The black-headed people travelled to the ancient country from the mountainous area where Shem's ancestors resided. The Anunnaki allowed them to settle on the recently dry land and provided food for everybody. Before the flood, there stood Eridu, Enki's first city. On top of the muck and silt, the outline of a new Eridu was drawn. In the centre on a high platform, the house of the Tile Lord, whose return is triumphant, was constructed for Enki and Ninki. Enki's sons supplied gold, silver and precious metals for ornamentation. Above, the signs of the twelve constellations were depicted in a circle pointing upward. Similar to the Abzu, fish-filled waters were flowing below. Enki safeguards the Emi formulae in a sanctuary that no unauthorized individual may penetrate. For Enmil and Ninlil, a new Nibru key was constructed on the muck and silt. A holy area was surrounded by walls in the midst of its people's residences, cattle folds and stables. A residence for Enlil and Ninlil was erected there. It arose in seven steps, with a staircase ascending to the highest platform as high as heaven. Enlil held his tablets of fate guarded by his weapons, the raised eye that surveys the plains and the raised beam penetrating everything. Enlil's swift skybird was housed in its cage in the courtyard. As the time for the arrival of Anu and Antu approached, a new location, neither Enlil's nor Enki's, was chosen for their stay in Edin. Unuk Ki, or the delightful place, was its name. Shade trees were erected in it. Its centre stood a spotless white edifice, the House of Anu. The outside of the building rose in seven steps, and the inside was suitable for a king. The heavenly chariot of Anu was directed to a safe landing at the place of the chariots in Tilmun by Anunnaki skyships when it landed on Earth. Commander Utu welcomed his great-grandparents to the planet Earth. Enlil, Enki and Ninhasag, the three offspring of Anu, waited there to meet him. They hugged and kissed, laughed and shed tears. How long have they been apart? They continued to speak to one another. They examined their ageing as they looked at each other. However, the parents in Shahs seemed younger than the children. The two boys were aged and beardless, while Ninhasag, a former beauty, was stooped and wrinkled. Joyful and sombre tears flooded the eyes of each of the five individuals. The guests and hosts of the Edin were transported on skyships. The skyships landed at a designated area near Unuk Ki. All the Anunnaki who had remained on earth as honor guards were standing. Salu and greetings, Salu and greetings. Anu and Antu were yelling in unison. The visitors then joined the Anunnaki at the house of Anu in a procession that included singing and music. Anu cleaned and slept in the house of Anu before being perfumed and dressed. Female Anunnaki took Antu to the house of the golden bed. There, she also cleaned and slept before being perfumed and dressed. Anu and Antu sat on thrones in the open courtyard while a wind rustled the leaves of the trees. Enlil, Enki and Ninhasag boarded them. 
Others were cooking a bull and a ram, gifts from Enlil and Enki over an open fire in the corner of a courtyard. Anu and Antu were treated to a lavish meal in anticipation of a sign from the skies that their reign was about to commence. Enlil instructed Zumul, versed about the stars and planets, to comply. The ascending stairs of the house of Anu announced the evening ascent of the planets. In the first stage, Kishar emerged in the eastern sky. In the second step, Lahamu appeared. Mumu was declared from the third step, Anshar from the fourth step, Lamu from the fifth step, and the moon from the sixth step. Then, in response to a signal from Zumul, the song, The Planet of Anu Arises in the Heavens, was performed. From the top step, the seventh planet Nibiru, with its crimson aura, became visible. The Anunnaki clapped and danced to music. To music, they danced and sang. To the one who gets brighter, the celestial planet of Lord Anu, they have sung. At the indicated time, a bonfire was ignited. Before the night's end, bonfires were visible everywhere. The whole country of Edin was illuminated with bonfires. All of the Anunnaki were thanked by Anu and Antu as they were escorted to their sleeping chambers after a banquet of beef, lamb, fish and fowl accompanied by wine and beer. Anu and Antu slept for many earth days and nights. His two sons and daughter were called on the sixth day. He listened to their descriptions of what had occurred on earth, including conflict and peace. Enlil informed Anu about the finding of gold in the country beyond the seas and the location of the chariot there, as well as how the earthlings had multiplied despite Enlil's vow to destroy them. It was Galzu Enki's dream and tablet to his father. Anu was immensely perplexed. I have never sent a secret envoy with that name to earth. Therefore Anu notified the three leaders. Enki and Enlil were confused and stared at one another. Enki said, Thanks to Galzu's Yusudra, the germ of life was preserved. Due to Galzu's presence on earth, we stayed. Enlil communicated this to his father. Galzu states that you will perish the day you return to Nibiru. Anu was bewildered. The cycle shift had wreaked havoc, yet it was treatable with elixirs. Whose messenger was Galzu, if not yours? Enki and Enlil expressed the same sentiments. Who wants to preserve humanity, and who compelled us to remain? Slowly, Ninhasag bowed his head. For the All-Creator, Galzu appeared. That makes me wonder, was the creation of humans also predetermined? They stayed quiet for some while, each reflecting on previous occurrences in his head. While destinies were predetermined, fate controlled every move, so stated Anu. The intent of the All-Creator is unambiguous. We are only ambassadors on earth and for earthlings. The earth belongs to its inhabitants. We were established to defend and develop their interests. Let us behave appropriately if this is our objective, so said Enki. The powerful Anunnaki, to whom destiny had prescribed land-related advice, the great Anunnaki chose to establish civilized zones and bestowed humanity with knowledge. Man's cities will be utilized to construct holy areas and dwellings for the Anunnaki. As on Nibiru, establish and confer the crown and scepter onto a selected individual. According to him, the Anunnaki's words to the people impart labor and skill to impose. In the holy precincts, a priesthood was founded to establish the Anunnaki as aristocratic rulers to serve and adore. Secret information must be conveyed to civilization. The Anunnaki built four regions, three for humankind and one for prohibited. The first territory in ancient Edinland to establish itself as Enlil and his son's fortress. 
The second area is to be ruled by Enki and his sons in the land of the Two Narrows. The third, unique territory in a faraway nation that will be bestowed by Inanna. The peninsula of the Place of Chariots will be the fourth location, exclusively inhabited by the Anunnaki. This is the narrative of Anu's travel to the countries beyond the seas and the re-establishment of Anunnaki cities in the first region. Anu inquired about his grandson Marduk after he decided on the four areas and the human civilizations. I gotta see him again. I have provoked Marduk's fury by inviting Damuzi and Ningizida to Nibiru, Anu told the chiefs. Therefore, Anu pondered, desiring to rethink Marduk's punishment. You will be informed that Marduk will be waiting for you when you journey to the regions beyond the waters. These are the regions of the earth where he roams, so said Enlil to Anu. Before travelling to distant places, the royal pair visited Edin and its territories, which were assessed by Anu and Antu. They travelled to Eridu and Nibruki to see the projected locations of the first region's cities. Enki keeps the ME formula to himself. Enki protested to Enlil in Eridu. Anu, who was seated in the place of honour, complimented Enki. My son constructed a wonderful home for himself on a high platform. Enki will convey superior wisdom to the individuals who surround and serve the house. Now that the ME's knowledge has been concealed, it must be shared with other Anunnaki. Enki was humiliated. He offered Anu access to all holy formulae. In subsequent days, Anu and Antu surveyed the other locations using skyships. The royal couple returned to Unug Ki for one more night of relaxation on the seventeenth day. The next day, when the younger Anunnaki appeared before Anu and Antu for a blessing, Anu embraced and kissed his great-granddaughter Inanna. Please listen carefully to what I say. After we go, this place will be Inanna's dowry, he told the assembled crowd. Let the ship that the earth will use to journey to Inanna be my gift. Inanna, thrilled, proceeded to dance and sing. Her admiration for Anu would eventually become hymns. Enlil, Enki, Ninurta and Ishkur followed Anu and Antu to the Golden Region, after which the Anunnaki said their farewells. Ninurta built a residence for Anu and Antu to impress Anu, the king with immense gold wealth. Its stone blocks, which were precisely carved and contained pure gold, were covered. The royal pair were greeted with a golden cage covered with sculpted flowers of carnelian stones. The residence was constructed on the coast of a vast alpine lake. Visitors were taught how to harvest gold nuggets. There is enough gold here for many shahs to arrive, Anu pleased said. Near Ninurta, Anu and Antu, a manufactured mound was seen. Ninurta described the creation of a location for melting and purifying metals. He showed how a new metal, Anak, developed by the Anunnaki, was mined from stones. He demonstrated this by mixing it with plentiful copper to create a robust metal. Anu and Antu sailed on the massive lake from which the metal sprang. The lake of Anak Anu was its name after that. This was its name. Then, from places in the north, where spectacular horned monsters are sought, Marduk accompanied his father Enki and his grandpa Anu before the arrival of his son Nabu. When Enki inquired about Sarponit, Marduk described the tragedy of her passing. Now only Nabu and I have remained, Marduk remarked to his father and grandpa. You have been punished enough. Anu Marduk pushed against his chest. He responded to him, With his right hand on Marduk's head, Anu Marduk is blessed and pardoned. Everyone who had congregated in the plain below left the golden mountaintop location. 
Inurta has prepared a new horizon-spanning place for the chariots. There stood Anu and Antu's heavenly chariot, filled with wealth. As the moment of departure approached, Anu offered his children words of farewell and advice. Let the destiny of the earth and its inhabitants be whatever it may be. If humanity and not the Anunnaki is meant to inherit the earth, then let fate aid us. Give humankind information, teach them in part the mysteries of heaven and earth, instruct them in the precepts of justice and righteousness, and then disappear. Anu also provided his children with fatherly counsel. Anu and Antu for Nibiru clasped, embraced, and kissed once more before departing from the location of the new chariots. What is this new place of celestial chariots? shouted Marduk, the first to break the solemn hush indignantly. He requested an explanation from the others. What transpired without my awareness after my exile? When Enki told Marduk of the judgments about the four territories, Marduk's rage had no bounds. Why would Inanna, who was responsible for Damuzi's demise, have her own region? The choices are final and cannot be changed. Enlil relayed the same message to Marduk. They returned to Edin and the neighboring areas in different airships. To celebrate Anu's arrival, a new measure of time was introduced. Earth years, not Nibiru Shars, were used to track events on Earth. The beginning of the Earth's years was devoted to Enlil in the Age of the Bull. Enlil Ishgur was instructed to remain behind and retain the gold watch after sensing danger. When the leaders returned to Edin, the initial location of civilization, the Anunnaki taught the Earthlings how to produce mud bricks and construct cities. However, where only the Anunnaki initially dwelt, towns for the Anunnaki and humans formed. There, as well as in the new towns where the spectacular Anunnaki holy precincts were consecrated, the Anunnaki were given high dwellings that humans called temples. There the Anunnaki were revered and served as noble lords. The number of their ranks reflected their status as successors to humanity. Anu the Celestial had the rank of sixty. Enlil was awarded the rank of fifty and he gave the same status to Ninurta, his oldest son. Lord Enki, who had the rank of forty, was the next in line. Assigned to Nana, the son of Enlil and Ninlil, was the rank of thirty. Utu, his son and successor, was given the rank of twenty, while the other Anunnaki chief's sons were given the rank of ten. Ranks by the fives were divided between the female Anunnaki and their partners. When Eridu, Nibru, Ki and their temple abodes were finished, the Girsu enclosure for Ninurta was constructed in Lagash, where his black skybird was housed. Eninu, also known as the House of Fifty, was the temple residence of Ninurta and his wife Bau. The weapons provided by Anu, the Eninu, the Supreme Hunter and Supreme Smiter were preserved. On top of the mudslide Utu, a new Sippar was created, where Sippar had been before the deluge. The Ibaba, the Shining House, was constructed as a residence for Utu and his wife Aya. Utu created the rules of justice for humanity. Due to the silt, the original designs could not be implemented, and alternative locations were selected. Adab, a nearby location in Shurubak, was created as a new center for Ninhasag. Her temple dwelling was known as the House of Help and Healing Knowledge, and the MEs detailing the creation of earthlings were housed in its hallowed shrine. Urim was the name of the city with straight streets, canals, and wharves built for Nana. Its temple was the House of the Throne's Seed, and its rays touched the countries it reflected. Ishgur returned to the northern mountainous regions where he founded the House of Seven Storms. This was the first city of humans and the first monarchy on earth. Inanna resided at Unuk-ki, the residence granted to her by Anu. Marduk and Nabu resided in Eridu, 
but needed separate dwellings in Edin, and how Marduk planned to construct a tower and why the Emis took Inanna. In the first region, the Edin lands and the cities with precincts, the Anunnaki rulers instructed the earthlings in the arts and crafts. Before long, the fields were irrigated and boats sailed on the canal and river. The sheepfolds and granaries were overflowing, and the area was prosperous. Ki Engi, land of the lofty watchers, was the name given to the first region. The decision was then made to give the black-headed people their own city, which was named Kishi, Scepter City, and it was at Kishi that man's reign started. Anu and Enlil, the heavenly bright object, are embedded in sanctified soil. Ninurta was the first king to be chosen, and his regal title was Mighty Man. Ninurta travelled to Eridu with the ME tablets for kingship divine formulae she got from Enki to transform it into a centre of civilization for humanity. Ninurta Eridu arrived respectfully and appropriately attired. He inquired about the Emmy of kingship, and Enki, the deity who supplied all of the Emmy's protections, handed Ninurta fifty Emmy. In Kishi, the black-headed people who need to compute numbers are instructed by Heavenly Nisaba, and Heavenly Ninkashi teaches them how to brew beer. Under Ninurta's leadership, kiln construction and blacksmithing flourished in Kishi. The first wheeled carts pulled by male asses were created in Kishi. In Kishi, laws of justice and virtuous behavior were created. The people of Kishi produced praise songs for Ninurta, in which they chanted his great acts, conquests, and the awe-inspiring blackbird. How he subjugated bison in distant places and found white metal as a copper alloying agent. It was Ninurta's moment of glory, and he was honoured with the archer's constellation. Inanna in Unugki, her dominion in the third region, anticipated her arrival the whole time. She desired the domain of her own commanders throughout. The third area will arrive after the second. Thus her leaders gave her reassurance. Inanna planned a strategy to receive the ME from Enki after seeing Ninurta and Eridu's travels and how the ME of kingship was acquired. She sent her chambermaid Ninshubur to alert Eridu of Inanna's arrival. During the hearing, Enki issued orders to Isimud, his housemaster, as follows. The damsel is travelling alone to my city of Eridu. My inner chambers will admit her upon her solo arrival. Serve her barley cakes with butter and cold water to revive her heart. Prepare the sweet wine. Fill the beer glasses to the brim. As Inanna alone visited Enki's dwelling, Isimud Enki's directions were carried out. When Enki was welcomed by Inanna's beauty, he was awestruck. Inanna was adorned with jewels. Her thin garment displayed her body. When she bowed, Enki admired her vulva. They drank everything from sweet wine to beer from wine glasses during the tournament. Inanna baited Enki. I was hoping you could show me the M.E.s. Give me a M.E. in my palm. Enki to Inanna M.E.s to hold on seven times throughout the competition. Enki to Inanna M.E.s to hold on the divine formulas for lordship and kingship, priesthood and scribes, love dressing and warring. M.E.s to Inanna Enki to hold on, for music and singing, woodworking, metalworking and precious stones. Enki and Inanna provided ninety-four M.E.s. Inanna sneaked away from Enki as he slept, clutching her spoils securely in her hands. She hurried to her boat of heaven and instructed her pilot to take off. When Isimud awakened Enki from his sleep, Enki commanded Isimud, Get hold of Inanna. Enki discovered through Isimud that Inanna had already departed in her heavenly boat. 
he instructed Isimud to pursue Inanna aboard Enki's airship. You must retrieve every M.E., he instructed. Inanna's boat of heaven was stopped as Unogki Isimud arrived, compelling her to return to Eridu and face Enki's anger, which he had made her confront. When Inanna was restored to Eridu, however, the Emmys accompanying her were absent. She entrusted them to her chambermaid, Ninshubur, who carried them to the house of Anu in Unuki. I compel your return in the name of my authority and my father, Anu. Enki became enraged and accused Inanna of being a prisoner in his home. Eridu contacted his brother after Enlil's announcement. I was entitled to the Emmys, and Enki delivered them to me. Therefore Inanna informed Enlil, and Enki quietly confessed the truth. When the tenure of Kishi expires, the Unugki throne will depart. So did Enlil proclaim. When Marduk learned of all of this, he became outraged beyond measure. Enough of my disgrace, Enki Marduk shouted his father's name. He desired from Enlil a holy city of his own in Edin. Enlil's disregard for Marduk's pleading placed Marduk's destiny in his own hands. Before Unugki was selected, Nabu the Agigi and their descendants from their dispersion areas were called to a place considered for Anu's entrance. There is a holy city where Marduk might erect his skyships. When his disciples arrived at the construction site with stones, they found that Marduk had shown how to produce bricks and burn them in a fire to use as stones. They were building a tower whose top could be seen from the skies. Enlil raced to the scene to foil the plot, hoping to soothe Marduk with reassuring words. Enlil attempted to halt Marduk and Nabu, but was unsuccessful. In Nibru Ki, Enlil, his sons and grandkids gathered, and they deliberated on a course of action. Marduk is building an unauthorized entrance to heaven, which he entrusts to humans. Thus spoke Enlil to his children and grandkids. If we allow this to occur, every problem facing humanity will be addressed. This terrible scheme must be thwarted. Everyone agreed with Ninurta's claim. The Enlilite Anunnaki came overnight from Nibru Ki. Their skyships showered fire and brimstone down on the high tower, destroying it and the whole encampment. Then Enlil planned to disperse the leader and his followers, leading their councils and oneness to become muddled. Enlil decreed, Until now all earthlings spoke a single tongue, they all spoke the same language. I will have to explain their language so they do not comprehend one another. These events occurred in the 310th year since the Earth's year count started. He gave the inhabitants of each location and territory a distinct language. Then one was assigned a writing style the others could not comprehend. Kishi was controlled by 23 kings for 408 years during which time it was known as the Scepter City. Itana, a loving king, was also transported to paradise in Kishi. The heavenly bright object from Kishi was moved to its soil. At the appointed moment, hand over the kingdom of Unuki, Enlil made the same choice. When the verdict was revealed, the people sang a eulogy to Inanna. Lady of Emmys, Queen, vividly radiant, righteous, clothed in brilliance, beloved of heaven and earth, sanctified by Anu's love, wearing tremendous adorations, seven times the Emmy she gained are now in her hands. They are suitable for the tiara of monarchy, the high priesthood, and the lady of the great Emmys, whose protector she is. Unug Ki ascended to the throne of the first region in the 409th year after the earth year count started. Son of Utu, its first king, was the chief priest of the Ayana temple dwelling. 
As for Marduk, he travelled to the land of the Two Narrows, where he anticipated establishing himself as the ruler of the second region. This explains the establishment of the second and third regions, the exile of Ningishzida, and the danger to Unuk Ki Arata. When Marduk returned to the land of the Two Narrows after a lengthy absence, he discovered Ningishzida as its lord, the imposing lord Ningishzida. Ningishzida controlled the regions with the assistance of the descendants of the Anunnaki, whom the earthlings revered. Marduk of Ningishzida requested information. What Marduk had planned and directed Ningishzida to undertake was undone. What is it that happened? Marduk Ningishzida accused the destruction of hidden things of causing Horon to go to a desert area, a place without water, a vast place where joys are not experienced. The two brothers caused a stir by quarrelling fiercely. Pay notice, I am here in my appropriate position, Marduk told Ningishzida. You have assumed my position. From now on, you can only serve as my delegate. However, if you are inclined to revolt, you must leave the country. On earth, the brothers from the land of the Two Narrows argued for 350 years. 350 years of anarchy ensued, and the country was split among the brothers until Enki, their father, said to Ningishzida, For the sake of peace, go to other regions. Ningishzida decided to go to a place beyond the seas, and he did so with a band of followers. Approximately 650 earth years had passed at the time. But a fresh count started in the new kingdom, where Ningishzida, the winged serpent, was known. In the land of the Two Narrows, the second region under the dominion of Marduk was founded. In the chronicles of the first region, it was known as Magon, the land of the cascading river. Hemtar, also known as the dark brown region, was the name given to the land when the inhabitants of the second region muddled their languages. The new language was used by Niteru, the guardian watchers, and the Anunnaki. Marduk was honoured as Ra, the bright one, while Enki was honoured as Ptah, the builder. Ningishzida, also known as Tehuti, the divine measurer, was recalled. Ra on the stone lion had his picture changed with that of his son Asa to obliterate his memory. Ra, the people, instructed them to count by tens rather than by sixty. He divided the year by tens as well, and he substituted moon-gazing with sun-watching. Under Tehuti's rule, the ancient north and south cities were restored, but Marduk-Ra merged the north and south into a single crown city. Mena was the name given to the offspring of Niteru and an earthling-appointed ruler. Scepter City, Ra is founded at the point where two lands meet, and a large river splits. To exceed Kishi in the first area, he dubbed it mena Nefer also known as Mena's Beauty. It was called Splendor. Ra constructed a sacred city to honour his elders, naming it after Nibiru's ruler, Anu. On a platform, he constructed a temple dwelling for his father, Enki Ptah. Inside a tall tower, its hair descended like a pointed rocket towards the sky. Ra put the top section of his celestial barge, Ben-Ben, at its temple, where he had journeyed from the planet of countless years. As high priest, on New Year's Day, the king presided over the rites. He entered the deepest star room before the Ben-Ben offerings he put on that day alone. Patar to Ra gifted the second region with a variety of MEs. The father and son asked questions. What is it that I know that you do not? Then he gave Ra all knowledge except the resuscitation of the dead. As the most powerful among the twelve celestials, Batar was allotted the constellation Ram. 
The water flow of Hapi, the land's major river, and Batar for Ra and his people was managed. Abundance in the lush soil swiftly arrived, and man and animals thrived. Invigorated by the success of the second region, the leaders built the third region. They proclaimed it to be in Nana's kingdom, as she had been promised. She was granted a constellation to befit Sir Regent's ruler. She and her brother Utu had previously shared the station of the twins. As a result, Ninhasag bestowed Inanna her maiden constellation as a gift. According to the Earth Year Reckoning, Inanna was honoured in 861 BCE. Far distant in the eastern territories, beyond seven mountain ranges, lay the third region, Zomush. The land of sixty precious stones was its highland domain. The inhabitants of Arata, the wooded realm, grew grain crops and horned cowherds in a large river valley with a winding course. They constructed two towns from mud bricks and stocked them with grain silos. Following Enlil's command, Lord Enki, Lord of Wisdom, became king. A new language and writing system were developed for the third region. A previously unknown human language established by Arata Enki in his wisdom. But the Emmys of the third area's civilized kingdoms, Enki did not grant Inanna permission to share Unugki's discoveries with the new region. So did Enki announce. In Arata, Inanna chose a shepherd chief comparable to her cherished Dumuzi. In her skyship from Unugki to Arata, Inanna travelled through mountains and valleys. She cherished Zomush's rare stones and brought Unugki genuine lapis lazuli. Enmerkar, the second king of Unugki, ruled during the time. He enlarged Unug borders, and Ki's and Inanna's status was elevated as a result. He desired Arata's riches and sought to dominate Arata. An ambassador sent to Arata in Merkar as a homage to Arata's riches. The envoy to Arata traversed seven mountain ranges and barren, rain-soaked regions. He relayed in Merkar's demand to the king of Arata word for word. The monarch of Arata had difficulty understanding his speech. The envoy was presented with an engraved wooden scepter by the king of Arata. To share Unugki's MEs with Arata, as asked by the king's letter, grains were put onto donkeys and sent with the ambassador to Unugki as a royal gift. When Enmekar, the scepter with an inscription, was received, its message in Unugki had to be deciphered. He said, What type of wood is this? He drew it out from light to darkness and from darkness to light. Then he had it planted in the orderly garden. After five years, ten years had passed, and a tree had grown from the scepter. What am I to do? Enmerkar contacted his grandpa Utu out of frustration. Utu interceded with the celestial Nisaba, the mistress of scribes and authors. On a clay tablet, his message to Nisaba was inscribed. Enmerkar was instructed, and his son Banda conveyed the word in the language of Arata. Submission or war. Inanna Arata was not abandoned, and Unugki Arata will not succumb. If Unugki wishes to battle, the king of Arata says, let two warriors engage in the fight. Better still, let's swap treasures in peace. Let Unugki trade Emmys for Arata's wealth. On the way back, conveying the message of peace, Banda became ill and lost his spirit. His teammates hoisted his lifeless neck to their shoulders. On Mount Hurum, his route to his death from Arata, Banda was abandoned. The riches of Arata, Unugki and Unugki Arata did not receive them and Arata Unuki did not gain them. In the third region, civilized humanity did not wholly flourish. Explanation of the Thirteenth Tablet Royal cities provide sanctuaries for the gods. 
demigods serve in palaces and temples as monarchs and priests. Marduk offers perpetual life to his royal servants. In Sumer, Inanna supports belief in the resurrection. The following advantages are achieved through heavenly omens and foretelling oracles. Marduk heralds the approaching age of the ram as his symbol. Ningish Zida constructs stone observatories to demonstrate the contrary. The mysterious messenger comes to Enlil and predicts a catastrophe. Insurrections, battles and invasions destabilize Enlilite countries. Enjoins Enlil to choose a good leader for survival. Enlil picks the priestly royal family scion Ibrum. Nabu's armies endeavor to conquer the spaceport. The gods use weapons of terror to dethrone Enki. Ninurta and Nergal destroy the spaceport and the Sin city. The radioactive cloud delivers death to everyone in Sumer. In the third region, civilized humanity did not ultimately flourish. Inanna disregarded the kingdoms assigned to her while she craved in her heart the realms not allotted to her. After a thousand years, when Unugki lost his throne, who could the end of the millennium or the following millennium have prophesied would succeed him? Who could have prevented the disaster? Who could have predicted that an unexpected disaster would occur in less than a third of a shah? Inanna launched the terrible end. Marduk observed while Ra and fate grew entwined, and Ninurta and Nergal delivered the incomprehensible conclusion with their own hands. Why was Inanna unhappy with the realm she was granted, and why did she refuse to forgive Marduk? On her voyage from Unugki to Arata, Inanna was restless and unsatisfied. She continued to cry for her beloved Demuzi. Her love remained unfulfilled. She saw it shimmering and enticing as she sailed through Demuzi's vision. In the dark, in dream visions, he appeared. I will return, he said. He was promising her the glory of his lard of the Two Narrows realm. In the hallowed grounds of Unugki, she erected a house of nighttime delight. On the night of their nuptials, she enticed these young Gigunu warriors with lovely words, promising them a long and happy life, and claiming that her boyfriend, Demuzi, was all she had ever desired. The next day, each was found dead in her bed. At that time, the presumed deceased hero Banda returned to Unugki. Only by the grace of Utu, whose seed he was, did Banda return from the grave. My beloved Demuzi has returned! A miracle! A miracle! Inanna shouted with delight. Banda was bathed at her house and covered with a fringed shawl. My dear Demuzi! she addressed him. Flowers adorning her bed, she enticed him there. When Banda awakened in the morning, Inanna cried, The ability to live forever is in my hands. Then Inanna chose to name herself a goddess, therefore gaining the power of immortality. Nana and Ningal, the parents of Inanna, were not happy with her pronouncement. Enlil and Ninurta were angered by what Inanna stated, although her brother Utu thought it amusing. The dead cannot return to life. Enki and Ninhasag exchanged words. In the territories of Ki Engi, the people's good fortune was lauded. The gods are among us. They can eliminate death. This was spoken by individuals to one another. Enmerkar, his father, succeeded him on the throne of Unugki Banda. He was renowned as the great man Lugal. Ninsun, the daughter of Enlil, accepted him as her husband. Gilgamesh, their son, succeeded to the throne of Unugki Lugalbanda. As the years passed and Gilgamesh grew older, he discussed life and death with his mother Ninsun. Even though his ancestors were Anunnaki, he contemplated their deaths. Do gods die? 
he questioned his mum. Even if I am two-thirds divine, must I scale the wall like a mere mortal? So he explained. As long as you remain on earth, you will be overcome by the death of an earthling, the mother said to her son. But if you are sent to Nibiru, you will dwell there for a long time. Nin Sun implored Utu, the commander, day after day to transport Gilgamesh to Nibiru. She pleaded with him, Let Gilgamesh travel to the landing site. Utu ultimately agreed. Ninhasag created a duplicate of Gilgamesh to advise and protect him. Enkidu was his name. He was not born from a mother's womb and had no blood in his veins. Utu, who followed Enkidu Gilgamesh to the landing location, used oracles to monitor the progress. At the entrance to the cedar woodland, the path of the fire-spitting monster was stopped. They deceived and destroyed the monster with their trickery. When they discovered the hidden entrance to the Anunnaki tunnels, the Bull of Heaven, an Enlil monster, greeted them with deathly snorts. The monster was pursued until the city gates of Unuki, where Enkidu fell in love. When Enlil heard this, he wailed in misery, and his cries could be heard in the sky of Anu. Enlil realized in his heart that the portent was certainly ominous. Gilgamesh was exonerated after receiving instructions from Ninsun and Utu. However, Enkidu was condemned to drown in the seas for killing the Bull of Heaven. Despite his lengthy pursuit of Nibiru, Utu let Gilgamesh travel to the place of the chariots. After numerous adventures, he reached the fourth region, the land of Tilman. He traversed its subterranean passageways and found Ziusudra in a garden filled with precious stones. The events of the flood that Ziusudra described to Gilgamesh, as well as the secret to a long life that he imparted. A plant was growing in the garden's well, which prevented Ziusudra and his bride from aging. It was unique among all plants on earth. A vigorous man could restore health by consuming it. An aged guy regains his youth. Enki bestowed a gift to humankind on the Mount of Salvation with Enlil's approval. The plant was recognized by Gilgamesh as Ziusudra. Gilgamesh bound his feet with stones as Ziusudra and his wife slept. He jumped into the well and seized and uprooted the rebirth plant. He carried the plant in his bag and sped through the tunnels to Unukki. A snake was attracted to the plant's aroma while he was exhausted and fast asleep. The plant did not steal the snake from a sleeping Gilgamesh. It disappeared along with the plant. Gilgamesh sat and sobbed upon finding his loss the following day. He returned to Unukki empty-handed, where he perished as a mere mortal. Unukki had seven additional kings after Gilgamesh, until its kingdom ended precisely when the count of one thousand earth years was accomplished. Inanna's dreams and visions related to Demuzi's dominion worried Ra. Transferred to Urim, the city of Nana and Ningal, was the kingdom of the first region. Marduk paid great attention to the events occurring in other locations. He was resolved to oppose Inanna's plans for growth. Concerning the afterlife and immortality, he found much to consider. He had a strong desire to be a deity. Thus he claimed to be a great one. Ra was furious at Gilgamesh's good fortune as an earthling, but he recognized it as a cunning strategy to maintain the devotion of kings and people. If demigods are the secret to immortality, then prove it to the rulers of my territory. Let the kings of my area, Neteru, and their descendants go to Nibiru in the afterlife, shouted Marduk, also known as Ra in the second region, who was also known as Ra. Ra issued this proclamation in his domain. 
he instructed the rulers on how to construct graves facing east. In a lengthy text written to priest scribes, he detailed the afterlife voyage. The book detailed how to get to the Duart, the place of the celestial boats, through the stairway to heaven and the imperishable planet to consume the plant of life and the waters of youth as a satiation drink. Priests were instructed on how Ra brought the gods to earth. Ra proclaimed in front of the kings. He said, Gold is the brilliance of life. This is the flesh of gods. The kings were instructed to search for gold in the Abzu and the lower domain. When Ra's monarchs captured territories that did not belong to them, he invaded his brother's domains, causing their fury to increase. What is Marduk doing? The brothers pondered as he trampled us. They pleaded with their father Enki, whereas Ra ignored Batar, his father. The kings of Mogon and Meluha, Ra instructed him to conquer all neighboring territories. His goal was to control the four regions. The whole planet is mine to control. This was his adamant statement to his father. This is the narrative of Marduk proclaiming himself dominant and erecting Babylai, Inanna, warrior kings, bloodletting, and the sanctioning of sacrilege. After Unugki transferred the throne to Urim, Nana and Ningal smiled. As the count of the moon's months in a year, Nana declared twelve festivals each year, one for each of the twelve great Anunnaki. Shrines and sanctuaries were constructed across the first region for the Anunnaki gods, big and little, so that people might worship directly to their gods. In the first region, civilization spread from Ki Engi to neighboring lands. Local rulers in the cities of Mon were known as righteous shepherds. Artisans, farmers, shepherds, and weavers traded their wares across the nation. Justice laws were enacted, and trade, marriage, and divorce contracts were upheld. Children learned and composed hymns, proverbs, and wisdom at school. There was plenty and joy in the country, but there were also disputes and intrusions. Inanna's skyship continued to go from land to land, and she played with Utu near the upper sea. She exclaimed, Dudu, darling! as she entered her uncle Ishgur's realm. Inanna dwelt among the inhabitants of the upper plain of the two rivers. She appreciated the sound of their languages and learned to speak to them. They named her Ishtar, from the planet's name in their language, Lahamu. In their tongue, he was known as Utu and was also revered. In their tongue, they pronounced Uruk, her city, as Unugki, and Dudu as Adad. Her father, Nana, was known as Sin, Lord of Oracles, and they referred to Urim city as Ur. Nippur was known as Nibru-ki, whereas father Elil was known as Enlil. In their tongue, Shumer was known as Ki-Engi, land of the lofty watchers. In the first region of Shumer, the kingship was cycled among the towns. In the second region, Diversity under Ra was not tolerated. He ruled alone as he pleased. The oldest of heaven and the firstborn of earth, he sought this with the priest's wisdom. First and foremost, from the very beginning, so he commanded that the songs be titled, Lord of Eternity, He who created, reigning over all gods, the one and only, the absolutely isolated and unique. Ra elevated himself above all other gods and adopted their attributes and abilities, which he then distributed to other gods. In terms of dominion and decrees, I am Enlil, whereas in terms of the household and fighting, I am Ninurta. I am Shamash, and I rule over the underworld as Adad, the god of lightning and thunder, Nana, the god of nighttime, illumination, and Utu. I have uncovered the golden depths of Gibil, which are the source of copper and silver. I order the sky, my splendor, to count and number in Ninkish Zida. These remarks profoundly worried the Anunnaki authorities. 
the brothers of Marduk spoke with their father Enki, while Nergal communicated their worries to Ninurta. Unusual are your aspirations. What has dominated you? This was revealed to Marduk, the son of Enki. My dominance speaks to the sky, the heavens, Enki, the father of Marduk, replied. Anlil's constellation sign, the Bull of Heaven, died at the hands of his own progeny. The portents are undeniable. My era, the age of the ram, is coming to the sky. Enki surveyed the circle of the twelve stars in his dwelling in Eridu. On the first day of spring, the first day of the year, sunrise was attentively watched since the stars in the bull constellation were aligned with the rising sun on that day. The following observations were made at Nipruki, Urim, Enlil and Nana. Nergal's discoveries in the lower world, where the instrument station formerly stood, proved that Ram's time, the age of Enlil's bull, was still a long way off. In his territories, Marduk's claims were firm. Teach the people to examine the heavens, the Anunnaki elders urged Ningizida. Nabu aided him in this endeavor. Ningizida constructed stone constructions based on his understanding with the assistance of Ninurta and Ishkur. Nearby and foreign settlers learnt to examine the night sky. When the people arrived, the sun in the constellation of the bull was still rising. Enki observed these happenings with dismay, wondering how fate had warped the correct sequence. Following their proclamation as gods, the Anunnaki need human help. In the first region, the Anunnaki chose to unify the regions under one leader, a warrior king. Inanna, the opponent of Marduk, was entrusted with locating the appropriate guy. On her voyage, Inanna revealed to Enlil that she had met and fallen in love with a powerful man. His mother was a high priestess, while he was the commander of four garrisons. Enlil appointed and bestowed the scepter and crown upon Sharukin, the virtuous ruler. As in Nibiru, a new capital city and the areas to unite were founded once this was accomplished. As indicated by its name, Agade, the unified city, was positioned near Kishi. Enlil strengthened the Sharukin, and Inanna followed him with her superior weapons. His reign extended from the lower sea to the upper sea, and his armies were stationed at the fourth region's frontiers to defend it. Ra maintained a close eye on Inanna and Sharukin, then pounced like a hawk on his prey. Sharukin carried the holy soil to Agade and implanted the heavenly bright object there, from the place where Marduk constructed the tower to heaven's reach. Angry, Marduk raced to the first region and brought Nabu and his men to the tower. I control the precious earth. I will create a god's doorway. Thus said Marduk, ordering the water to flow toward his people. Fortifications and walls were built near the Asagil, the house of the highest god. They created Marduk and called Babylai the gate of the gods after Nabu's father. In the heart of the Edin, among the first region, Marduk himself founded. Inanna's wrath had no boundaries. She used her weapons to kill Marduk's followers. Blood poured like torrents for the first time in human history. Babylai persuaded his brother Marduk Nergal to go for the benefit of the people. Let us patiently await the factual evidence of heaven, Nergal informed his brother. Marduk decided to go, and Amun, the Unseen One, became renowned throughout the second region as he travelled from place to land while observing the sky. Inanna was briefly placated by Sharu Tu Kin's sons, who were his peaceful heirs. The kingdom was later ascended by Agade, Sharu Kin, the grandson of Sin Loved. Enlil and Ninurta had travelled to the regions beyond the waters and vanished from the first region. 
Ra and Marduk were missing from the second region. Her opportunity to take all the powers envisioned by Inanna was in her hands, as was Naram Sin's opportunity to capture all the kingdoms she ruled. Naram Sin commanded the people to march against Marduk's territories of Mogon and Meluha. A sacrilege was perpetrated by an earthly army travelling through Naram Sin in the fourth region. He assaulted Mogon and sought to penetrate the mountain sized fortified city of Ekur. Enlil was enraged by the sacrileges and transgressions. He cursed Naram Sin and Agade stating that Naram Sin was murdered by a scorpion sting and Agade was annihilated by his decree. This occurred around 1,500 earth years ago. This is the tale of the vision in which Galsu prophesied to Enlil. For a man to choose Marduk's sovereignty was a tragedy. After Marduk, Amun became king. The monarch's reign in the second region broke apart and anarchy and disorder seized possession. After Agade was wiped out in the first region, turmoil and uncertainty prevailed. In the first region, the monarchy was in turmoil. From cities of gods to cities of mortals, it travelled around. The monarchy fluctuated between Unugki, Lagash, Urim and Kish, Isin and other remote locations. Enlil then placed the monarchy in the hands of Nana, per Anu's recommendation. The holy heavenly bright object remained on the earth where Urim dwelt, allowing him to become king for the third time. Ur-Namu was the name of a noble shepherd of people who was appointed king by Nana. Ur-Namu created justice in the countries. He stopped bloodshed and conflict, and prosperity flourished. Enlil had a dream vision at that moment in the middle of the night. As he reached Enlil's bed and stood there, the white-haired Galzu immediately recognized him. In his left hand he clutched a lapis lazuli tablet depicting the starry skies. Galzu pointed to the twelve constellations that divided the skies with his left hand. His pointing changed from the bull to the Galzu three times. Galzu addressed Enlil in his dream, stating that evil and slaughter would follow a period of exceptional kindness and harmony. The ram of Marduk and the bull of Enlil will be replaced by three heavenly components, and the power will be transferred to the individual who claimed to be the earth's supreme god. By the decree of fate, a catastrophe unprecedented in history shall occur. As at the time of the deluge, a good and deserving man must be selected. He and his descendants will maintain civilized humankind as planned by the Creator of all. Galzu, the heavenly ambassador, sent the same message to Enlil in the dream vision. When Enlil awakened from his midnight dream vision, there was no tablet near his bed. Was it a heavenly message, or did I make it up? Enlil pondered inside. He did not share the dream vision with any of his sons, even Nana and Ninlil. Enlil of the heavenly savants questioned the priests of the Nibru Ki temple. The high priest led Tiehu, an oracle priest. He descended from Ibru, Abakad's grandson, the sixth generation of Nibru Ki priests. They intermarried with the daughters of the rulers of Urim. Observing the following in Nana's temple in Urim, the heavenly time heavens. A part of the cosmos lasts seventy-two earth years. Chronicle the passing of three of them. Therefore Enlil informed Tihu, the priest, that he had him count throughout the foretold period. Enlil pondered the significance of the dream vision as Marduk travelled from one country to the next. The individuals instructed to follow him were the reason for his dominance. Nabu, the son of Marduk, was the instigator in the countries of the Upper Sea and the areas adjoining Ki Engi. His objective was to conquer the fourth region. Between the dwellers of the west and the inhabitants of the east, fights were happening. Monarchs' armies of soldiers gathered, caravans halted moving, and the walls of towns were constructed. 
what Golzu foretold is coming true, Enlil to himself. Enlil focused his eyes on Tirhu and his sons descended from respectable ancestry. This is the guy to choose, as Galsu said, Enlil to himself. Enlil informed his son, without disclosing the dream vision, that a city similar to Urim was founded in the country from which Arbakard had migrated. Let it be a home away from Urim for you and Ningal. Establish a temple shrine with priest prince Tirhu in command in its middle. Nana founded Haran in the country of Abakad by upholding his father's pledge. Tirhu appointed his family as the temple's high priests. When two heavenly pieces out of the promised three were accomplished, Tirhu proceeded to Haran. Ur Namu, the delight of Urim, fell off his chariot and perished in the western territories at that time. On the throne of Urim, his son Shulgi ascended. Shulgi was wicked and hungry for conflict. He sought the delights of Inanna's vulva in Nibruki himself, the high priest he anointed. Warriors from the mountains, not beholden to Nana, recruited in his army. She overran the western territories with their help, disrespecting the sanctity of the mission control center. His foot was put in the hallowed fourth region, and he proclaimed himself king of the four regions. Enki notified Enlil about the invading hordes. The rulers of your realm have surpassed all limits. Enlil was incensed by the defilements. Enki spoke to Enlil with malice. Marduk is the originator of all problems, Enlil responded to Enki. Enlil switched his focus to Tirhu while maintaining his silence on the dream vision. Enlil directed his discerning look towards Ibruum, Tirhu's oldest son. Ibruum was a noble descendant who was courageous and knowledgeable in priestly mysteries. The ascents and descents of the chariots enabled Enlil Ibruum to defend the holy sites as instructed. Shortly after Ibruum departed Haran, Marduk came into the city. To him, the impurities he had seen were the labor pains of a new system. From Haran, on the border of Shumer, he prepared his last push. From Haran, he supervised the mobilization of soldiers on the border of Ishgur's territories. When Marduk's presence in Haran had lasted twenty-four earth years, he made a heartfelt appeal to the other gods from whomever they were descended. Confessing his crimes, but insisting on his rule over them, he pleaded, O gods of Haran, O mighty gods who judge, learn my secrets. As I buckle my belt, my memories return. I am the almighty Marduk, a well-known great deity in my kingdoms. I went into exile because of my misdeeds. I travelled to the mountains. I roamed through numerous places. I travelled from where the sun rises to where it sets. I arrived in the country of Ishkur. Twenty-four years ago, I sought an omen at the temple of Haran. Until when, I inquired about my lord at the temple, seeking an omen. Your days in exile are at an end. O wonderful gods whom destiny has decreed, the oracle in the temple exclaimed. Let me travel to my city and plot my way. A monarch in Babylon shall erect my temple Isagil as an eternal residence. May all the Anunnaki gods assemble in my temple house. My pact is accepted. The Anunnaki gods were upset and terrified in response to this request for their obedience. Therefore Marduk declared his coming to the other gods, admitting and pleading with them. Enlil called them all to a large gathering for deliberation. All the Anunnaki chiefs in Nibruki convened along with Enki and Marduk's brothers. In contrast to Marduk and Nabu, they all were perturbed by the events. The conference of the great gods was replete with accusations and recriminations. No one can stop what will occur. Embrace Marduk's dominance. Enki alone provided advice. 
Let us be bereft, Marduk, of the heaven-earth bond, if the hour of the ram arrives, Enlil proposed in a fury. To eradicate the location of the heavenly chariots, everyone except Enki consented. Therefore, Nergal proposed using weapons of terror. Only Enki was opposed. The decision was sent from earth to Anu, and subsequently from Anu to earth. What was intended to fail due to your choice to undo it will fail. So Enki remarked as he walked away. Ninurta and Nergal were instructed to do wicked acts. This is the tale of how chance led to fate, how the great disaster was brought about one step at a time, some of which occurred eons before. Let this be forever documented and remembered. Anlil kept two secrets to himself when the choice to employ the weapons of terror was made. Anlil did not divulge the secret of Galzu's dream vision to anyone before the horrible decision was taken, and Enlil did not reveal the secret of the weapons of terror to anyone. Enlil divulged his knowledge of the terror's hiding spot to no one until the tragic choice had been taken. When the council authorized the deployment of terror weapons despite all opposition, when Enki walked out of the council room in a rage, Enki smirked to himself. He alone knew where the weapons were concealed. So concluded Enki. Before Enlil's arrival on Earth, he concealed the weapons with Obgal in an unidentified place. That Obgal was revealed to the banished Enlil, it was unknown to Enki. When Enki learned the second secret, he had a hopeful thought. After such a long travel, the weapon's dread would have dissipated. Little did Enki anticipate the protracted sojourn, a tragedy never before experienced on earth to cause. Enki therefore had no need for it. Enlil disclosed the location to the two heroes. Those seven weapons of terror reside on a mountain. Enlil addressed them. They inhabit a hollow within the earth, and only fear can conceal them. The riddle of how the weapons roused Enlil from their profound slumber was then disclosed. Before the two sons, one of Enlil's and one of Enki's, depart the hiding location, Enlil cautioned them, saying, Before the weapons are used, the Anunnaki commanded that the chariots be removed. People must not die and cities must be preserved. Ninurta was delayed by his father while Nergal went hiding in his skyship. Enlil wanted to divulge a secret to his son alone, so he informed him about the prophecy of Galzu and the selection of Ibruum for Ninurta. Nergal is impulsive. Ensure that the towns are spared and Ibruum is warned, Ninurta Enlil stated. When Ninurta arrived at the weapon's location, Nergal had already been extracted from the hollow. As their M.E.s awakened from their long sleep, he gave each of the seven Nergals a mission. The one without rival, which was the first weapon he summoned, and the blazing flame, which was the second. He called the third Mountain Melter after the one who dissolves in fear, and the fourth after the same individual. The fifth was the wind that the world's edge seeks, and the sixth was the one who spares no one above or below. The seventh vial was packed with terrible venom. He named it the Vaporizer of Living Things. With Anu's approval, the seven were delivered to Nergal and Ninurta to destroy. Nergal was ready to destroy and obliterate when Ninurta arrived at the place of the Weapons of Terror. I will murder the boy and eliminate the father, Nergal with rage was yelling. The territories they want will disappear, and I will demolish the wicked cities. Thus did Nergal infuriated proclaim. Will you, noble Nergal, the virtuous, annihilate the unrighteous? So did Ninurta's friend. Enlil's directions are clear. I will guide you to the predetermined objectives, and you will follow. The choice of the Anunnaki for me is revealed, Nergal said to Ninurta. Enlil's signal was anxiously anticipated for seven days and seven nights. 
Marduk and Babylai returned as planned after his waiting period. He proclaimed his superiority in the midst of his supporters and with his weapons drawn. A thousand seven hundred thirty-six earth years had passed at that time. Enlil sent a signal on that fateful day to Ninurta, who then departed towards Mount Moshu, followed by Nergal. Ninurta examined the core of the fourth region's mount and plain from above. He gave Nergal a heart-squeezing gesture and told him, keep away. Then the first aerial terror weapon Ninurta was deployed. Mount Moshu's peak was severed instantly, and the mountain's interior melted. Above the place of the celestial chariots, the second weapon he unleashed. The brightness of seven suns converted the plain's rocks into a bleeding wound. The earth trembled and disintegrated, and the skies lost their splendor. The plain of the chariots was littered with crushed and burned stones. Only the tree trunks remained of the woods that formerly surrounded the plain. It is done! Ninurta, accompanied by the black divine bird, roared from his airship. The power that Marduk and Nabu desired but would never possess. Then he desired to be Ninurta Nergal, to be Error the Annihilator, and he flew up the king's highway to the beautiful valley of the five cities. In the lush valley where Nabu's people were converting, Nergal intended to crush him like a trapped bird. Era successively dropped terror weapons from the sky on each of the five cities. He destroyed the five cities in the valley, leaving them desolate. They erupted with fire and brimstone, reducing every living creature to vapor. The awe-inspiring weaponry brought down the mountains, and the bolt shattered the barrier between the sea and the land. The waters of the sea flowed into the valley, overwhelming it. As the waters poured over the ashes of the towns, steam rose to the skies. It is complete, Era shouted from his spacecraft. In Nergal's heart, wrath ceased to exist. When the two heroes examined their evil deeds, they were confused by what they saw. The brilliant lights were followed by a darkening of the sky and the onset of a storm. Despair descended from the sky amid a swirling cloud of darkness as an evil wind carried it. As the day continued, the sun on the horizon got shrouded by darkness. At night, a terrifying light bordered its borders. The moon's ascent caused it to vanish. When dawn arrived the following day, a storm wind from the western upper sea started to blow. It guided the dark brown cloud eastward and spread over the populated areas. It dealt death ruthlessly to all inhabitants wherever it went. Death was transported from the valley of no pity toward Sumer by the erupting bolts of light. The alert for Enlil, Enki, Ninurta and Nurgle sounded. Unstoppable, the evil wind delivers. Enlil and Enki issued the following message to the gods of Sumer. Escape, escape. Let the populace scatter, let the populace hide. The gods left their cities like birds fleeing their nests in fear. The evil storm grasped the inhabitants of the countries, rendering flight hopeless. In the fields and towns it assaulted. Death was as quiet as a ghost. The toughest, thickest walls could not stop it. No door could keep it out, and no lock could turn it back. Those who sheltered behind sealed doors in their homes like flies were slain, while those who escaped to the streets were killed and their bodies piled up. Cough and phlegm filled the lungs, while saliva and froth filled the mouths. Blood flooded their tongues as the wicked wind devoured the invisible humans. The lousy wind moved steadily over the region from west to east, across plains and mountains. Behind it, all living things, including humans and livestock, were dead or dying. The water was contaminated, and all plants in the fields perished. From Eridu in the south to Sipar in the north, the evil wind ravaged the country, sparing only Babylai, where Marduk's rule was announced. 
Babylite, the chosen center of Marduk, survives the calamity. Enki interprets this as a portent of Marduk's impending ascendancy. Enlil contemplates the past, destiny and fate, accepts Marduk's dominance and withdraws to distant countries. The brothers said a tearful farewell. Enki considers the past to be an indicator of the future. He intends to document everything for future generations. Colophon authored by Indubsa Babylai, where Marduk's sovereignty was proclaimed, was spared. The evil wind consumed all the territories south of Babylai and the core of the second region. Enki proposed that Enlil spare Babylai as a heavenly sign during their discussion of how to escape the great cataclysm. The sparing of Babylai affirms Marduk's prophesied dominance. So said Enki to Enlil. The will of the creator of all must have been. Enlil talked to Enki. He was then informed about Galzu, Enlil's dream vision, and prophecy. If you were aware of this, why was it not prevented by the deployment of terror weapons? Enki asked. My brother indeed. The cause was evident enough. After your arrival on earth, we identified a means to sidestep the obstruction whenever the mission was impeded by an impediment. Enlil spoke with a mournful tone to Enki. The creation of earthlings was the best option in this regard. It was also the source of several unwelcome twists and turns. Whom among the celestial cycles and constellations might the hands of fate anticipate once they had been comprehended? Who could distinguish between our chosen and predetermined destinies? Whose false portents were proclaimed, and who could offer correct prophecies? Therefore, I chose to keep the words of Galzu to myself. Was he the messenger of the All-Creator, or was he a hallucination? Permit whatever must occur to be placed, thus I said to myself. Enki listened to his brother's comments while nodding his head up and down. The first zone is lonesome, the second is bewildered, and the third is injured. The place of the celestial chariots no longer exists. This has occurred, Enki said to Enlil. The seed was planted by Marduk's desires, and the harvest was his to reap. If that was the intent of the All-Creator, then this is our remaining purpose on earth. Enlil responded similarly to his brother Enki, before accepting Marduk's triumph. Let the rank of fifty which I had planned for Ninurta instead be granted to Marduk, and let Marduk proclaim his dominance over the desolation in the regions. According to his estimation, Ninurta and I can no longer stand. We will travel for the lands beyond the oceans, and the objective of acquiring Nibiru's riches will be accomplished. Thus spoke Enlil to Enki with a tone of despondency. Would circumstances have been different if weapons of terror had not been employed? Enki disputed with his brother. Should the earth mission have been terminated after the Anunnaki revolt? Should not Galzu's comments to Nibiru be remembered? Enlil reacted. I did what I did and you did what you did. The past is irreversible. Is that not also instructive? Enki asked both of them. What occurred on earth resembles what occurred on Nibiru, correct? Isn't the plan for the future outlined in that tale of the past? Will humanity form in our image, repeat our triumphs and blunders? Enlil remained mute. Enki approached him with an outstretched arm as he prepared to go. Let us join hands as brothers as comrades confronting difficulties in an unknown world. Therefore Enki listened to his brother's words. Enlil also embraced his sibling by grabbing his arm. Should we reconvene on Earth or Nibiru? Enki asked. Was Galzu true when he said that we would perish if we visited Nibiru? Enlil answered. He then turned and left. Enki was alone, accompanied only by his own inner thoughts. He sat and contemplated the beginning and conclusion of everything. Was everything predetermined, 
or was destiny shaped by this or that choice? If heaven and earth are governed by cycles within cycles, then what has occurred in the past will occur again. Is history the future? Will the Anunnaki be imitated, and will the earth experience Nibiru again? Will he come first and be the last to leave? Enki, besieged by thoughts, made a decision. All the events and decisions, beginning with Nibiru and continuing to the present day on earth, are to be recorded as a guide for future generations. Let posterity, at a time determined by fate, says, The record has been read, the past has been remembered, the future has been foretold, and let the future of the past be the judge. These are the words of Enki, the first born of Anu on Nibiru. This is the fourteenth tablet, the words of Enki, Lord. No words were omitted or added from the lips of the mighty ruler Enki. According to the master scribe in Dubsa, a man from Eridu was Udba's son. By Lord Enki, I have been granted a long life.